Welcome, everyone. Um, this is the showcase event for a major Economic and Social Research Council investment in a program of basic research into the causes and consequences of Brexit. Today, you'll hear from social scientists who led some of 17 projects in two waves that make up the Governance After Brexit program. Um, is there any housekeeping stuff we need to do? The, the uh, you're asking me about practical stuff. OK, well, we'll. There are some loos over there, and if the place catches fire, we're almost certainly doomed, but there's a staircase around there. Excellent. Well, to get back to the program, uh, the first wave of projects started in February 2019, uh, though I've been working up the program since 2018, so I've built up quite a set of debts of gratitude over that period, and forgive me for touching on a couple of them now. Through that period, I've worked really closely with UK and a Changing Europe, as well as the public Anand Manon, He's been a constant source of support and intellectual challenge in developing this program. Uh, the wider UK and a changing Europe, some of the cast has changed over time, but it's had a consistently brilliant group of fellows, including colleagues with experience of government as well as academics. And they're uh, represented today uh, uh, commenting on the research uh, um, uh, alongside some journalists and uh, other, other public figures. Uh, I'll, I'll thank them in person later, but I wanted to thank them uh, briefly in advance. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the UK and the Changing Europe team. Uh, it's an outstanding core team. I know Anand thanks them every day, but especially uh, Oli Kass and Liam Shaw and Annie Nicholas, this wouldn't have been possible without you, so thank you. Um, ESRC uh, staff members contributed to the early formation of this program. Some of them have moved on, people like Jeremy Neathy, were hugely important, I think, in the, uh, in the infrastructure of social science research over a long period of time and a massive help to me. And academics involved in ESRC and UKRI, uh, Judith Squires, Cathy Gormley Heenan, and Matt Flinders also played an important role. Uh, my biggest vote of thanks goes, though, to the academics who've carried out the research on the program. They're a creative and engaging group of scholars drawn from an unusually wide range of disciplines for an ESRC program. Anthropology, business studies and economics, geography and law, political science and sociology. The program also created some space for methodological innovation and used some innovative means of evaluating, assessing the projects that were, that were funded. I'm gonna talk a little bit about interdisciplinarity, about basic research and then the, the program. So uh, the program as a whole was deeply interdisciplinary. Many of the individual projects are also interdisciplinary in character. For non-academics, it may seem odd to talk about interdisciplinarity. After all, the most important questions and biggest challenges that provoke research in the social sciences won't fall into the domain of one discipline or another. And yet it's all too easy for academics to seal ourselves away in, inter in disciplinary silos. My own work ranges across law and politics, and you'd think law and politics have very substantially overlapping subject matter, uh, but they're disciplines that often seem more divided by their methods than united by their subject matter. And one of the real pleasures of this initiative for me is how many projects there were that included legal, political, and wider social sciences in interdisciplinary uh, ways. Um, the program also encompassed a mix of qualitative research, particularly ethnographies, research that digs deeply into specific settings and contexts, uh, and quantitative scholarship, with some projects mixing both. So as well as using novel methods and approaches, the, the program was intended uh, to provide projects with the uh, opportunity to operate at a slow pace, to do basic research into uh, Brexit, which was an intensely frenetic and disputatious process, but, it, but in, a, in a different sort of a, a register. Um, as it happens, the first project's first year was 2019, which was an enormously challenging period for anyone engaged in, in social science research, particularly focused on Brexit. Uh, we held a program meeting. Uh, Adrian Favell helped to host a Leeds uh, in um, early March 2020. Uh, where some really experienced uh, 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 scholars, including uh, Professor Sir John Curtis, talked about just what a challenging period the previous year had been. So we were looking forward to, uh, uh, to better days ahead, and of course, then COVID hit, and the projects adapted to that new context remarkably uh, well. Some of them including COVID in aspects of their research, uh, uh, but also implementing research in a, in a very challenging 
context. So I have a very strong view about the importance of basic social science research. On the one hand, the UK university sector is celebrated as world leading. On the other, lots of universities are under considerable financial strain uh, and an increasing number of university leaders are talking about problems with the basic funding model. Um, one of the ways they've tried to make universities work is by increasing the number and proportion of students in social sciences, particularly international students. Um, in many universities, then, time for day-to-day -day research is squeezed hard. In that context, I think funders like ESRC have a crucial but challenging role in addressing basic mm -hmm. social science research questions. The way some people describe it, basic research has an ivory tower quality. Uh, this program shows that basic research can be deeply engaged with organizations and act uh, actors at the forefront of policy and practice. Uh, and that this engagement can inspire and inform really innovative social science. I'd also add, though, that the uh, making too ha harsh a distinction between uh, urgent applied research and basic research is misleading. So uh, some urgent research actually generates challenging questions for social sciences uh, and generates new ways of thinking uh, uh, that challenge conventional wisdoms or taken for granted assumptions that can be found in the social sciences as well as in the worlds of policy and practice. So research builds from prior assumptions. Social scientists sometimes talk about our priors to describe this. But these assumptions need to be questioned to be interrogated. We need to reflect on our methods and developing new innovative methods can help to test those assumptions, to avoid taking them for granted, to challenge conventional wisdom, uh, maybe even to question common sense, although that may be politically contentious of me to say in the current context. Um, to talk about today's sessions then, each panel will hear about governance after Brexit projects maxed by commentary from other colleagues, policymakers, journalists, academics, especially UK and a Changing Europe fellows. The first session is on migration, and we'll hear from Professor Charlotte O'Brien, who's uh, developed a remarkably innovative ethnomethodology, an ethnography rooted in legal advice at her university. And that legal advice picks up on uh, uh, issues which are then analyzed in, in detail, both in technical legal terms, but also in an interdisciplinary project that spans law and political science. Uh, we'll also hear in that session from Professor Nanda Sagona a project uh, in a broadly conceived sociological tradition which addresses migration into but also out of the UK, setting Brexit debates in a broad context and asking what the current system and recent changes uh, uh, say about what it means to be British. The program also includes uh, a third migration-focused project that explores the use of digital technology to manage the settlement of EU citizens in post-Brexit Britain and the wider social, political, economic implications of this system, but we won't be hearing about that today, sadly. The second session is on Northern Ireland. Uh, it, it, we start with a, a project led by Michael, Professor Michael Gazoriak, uh, which is researching the economic impact of Brexit on Northern Ireland, digging beneath the headlines to model the consequences of the special arrangements for that country using uh, uh, valuable but uh, 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 confidential data at times. And we'll hear from Professor David Finnemore, a project that occupies a particularly sensitive position in an interdisciplinary project in politics and sociology. It analyzes political negotiations, the technicalities of the arrangements uh, 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 being put in place in Northern Ireland, and critically, the evolution of public attitudes towards them. Uh, uh, here it's worth observing that Northern Ireland has always been analyzed separately from Great Britain in relation to public attitudes uh, throughout the history of academic and commercial research uh, in that field. After lunch, we move on to street-level Brexit, and we'll hear from uh, Professor Tamara, Tamara Harvey and uh, uh, Dr. Matt Wood, a project on Brexit and the NHS, which make again makes technical, legal, socio-legal, and political science research, and they developed a novel ethnographic method uh, uh, to dig in in their social and political analysis and analyze people's hopes and fears about the NHS and Brexit. Uh, Professor Adrian Favell is also on this panel. He led a project called Northern Exposure on race, nation, and disaffection in ordinary towns and cities in the north of England after, after Brexit. Um, Professor uh, Jeanette Edwards, I think, will also be here today, uh, who led a, a, an anthropologist who led an early project on uh, left, so-called left-behind places in England. Uh, Jeanette also made a really important contribution to a number of projects that 
developed ethnographic methods through the program. So the interaction on the program was really important there. Our final panel then uh, uh, analyzes public attitudes in Brexit. It asks, what do people want? What did people want from Brexit? Professor Sarah Hobolt's project analyzes identities and effective polarization, the emergence and perhaps the consolidation of Leave and Remain as politically significant identities. The project findings about how Leavers and Remainers see one another pose really critical questions to both groups. Uh, Professor Meg Russell and Alan Rennick, who isn't here, uh, uh, have a project that makes public attitude survey work with the Citizens' Assembly, and they analyze the evolution of trust in politics and political and legal institutions with fascinating results on the sensitive subject of trust in experts. Uh, Professor Sir John Curtis will also be on that panel. He's a stalwart of UK and a changing Europe, as well as leading a governance after Brexit project. Uh, um, and he led a project into the trade-offs and choices implicit in Brexit, something UK governments sometimes seem keen to avoid addressing, and developed an innovative deliberative polling methodology to interrogate those trade-offs. Uh, um, before getting on to the panels, though, I'm delighted to introduce the chief executive of the Economic and Social uh, Research Council, Stian Westlake, who has agreed to kick things off for us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to head up to the lectern. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. It's a real pleasure to join you at the Brexit Research Evidence uh, Conference. Um, as the relatively new executive chair of the Economic and Social Research Council, which has the honour of funding UK and a changing Europe and the work we're seeing here, um, I've been asked to provide some reflections on policy impact and social research. Um, I see there's some questions coming in on the internet about whether I think Brexit is an economic disaster. I have to say I'm not planning to cover that in my speech, so apologies for, 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 for those who are hoping to hear about that. Um, but I wanted to start with perhaps an unusual thought for a Tuesday morning, which is a reflection on secret societies and conspiracies. Um, a fun activity for any of you who observe British politics is to observe the presence and influence of small and tightly knit organisations, often that have a relatively low profile, but sometimes changes and shifts over time, which often seem to have disproportionate impact on what goes on in British politics. Um, for an open society, I've always felt we've got rather a lot of these, and once you start spotting them, you start seeing them everywhere. Um, one of the more well-known is, of course, the ongoing afterlife of the Revolutionary Communist Party in the UK, which produced Living Marxism, then Spike, the online magazine, and whose members or alumni came to play a role in a whole range of actually very valuable organisations in the world of the sciences and, um, and politics. And as you as distinguished Brexit watchers will know, they also play various roles in the Leave campaign and in Boris Johnson's number 10. Um, to take some different people with a sort of similar sounding name but a different type of position, there were the Eurocommunists behind Marxism Today magazine in the 1980s and the New Times movement who gave rise to the quintessentially 1990s think tank Demos and led to a lot of what I would say is mainstream modern day UK thought on innovation studies and on the creative industries. Um, I have at home a very treasured copy of the GLC 1986 London Industrial Strategy, which was written mostly by the late Robin Murray, um, who I had the pleasure of working with a while ago. And what I find fascinating about this document is half of it reads very much like 1980s industrial policy, but half of it could have been written by a conservative tech advisor in 10 Downing Street in the 2010s. It's absolutely remarkable to see how influential some of those lines of argument have been. Um, or to give another example, some of you may be familiar with the Extropians Listserv. Those of you who have been around the internet for a while, listservs were email distribution lists. The Extropians were sort of technological visionaries who thrashed out all sorts of ideas online in the 1990s. The Extropians involved almost everyone who is anyone in the world of um, what's now effective altruism, rationalism, long-termism, and I had various reflections on some of the political influence of these people, but checking this morning whether these things were a matter of public record or not, it turns out they're not, so you'll have to research that yourselves. But these groups are very influential, and I should at this point admit that I have been a tangential member of one such group, although I would hope a more benign one, and that is the devotees of the multi-talented social innovator Michael Young. Um, 
you will all be familiar with Young's reputation. He gained academic fame as, uh, as an ethnographer of, of, of the East End, but of course he was also one of the co-authors of the 1945 Labour Manifesto, but above all, a tremendous institution builder, the visionary of the Open University, the Consumers Association and Witch Magazine, the School for Social Entrepreneurs and a host of other organisations. And he does have a group of devotees who spread in interesting ways all through British public life. And I have a tangential association because many years ago I used to work at the Young Foundation, one of his organisations. Um, but you find them in, in public policy, in research, in technology and design, all sorts of ways. And this connection to me took on a new significance that relates this question of research impact when I found myself a few months ago at the Economic and Social Research Council. Because, of course, the Economic and Social Research Council was another of Michael Young's foundations. He, not long after the Second World War, lobbied the Labour government that Britain needed a funder for social research to tackle urgent problems. He lobbied and lobbied, and 17 years later, in 1965, the Social Science Research Council, our precursor organisation, was set up with Michael Young as its first director. And the reason why I find this res resonant and hopefully relevant today is Young set all of this up with a very clear vision of impact in the social sciences and that as a rationale for funding social science research. Um, as Asa Briggs, one of Young's biographers, said, Young's early vision for the social science research was based on two fundamental claims. First of all, he said, the need for more knowledge is immense and urgent, and more knowledge means more research. But this vision of his was deeply, deeply applied. Um, in David Walker's history of the ESRC, he quotes Young as saying, the social sciences are and will be useful, and in that measure supported by government, insofar as they add to mankind's span of control. So again, a deeply applied and impact-driven vision. I think it's quite interesting that sometimes we in the world of research think of the impact agenda as something that is in some ways rather modern, driven by the research assessment exercise and the research excellence framework, kind of gradually increasing year by year. But at least from a social sciences point of view, it was right in there, in the, baked into the beginning of public funding of these areas. And so when I think about impact, and when I think about the impact of work like we're thinking about today, I often return to this Jungian vision that both that knowledge is intrinsically valuable, important that understanding our own society is a noble undertaking, but also that there is a strong extrinsic rationale for doing it, and that these rationales, as Dan was saying earlier, are mutually reinforcing. Policymakers that work with social researchers make better policy, but social researchers who work with policymakers ask better questions. Um, their absorptive capacity, to use an innovation studies term, increases. Um, I think this is fundamentally vital, and I'm so glad that my predecessors at the Economic and Social, so Social Research Council have done a lot of work to try and institutionalise these connections, um, partly by building good relationships with people like government chief scientific advisors so that policy-relevant questions get baked into research agendas through building programmes like local policy innovation partnerships and by trying to get government to articulate what they're interested in. Um, but to return to our secret societies, one of the things that, one of the lessons that tells us is that you can set up as many official connections and institutions as you like, but what really matters is day-to-day -day engagement, the human element. And um, I think that is particularly relevant to a whole range of the work that is done here, that day-to-day -day connection between researchers and policymakers. And I think when we look at what's changed in the research funding landscape in the last years, particularly the Stern review of the REF um, a few years ago, this was really helpful for social science research because it prioritised day-to-day engagement between researchers and policymakers in a way that previously didn't exist. We were much more beholden to this kind of uh, uh, rather over schematized life sciences or physical sciences based idea that you would just invent something and in this rather linear fashion commercialize it. So that was, that was, that was a sort of powerful spell to break and hopefully the work of organizations like this are helping to do it. Um, I was asked to make some recommendations about how to achieve impact and I do that very hesitantly before an audience both here and online of researchers with such a distinguished track record in achieving impact. But I thought I would make three points on this. My first point when it comes to public policy influence 
is that the government does not exist. What I mean by that, this will, I hope, not be a surprise to the political scientists who make up a big part of this audience, but when I deal with often very intelligent researchers in various areas, they will think about influencing the government, and they'll assume that there is a route to, to work with the government. But from a political science point of view, we know that there isn't really such a thing as the government. There are an almost arbitrarily large number of policy entrepreneurs, of factions, of disciplines, and any pathway to impact has to try and be an influence on that system rather than seeking a route in. Government will try and provide routes in. Government will try and provide official channels to receive advice, which is sometimes useful, sometimes less useful. But ultimately, working out how to influence a complex system with many actors, some of whom will enjoy power at any time and some of whom will not, is an essential task if you want to achieve impact. This relates to my second recommendation for researchers, which is to beware what I would call Potemkin engagement. Um, I have seen a lot of research projects over time that rightly and in a praiseworthy manner submit an account of their impact and the account of impact often talks about, you know, well, we went to the House of Commons and we hosted this event and various people came. Um, it is very possible to do very impressive things and the House of Commons provides a very beautiful backdrop for doing these kind of things that achieve nothing because the attempt of impact is not grounded in a view of what's going on in government, of what to be, of what to be looking at, of what part of the system we, we want to engage with. And um, the question I think one has to ask with any kind of engagement activity, with any use of a researcher's precious time on something that's not research, what specifically are you trying to do? Why are you working with those people? Um, it's something I think that UK and a changing Europe does very well. You're savvy about this but this is, a, this is a, a common failure mode in, in impact. And then the third thing is that timing is everything, like in comedy, same in impact. Um, and this presents a challenge for researchers. The ideal way to influence policy is to always be there, ready to be the firstest with the mostest whenever anything comes up. Um, that is the kind of the tactic of the think tank. If you work for a think tank, and someone you get rung up by the Today programme, you go on the Today programme and you drop everything. I remember that, 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 that way of life. It will not surprise anyone if I say that that is not conducive to thoughtful, deep work that drives high-quality research. So you have to be careful. Um, and I think that suggests there are particular ways that rigorous researchers should approach the question of, of timing. By all means... Sometimes you do need to be responsive, but there are other ways of playing the timing card well. One thing that works incredibly effectively is managed drumbeat-style publications. Um, if we look at the Resolution Foundation, an organisation that I think does pretty rigorous and very impactful work, they are very good at signalling regular reviews, regular announcements. The IFS, another kind of uh, interesting organisation on the interstices of, uh, of, 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 of impact and research, does this very well. Yesterday I was chairing one of their regular um, pre-fiscal event briefings in the House of Commons. They do that before every fiscal event. People, are, people wait for them. It's a little bit like Christmas Eve for fiscal policy wonks. And um, that is very effective. And obviously those things can be scheduled in a way that a call from the Today programme can't be scheduled. But the other thing I would say is um, if you can't respond immediately to timing, be prepared. It's very interesting to look at what's happened with you know, an interesting recent policy development, the policy announcements around the possible expansion of the city of Cambridge that some of you may have seen. It was a Michael Gove announcement a couple of months ago. Um, very interesting where it came from. Um, about 15 years ago, Henry Overman from the London School of Economics and Tim Loynig, a kind of serial policy advisor, put together a very interesting paper setting this out. There's a very strong economic geography rationale for it. Um, they set it down. The time was not ripe. But those of you who will know Tim will know that he keeps at it. He occasionally promotes it. They looked for the opportunity. There were other people involved. And it turned out that because they were prepared, they had to wait 15 years for their moment. But they seem to have, I wouldn't say that it's a done deal, but they seem to have actually achieved a remarkable amount of, 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 of impact so far for that proposal. So as a researcher, you sitting by the phone, picking up every call from the Today programme is not conducive to doing good research. But timing is still important, and there is a different way of playing that game. So those are my three broad recommendations. 
don't think that the government exists or that it's a single entity. Watch out for Potemkin engagement that wastes your time but doesn't achieve much. And focus on timing, even if you can't always be hanging on by the phone. Um, from there, I just want to come on to briefly say a few words about the governance after Brexit programme and UK and a changing Europe, which has brought us all here today. Um, to me, these programmes really perfectly encapsulate what I think of as this Michael Jungian dual vision of engagement and, um, and rigour. Um, they're a strategic investment for the Economic and Social Research Council and a really important part of our wider governance and policy programme. Um, through this programme, we funded 17 grants in two phases, which have taken what I think Dan has sort of already outlined, our innovative and ambitious approaches to looking at the long-term governance implications of Brexit for the UK. Um, they've covered a dizzying range of subjects, going, I think, where sometimes the traditional news agenda on Brexit doesn't reach, really asking awkward questions about Northern Ireland, getting into places that re reporters don't normally go, and really drilling into some of those things, but doing it in a spirit of rigour, and in a spirit of interdisciplinarity, which is really welcome as well. Um, the different methodological approaches, the ethnography, the economics, the political science, is, uh, I think, a really inspiring example for us from a social science point of view. And um, I think the traction that they've achieved, not just with national opinion formers, a few of whom I can see here today, and um, government, but also with local audiences is, um, I think, really inspiring and something that we would seek to learn from. Um, they've held 140, over 140, I believe, impact and engagement events over the course of the programme, which really is quite something, and I know they've thought quite carefully about those. These are not, these are not political, these are not theatre, they're not impact theatre. They have really cut through. Um, and they've made some great connections with other ESRC-funded projects, including our Brexit Priority Grants, our Between Two Unions project, and with research institutions in devolved nations and regions. Um, it has been inspiring to see how this has worked with the UK and a Changing Europe project, which for the last eight years has been a... Eight years? How long have you been going? Ten years! Ten years. Nine years, in, for the last nine years, has been, I think, the go-to source for reliable, impartial, to the extent that that's ever possible, research-based knowledge on UK-European relations and what goes on now after Brexit. I think um, those of you who, like me, have the familiar experience of turning on your television and seeing Anand talking about something will, 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 will bear witness to the fact that the project has carved out a really valuable claim that political science and social sciences in general have something distinctive to say about this big national episode that we're going through in a way that people are very familiar with an economist popping up on television to talk about the economy or a sophologist popping up on television to appear about elections. UK and a change in Europe has played a really important role in showing that social scientists have something really important to say and there's a distinctive field of expertise there. Um, I said I wasn't going to expound on the benefits or disbenefits of Brexit. I think the full implications of Brexit are clearly still not clear, but what is clear is that having an evidence-based, responsive research capacity to answer some of these questions and to really drill into the issues, as we'll see today, is incredibly valuable as the UK embarks on our journey as a non-member state. It's great to see social science playing a big role there, and I'm really looking forward to today, people coming together to discuss, to debate, and answer those questions. I'm going to leave it there, but we've got some time for questions and answers, and um, I'm really looking forward to what comes next. Thank you. OK, I've got the housekeeping that I forgot at the start. Uh, the main part of which is even for those in the room, if you can scan that QR code and use Slido for questions, that would be great. We've had loads of questions, not many of which had to do with what you were saying so far, <laughs> Stian. Partly because a lot of them pre sort of arrived before you started speaking, which is clever. But just to say for those of you who are asking on the Slido, we are doing an event on economics on the 31st of January. And I think that will be the opportunity to pose the vast majority of the questions we've had so far. Uh, in extremis, if someone here doesn't have a smartphone, then wave at me and I might ask you, but I'd far rather do these things on Slido if possible. Just to kick us off, I mean, 
you said we were savvy, which is nice, but probably not true in the sense that one confession I have is I'm still fairly uncertain what impact is. And have we, as a profession, as a community, managed to clarify? Are we sure in our own hearts? Are you sure at the SRC what, what this notion of impact actually means? It's a very good question, and it's something I have been musing on in one way or another for at least 15 years without coming up with mm -hmm. a clear answer. I think the real challenge, so I've very often been asked by boards, by other people I'm meant to be accountable to, to come up with a way of tracking metrics, metrics yeah. for impact, key performance indicators, yeah. OKRs and things like this. And where I've, my, my conclusion is that it's really, it's impossible to come up with a set of metrics that really rigorously defines impact and that the, any set of metrics you come up with generally has sort of, has, has, has perverse incentives. I don't know whether any of you get think tank mailings, but there, are, there, there, there was a phase about four or five years ago where quite a few think tanks would, whenever there was a fiscal event or a manifesto, send you a blurb saying, these are all the things that we asked for, and these are all the things that appeared in the budget or the, 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 mm -hmm. the statement, which, um, on the one hand, one would think, wow, gosh, these people are yeah. showing their donors or their supporters all the impact they're having. But there's an obvious perverse incentive there, mm. which is the obvious thing to do is to find out all the things that the government's going to do and say that you and recommend them two weeks beforehand. And there is, in my opinion, quite a lot of evidence that that was what actually was going on. Um, so all of those things, I think, are pretty We recommend the tax cuts, I'm just saying. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Um, so, 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 so that is a, so, 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 so that's one side of the challenge. The other side of the challenge is that if you have no metrics at all, it's very easy to spin any kind of story that yeah. you're having lots of impact. So the approach I've always used when I've run research organisations and tried to show what I'm doing is have some performance metrics, mm -hmm. but with a real with a narrative around them. So by all means, say we're on the news this much. We publish the following reports. These things were accepted but there needs to be a bit of a story behind them. Um, I guess that's why I am quite a fan of the impact case studies that obviously have been a part of the research excellence framework for researchers for a while, because I think narrative matters here. Uh, no system is perfect, and it is difficult to do these things at the kind of industrial scale that a research system applies. But probably that question of narrative, applying sort of a bit of phrenesis and good judgment is 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 the only way to do it. So I feel that, sorry. I feel that's a bit of a mealy mouth answer. No, no, not at all. I, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's genuinely not clear. I'm about to relax the rule I just set you because so many of the questions on Slido are to do with things that Stian hasn't talked about. What I would say is, if you have a question for him on something he has spoken about, and you'd like to raise your hand, we'll do it that way until Slido catches up. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, you're going to have to stand up and shout. I think, unless there's a. Oh, you've got a mic. Thanks ever so much. There's a mic coming down to you. The lady there. Uh, thank you. I was just trying to get a picture of your Slido thing. Uh, Sheila Page, ODI. I wanted to, it isn't quite what you spoke about, perhaps it's what I w wondered whether the project is going to look at, which is the impact of Brexit on, on the rest of the world. And I don't just mean the trading relationships, but the intellectual debate, the uh, role of uh, the UK in the world, the role of other regions in the world. Is there something on that in the project? And if not, why not? Shall I hand over to Dan, to Dan on yeah. that? Um, so the, the short answer to that is not very much. The, um, the program was originally conceived in a very uh, kind of UK focused kind of a way. So the uh, comparison was uh, excluded. I mean, it, you know, it, it was a very wide-ranging program anyway, um, so it had a lot to get on with. I have to say, you know, speaking personally as someone who's engaged in quite a lot of comparative research and externally oriented research, you know, it would be good to have that kind of a, 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 a focus as well. Although I would say that in its latest phase, UK and a changing Europe does have more of an outward-looking dimension. And it's always been engaged with the EU institutions, but it, you're now doing work looking at 
debates in France and Germany and, 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 and so on, uh, and, and the international relations context much more widely, aren't you? Yeah, that's true. And also, I think in the run-up to election, we'll try and do more comparative stuff, which is a sort of specific strength of I mean, everyone's going to be doing stuff on the election, but I think one of the insights that academic research can bring is to look at things comparatively. Uh, there's a jet. Go on, Dan. No, I was, I was just going to say, I, I do think this is one of the areas where the nature of the underlying research base is critically important, right? So the example of the war in Ukraine is, is a very easy uh, case. You know, before the war, people who specialized in social science related to Ukraine were in a kind of niche position. And suddenly, you know, their expertise became... Uh, a, a enormously important, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and some excellent people have uh, have been uh, able to use the UK in a changing Europe platform to get their expertise into places that uh, you know otherwise it might not have happened. I mean, it has to be said, you know, some of these things are are I think be beyond uh, uh, UKRI and ESRC alone to address. If you think about um, earlier phases in universities, uh, the UK government put a lot of funding into research on, uh, on, on, on um, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union back in the day or into uh, research in um, East Asia and Africa and so on. And so, so, you know, there were specific funding initiatives for those things and, and that's probably uh, a capacity that, that uh, the research funding ecosystem can't really take on. Can yeah. I reply a little bit as well? And so it's clearly an incredibly important question. Um, one of the things that we at UK Research and Innovation are doing more broadly beyond, beyond this project, we have a, a strategic theme uh, called building, or building a secure and resilient world, which is trying to look at some of these geopolitical questions. I'm sorry, it sounds a bit of a Davos-like title, but uh, it tries to address some of those questions. Obviously we're aware that there are real challenges in the research community given the changes to ODA um, research funding, which th there was a lot of it, there's now less of it as, as targets have changed, and we're aware of the disruptions that obviously that's caused to the research base. I think one of the things, it's been, we're very grateful to the way the research community has, has been able to work with, with that, and we're keen to work out, well, how can we how can we make sure that we take things in a positive direction in the future? Thank you. The gentleman there. Uh, yeah, Bernard Casey. Um, I wanted to take up um, the point that Stian had made, and I was very glad he made it. Um, Anand picked it up to some extent as well. I noticed that um, Anand is also a left-handed person. People with left hands and wearing glasses are always the cleverest people. <laughs> I happen to I happen to be left-handed and wear glasses as well, so maybe I was thinking the same way as he is. And that is that for many years as a social scientist, I had to sit and write research applications and talk about this issue of impact. And in many years, nobody exactly knew what it was. Um, people knew about refs and people who still were unclear about what it was. I was glad you addressed it, but I don't think you answered it, even to Anand, who tried to get you to answer a bit further, because you ended up by saying, well, there are no sets of, of, of metrics. You have to build your own. I fortunately am out of all of this now, so I don't have to worry about this. But given that these things are going off to uh, adjudicators outside, all of them will presumably also have their own sets of metrics which they're making up as they go along. And I don't, I feel that I would still be floundering vigorously if I were in the field. Thank you very much. That's a very good challenge. And I think there is, so that there, again, there is this question underlying all of this. What are the benefits to coming up with a consistent set of metrics that can be applied versus to what extent is this always going to be contextual and judgment-based in, 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 in a particular instance? So I was talking to some researchers yesterday, actually, who are uh, researching election psychology, very interesting social science subject, and um, they were making the point, I think very legitimately, that various sets of metrics that they were being asked to apply were not appropriate for the very specific things that they were doing. And I looked at that and I listened to this case being made by global experts in the field and I thought, well, they're, they're, they're right. 
but obviously you face the challenge, which is the challenge that I think you presented, which is if everything is sui generis, then how does one, how does one, how does one make judgments? At the moment, we get through that by a sort of bricolage. We try and we, we, we look at some metrics in the, uh, that, that we know are not perfect, but that at least are comparable. Are people engaging? Are they doing lots of events? Are their policy, uh, to the extent they're recommending policies, are they being implemented? But at the same time, we try and say, well, are the stories that they're telling on their own terms convincing, compelling to people with judgment? But as you say, that relies on judgment, it relies on, it relies on time, and it is, it is not perfect. Jill, you were waving at me. Uh, <laughs> the most unreachable part of the... <laughs> Ollie's sprinting round. Someone will log on mic. Sorry, I just did that to make Ollie get some exercise. Um, <laughs> I want to ask Ian whether he thought that Brexit and in particular sort of government's reaction perhaps to some of the evidence about Brexit had made the funding environment for the social sciences more treacherous for you to navigate. That is a very interesting question. Um, and interestingly, you know, when one... I, I, I had first of all thought when I started to inquire within government, would there be people who thought that UK and a changing Europe were unhelpful troublemakers, and um, I was quite, I was, I was pleasantly surprised to find I didn't encounter that 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 viewpoint. Wrong people. I was, I, I, I think there were a few people who thought that, but they were the sort of people who I think I would expected to hear that mm. from. But there was, a, there was a, I, what I didn't encounter was what I think one of the possible worlds that might lie behind your question, which is a sort of total view that social scientists were just really unhelpful troublemakers who say unhelpful things about, about, about the government's direction of travel. Um, the impression I get is, and this comes back to this thing that there isn't really one government, as you, you, know, you will know better than I do, there, is, there, are, there are so many different parties with so many different agendas, relatively few of which are very narrowly focused on this sort of very high-level question, what do we think of Brexit? Um, the impression I get is the demand for social science insight is, is, is really high. There's an interesting question which actually Anand sort of posed to me earlier, which is how much of this might be a COVID-related phenomenon? And certainly one thing I have noticed is a lot of phenomena that government find very problematic and really feel they need to understand that relate to COVID in one way or another are basically very so tricky social science problems. So to take, a, to take a very live question, labor market participation. Why are, why, are, why are lots of people out of the workforce at the moment? That is, obviously, it's partly an economic question. People like Steve Machen and the Resolution Foundation are doing great sort of narrow economic work on that, great economic work on that, I should say. But there's also a bunch of really interesting psychological and sociological questions behind that. Mm. There's a lot of questions about you know, the hypotheses. Is there something about being out of the labor market during a period of lockdown that somehow has some kind of ratchet or lock-in effect. And what I've noticed is people in government who would not necessarily identify as great friends of academia in a kind of general sense, realize that social scientists have really important things to say about these questions and are, and are, and are demanding answers. So maybe COVID and the kind of the, the managing the changes society of COVID have helped, but I get the feeling there's a lot of demand for social science in insight, and there hasn't really been any kind of Brexit-related circling of wagons. Can I come in mm? quickly, though? I, I, I think that's a, a really interesting and important point. Uh, I was involved in uh, on, on, a, on a panel for ESRC evaluating COVID urgency grants, um, and it was clear that <coughs> most of the questions that government wanted, the largest volume of them, came into the social sciences. Um, uh, and yet there's also a kind of a challenge which maybe the current COVID inquiry is throwing up, right? I think it's absolutely right there should be more people with uh, scientific backgrounds entering the civil service through the fast stream. You know, they talk about 90% social science humanities, 10% uh, 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 other sciences. Um, uh, and there's a very, but there's a very clear narrative coming through that, you know, people in government just don't understand the science and, and that's a problem. Uh, and yet, um, uh, on the one hand, I think a good social science education ought to make you able to read, uh, to understand what exponential means, uh, uh, for instance. I, I mean, that, that seems fairly straightforward. But on the other side, I think there is a danger with 
policymakers, with both officials and elected politicians, that social science deals with the things that they feel they understand already. Um, and so making that claim about distinctive expertise is a more challenging one. And, and you know, I've certainly been in plenty of uh, 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 meetings, some of which may have been Potemkin meetings of, of, ver of various sorts, where you know, an advisor has said, um, oh yes, but what about, um, you know, what about Andrew McIntyre's approach to political, th and it, you just feel like it's you know, someone's hobby horse yeah. that's, been, that's been thrown out. It's a kind of, uh, it's a status claim which actually ends up marginalizing the, the, the sort of deep expertise of social scientists. So I think there's a, there is a bit of a, a, a tension there about what count as claims to authoritative knowledge uh, uh, coming out of social science research. That's such a good point. And I, it feels like this is a bit of a mixed blessing in some ways, because on the one hand, it's very frustrating to have lots of basically amateurs claiming to have deep social science impact. On the other hand, I think if we had some scientists in the room, they would say, well, at least you're lucky. At least these policymakers who did PPE at Oxford or whatever and spent a year studying this stuff, at least they're receptive to the, the at least they recognize that it's a discipline of knowledge. And I think it's a really, it, as you say, it's a, it's a, it can sometimes be terrible because you, you amateurs think they know the answers. Um, on the plus side, you don't have that thing where people view it as a totally alien and, and, and that's not to say that these amateurs are not very bright people yeah, who no, know no. some yeah. other stuff very well. I wouldn't want to give that impression for a second. So. I'm sorry. sorry, but Catherine Barnard is gesticulating oh, angrily okay. at me to say we're, oh. we're out of time. <laughs> I mean, we could have gone on for ages. I'm sorry we didn't give, give you longer for this that's session, but Dan, thank you so much for kicking off. Thank Stian, you. thank you so much for coming. I hope we can have you back at future events. <laughs> Catherine, all yours. <laughs> sorry. to see all of you here. I'm sorry to have, well, actually I'm not that sorry, to have removed Anand Menon from the stage um, because we have a far more interesting panel now um, which is talking about real things, um, namely migration. Um, and so I have um, the privilege of uh, welcoming Charlotte O'Brien on my left and Nando Sigona on my right who are both going to do um, a brief presentations on the research that they have been doing as part of this program. And then uh, Keshia Tobin from the Three Million Group and Ian Robinson from Vialto are going to have an opportunity to comment on what they've heard and add uh, some further observations. As Anand said, please use Slido if you can, and I'll try and take as many questions as I can. We have a reasonable amount of time in this session. So, you go for, the floor is yours, Nanta. Go ahead. Um, 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about our um, project as part of the governance after Brexit. Um, and to just tell you, actually, uh, echoing some of the issues that were discussed earlier, not the idea of talking about migration, but trying to do a step back from just uh, uh, focus and frame the issue of migration within the present. So what we try to do with our project uh, Migzen, uh, rebordering Britain and Britons after Brexit, is also to look in particular at the relationship uh, between uh, this new ideological project of global Britain and the direction that migration and the governance of migration are going. The project is a collaboration with the Lancaster University, Professor Michael Benson, and a partnership with three organizations that um, uh, like the Three Million, uh, British in Europe, and Migrant Voice that uh, have helped us throughout the process of research. Um, the research is currently still ongoing, and we will complete it by the end of March 2024. What I'm going to try to do today is just to give you briefly our sort of key research question, what we are exploring, what is our approach, uh, and uh, just deep in more uh, specifically, in uh, what we know about the direction that migration, in particular immigration, has gone uh, since Brexit, uh, what, what to tell us about the res this relationship? In what ways the shift in migration and migration governance are helping us also understand the direction that global Britain is going? So in terms of the research aims of the project, are uh, basically threefold. On one end, we try to focus and understand the way that migration uh, in and uh, to Britain has changed uh, since the, the Brexit referendum and more recently since actually the finalization of Brexit. We will try to understand not just in the way that the relationship with Europe and the mobility through uh, from Europe has changed, but also more broadly our global migration towards Britain is changed and also from Britain in terms of uh, bringing into the picture also the changing in British emigration. The second aspect we are exploring is in what ways this transition, this uh, post-Brexit has affected a long-established community. So we've done carry out work with, in particular with the British national living in Europe and EU national that have settled in Britain uh, since before Brexit. And the third part of the project focused very much on the new migrants coming in, in the UK with research, with in-depth research focusing on particular on uh, Ukrainian nationals and Hong Kongers that have come through the um, humanitarian visa schemes. So the starting point, so this is a relationship between this Global Britain project and, and migration. When we started, uh, Global Britain was not yet there as a term, it was very much discussion was about migration after Brexit, but in a sense, Brexit as a rupture uh, has left the space for a new imagination. So there is an opening up of a space to reimagine the position of Britain in the world. Here is got the words of uh, Theresa May in 2017 when she talks about the fact that there is a space now to think again what we want to be as a country, both in relation as a country but also as ourselves, as, as Britons. Um, and what I try to do is try to see how this making of global Britain really rely on migration, the political migration. How the, so to the trope that we have discussed a lot uh, uh, in the last few years about this taking back, con back control really means. Because taking back control was not about stopping migration, or at least was implied, but that was not what happened in reality. But something else happened to migration which can tell us a lot about the direction the country is going. Certainly one thing which is uh, important is to, uh, to see the, the obsession with the issue of migration. So while on one end we know from um, a lot of public attitude survey that my, the, the, the relevance of the migration issues has decreased since the Brexit referendum, on the other end we've seen the migration as an issue dominating the, the public conversation and the media. We have seen uh, what we call a kind of form of legal activism and uh, in terms of producing uh, norms and, and plans for changing the face of migration. One important thing and in a sense, the starting point is that coming out of the European Union, there was a need for a new migration regime that would understand and feed so to the, the country. Uh, but interestingly, this conversation has been very much monopolized by specific forms of mobility, which is what is called the regular migration, or in particular the regular crossing in, um, uh, in, the, in the English Channel. And everyone has heard about the, the the BB Stockholm barge or the Rwanda plan, except, but much less about the bigger plan, the bigger picture around migration. So one of the promise of Brexit was to um, taking back control. There was an emphasis on the, uh, migration as an invasion, which in this narrative assists also before, but it was particularly strong 
in, 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 in the last few years. And in a sense, what you see since the referendum is that the split, if you look in terms of the mobility from Europe to Britain, something has changed dramatically. So what we see is the number of uh, EU nationals coming in to the UK declining significantly. And the number of EU nationals that uh, left the UK, previously living in the country, has increased. So overall, the net migration from Europe has decreased significantly and currently uh, finds itself actually in a negative point. However, the other side of the story is uh, that sometimes it doesn't fit within the narrative around Brexit is that the overall number of, uh, uh, of migrants coming to the UK has increased massively. So the so-called net migration overall has increased significantly. How do we explain it? So I guess as a sociologist here, and with this idea of taking a step back, is also try to understand these dynamics and try to create a narrative which provides an alternative to what is the conversation which is obsessed with specific forms of mobility. So what we're seeing is, and this is where, in a sense, taking back control starts to take shape, so that you have a significant change in, in the social demographic profile of the new migrants that are coming to the UK. So, and this is particular, um, uh, Evident if you consider the transformation in the population of international students. So the population of international students in Britain is really makes one of the largest group of, of uh, visa holder in the, at the end of 2022, which is the last full year we got data of. And just to give you an example of this transformation, uh, out of the um, of the number of, of uh, around the 400, uh, 485,000 international students coming to Britain in 2022. About 250,000, over 50%, were either Chinese or Indian. People were arguing that uh, the number of international migrants had increased. And one of the reasons was because now the European nationals, the European students, were no longer sort of treated as home students, but had become international students. However, what is interesting is that the first nationality of you nationals in this figure is made of French students, and there are only about 3,000. So from, if you are in a university, what you observed in your class everywhere, your PhD student, master student, is the complete disappearance of you, of you students. Why is paying attention to you students is important? Because the, you students are also the future of migration in the country. Many ways, we know the role that the programmers like Erasmus or International Exchange, or anyway, the fact that we had students coming from Europe were making in terms of creating families, relationships, long-term ties, and that's disappearing. The other key element here is that uh, uh, despite the fact there's been an emphasis on, um, on, on, uh, on this idea of a more fair system, apparently according to the government, the, the intra-EU mobility of EU citizens was an unfair system because we're privileging the uh, EU national, what we saw is also the increased use of uh, humanitarian visas as a tool, ad hoc system of entry. However, what has changed and, and uh, is also another thing, it's not just about who comes in, but what is important, what are changing are the terms and conditions that people come in with. Uh, what we're seeing is the fragmentation of uh, and aggression regimes, which has created a lot of different pathways, has created a lot of different eligibility criteria, has raised the visa cost, has applied different rights at uh, different groups of people. So creating a huge fragmentation, which also affects uh, the solidarity movement among migrants. But, uh, in, and uh, this is also particularly evident with uh, how the position of EU national has changed in Britain. So we know obviously introduction of EU settled scheme, we know about the pre-settled scheme, but what we don't know much less is the fact, obviously, is that the new Europeans that comes in are basically um, are treated through the mainstream migration regime and also basically almost invisible within the, the country. So the, the rights of also the same groups have changed over time. This also has changed, for example, in terms of uh, the capacity to family reunion or access to various fundamental rights, etc. The final element of this story of how migration changed and is very much not discussed is that uh, decide who we want, in the, uh, who we like, or constructing this idea of migration in Britain, in global Britain, is also about who we don't want. And so that is where interesting observation can be taken from looking at the data we have on uh, um, forced removal, deportation, in other words. Well, you see that despite, and this is something in a sense counterintuitive, despite a very tough talk on migration and obsession with removals, and we have a, a stronger border, actually the capacity of the government to enforce immigration control is decreased massively. The data there show from 2013 to 2022, you can see a decline both in terms of forced removal, 
or, and of voluntary removal. And I have no time now to go into what's different, what, what tell us the different aspects of this new subjective that are emerging. The only group that keeps the data a little bit up is basically um, the refusal of entry. Because the refusal of entry is something that has no need of bilateral agreement in many ways. Refusal of entry is something that is easier to implement rather than the removal which includes a different relationship with the country of origin. And the other point which is interesting about this point about who is, we don't like anymore. Um, in this figure that is already declined, the, significant, the presence of EU national has increased massively. So over the same period, between 2013 and 2022, the number of EU nationals that were subject to removal went from about 14 to 15% of the number of forced removal to almost 50%. So in many ways, the EU national have become an easier target to signal our still capacity to remove, while everyone else is not there. So just to close, what we see in terms of this emerging sort of new migrants figure that is emerging is the production of migrants that may be increased in numbers from a different uh, um, uh, country of origin, but also a fragmentation of legal status, a precarization of their position in society, uh, the production of what we call a migrant workers without docile and exploitable, preferably without their families. So this idea that goes back almost in 1970s Germany relationship with Turkey to an extent. We also see that there are also new, prior, new prioritization in terms of the direction of migration enforcement and a serious tension between a narrative about the brightest and best and the difficulties of the country to deal with the needs of the labor market and also the long-term legacies of previous migration. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed, Nandi. Thank you. I would like to uh, speak about some key findings from another ESRC-funded project, the EU Rights and Brexit Hub. Now, the, a key core element of the hub was the setting up of a second-tier advice clinic, so giving advice to organisations around the UK who are working with EU nationals accessing public services. And in the course of that, we compiled and are still compiling evidence, documenting evidence of the obstacles and the barriers encountered in an advice-led ethnography. But one thing that we've discovered in the course of this is that doing the research in turn informs the advice that we're giving to the organisation. So there's advice-led ethnography, but there's an element of ethnography-led advice going on at the same time. And in that circle, there are also opportunities to input into policy areas. So responding to consultations, giving evidence, uh, whether it's Potemkin or not, uh, to the IMA, to um, APPGs, to select committees and so on, and feeding into strategic litigation. Now, one of our key findings, uh, uh, in my own head anyway, uh, is that actually the, the space that we occupy, we feel a little bit like a uh, duck-billed research platypus. Now, bear with me, uh, because we are fish and fowl. We give advice, but we also do research. We also do policy work. We also do teaching and training. We do ethnography. We do various social science research methods, but also some really forensic doctrinal analysis. And what I argue, one of our conclusions, is that in a fast-changing area of law, this kind of approach is really quite fruitful. And so my, uh, if you take nothing else away, take away the message, embrace the platypus. Um, so... Not only is this a fast-changing area of law, it is a new species of law. And I am just realising now there's a bit of a biodiversity theme to my metaphors. That's not intentional. It is a new species of law. We're dealing with withdrawal agreement law or withdrawal law. It's international law, but it has direct effect. There's an EU-ish element to it, but it's not EU law. And it's unprecedented. And because it's unprecedented, that means there are frequent and severe opportunities for frictional injustice, for people to fall through the gaps, for uh, people to get caught in the crossover. And there are various key points of friction, the creation of and the interpretation of the withdrawal agreement, how that is implemented in UK legislation, how that then is interpreted in litigation, and then how that happens in practice when decision makers are operating. 
And one example of the ways in which we have yet to know what the withdrawal mean, what the withdrawal agreement means and what it does is the position of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU with regard to people with pre-settled status. Pre-settled status being one of the two statuses set up post-Brexit under the EU settlement scheme for people who were resident before Brexit in the UK, EU nationals and their family members, but have been resident for less than five years. And the question we have to ask is, should the provisions of the withdrawal agreement be read in light of the Charter? There's a number of indications within the withdrawal agreement that it ought to be. Article 2 suggests that union law should be interpreted to include the, include the charter. Article 4 suggests the agreement should be interpreted in line with methods and principles of union law. The charter is a provision, a tool of interpretation, so arguably it's both a method and a principle. The closest provision we have in the withdrawal agreement to residence rights for people with pre-settled status is Article 13. And that makes reference to points of union law. So does that, in a convoluted way, bring the Charter back into play? And why does it matter? Well, part of the reason it matters is because in 2019, the UK government, whether or not it exists, introduced regulations exempting or excluding pre-settled status from being a type of right to reside that counted for benefits like universal credit. Now, these regulations were subject to... Uh, challenge in a complicated litigation journey involving two cases, involving several courts. The Court of Justice of the EU found that the regulations were okay in principle, but the government should not refuse benefits to people with pre-settled status until after checking that their fundamental rights in the Charter weren't violated, in particular their right to dignity. Now this case were dealt with facts before the end of transition. <laughs> which means that inevitably we are faced with the question, what happens after? What happens now? People with pre-settled status claiming benefits relying on the withdrawal agreement. The Secretary of State's position is the Charter doesn't apply, and if it did apply, it wouldn't make a difference. Now, so far, seven judges have dealt with this question in the case of AT. A first-tier tribunal judge, a three-judge panel in the upper tribunal, and three judges in the Court of Appeal. And all of them have disagreed with the Secretary of State, noting that the UK's position is essentially that the UK and EU thought it was not necessary to ensure that people with rights in the withdrawal agreement could exercise them in a dignified manner, even if they were requesting a bare minimum of support and were fleeing domestic violence. And the court found that that was an unacceptable construction. So the charter applies and it creates a right to an individual assessment of rights. Now, in this case, the hub provided, our hub, EU Rights and Breaks Hub, provided expert analysis to one of the interveners, the Air Centre, uh, demonstrating that in a frontier area of law, it's really important for academia and practice to work together, embrace the platypus. So we're dealing with areas of friction that involve the withdrawal agreement, how it's implemented in uh, legislation, how that's then litigated, but then we're faced with another point of friction, which is attempting to rely on those judgments. How are they implemented in practice? Now, after the case, the CG case established that a charter assessment was necessary before refusing benefits, the uh, Secretary of State declined to amend its decision-maker guidance to make any reference to a charter assessment. When challenged on this, the Secretary of State said they simply did not consider it was required. Since the ATUT judgment, they've apparently changed their position and changed their guidance, but it's not published guidance. We've only seen it because the Child Poverty Action Group submitted an FOI requesting it. And so it's not been in, scrutiny has not been invited. And that is problematic because we've already identified several problems with the, with the guidance. One of which is that it does not require uh, decision makers to consider charter rights of their own volition or at the outset. The guidance is essentially refuse first, don't even ask questions later, expect the claimants to know that they have to raise the issue and ask the questions later. So these EU nationals and their family members have to be fully abreast of this complex litigation. And what's also problematic is they only do that in the point of appeal. And a lot of people don't appeal, so there's a serious access to justice point here. And then when they do appeal, the 
cases we are seeing are being stayed, which means the government is deciding we can put these on hold, these appeals don't need to be decided until this AT case has completed its way through the courts. Given that it may yet be appealed to the Supreme Court, there may be a reference to the Court of Justice, we're talking a very prolonged process before some very vulnerable people ever get their access to benefits decided. And that's even though by definition those claimants will often be in hardship and the Secretary of State's own guidance says do not put off appeals where someone is in hardship. Now I've adduced a few excerpts of case studies here of cases we've seen that give an insight into why this is important and some of the people who are affected. So the first case there, the client was at risk of street homelessness because benefits were refused because he had pre-settled status. There had been no consideration of the possibility he might be entitled to permanent residence rights as a result of an industrial accident. In the second case there, we faced a possible destitution of a woman who was a, a victim of domestic violence and who had a baby that was less than a year old. The third case involved a woman with children kept waiting for well over a year for her EUSS decision to be made. Even though she was entitled to settled status, she was treated for so long as having a pending application, she became reliant on food banks and charities. And we've highlighted the fourth case there because of the letter from the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, which effectively announced a blanket policy. That is not what was promised. That is not protection. That is not equal treatment. And one of the biggest looming questions, which may be yet another battle to be had, is how and to what extent the withdrawal agreement meaningfully prohibits discrimination. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. We've had a good um, range of information from uh, Nando looking at some of these, uh, some of the data which um, may well surprise to Charlotte um, doing a very good case for the wonders of being a lawyer and what can be done with law, albeit after a very lengthy process. Um, I now give the floor to um, you to comment. Um, are you going to go first? Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you, <laughs> um, th thank you, thank you both for that. I think both of these um, presentations and pieces of research really highlight the extent to which European citizens who were in the UK before <coughs> Brexit have found themselves in a precarious position in the UK for the first time. There's a great deal of uncertainty that remains about the way in which they're going to be able to thrive and establish themselves in the UK. And on top of that <coughs> uncertainty, of course, as we've heard, there are the inevitable challenges which come with an entirely new set of laws on top of that. And that, of course, is also in the context of an increasingly hostile immigration regime. Um, now, I think uh, we have to acknowledge that the rollout of the EU settlement scheme, which was put in place to enable EU, my, EU citizens and their family members who were here before Brexit, um, and, and who came to the UK with, with no expectation of being migrantized in the way that they then were. Um, uh, it, it was a, a, yeah, the immigration regime that was put in place to enable them to secure their, their rights in the UK. So for many EU migrants who've come to the UK since then, since um, the, the cut-off period, 
the EU settlement scheme doesn't apply and they have to apply through the much more stringent, um, difficult, regular migration channels that other migrants from other countries have to, have to apply under. And so I think it's only right that we acknowledge that in many ways the, the initial rollout of the EU settlement scheme was a success, it was fairly straightforward to apply, and at least at the outset the Home Office's response to applications was to, to consider them with a view to granting decisions were made quickly and, and applications for the most part were successful. But what we've seen is a dramatic shift away from that. Um, increasingly there is um, a real um, pervasive sense of skepticism on the part of Home Office decision makers, one that is um, rife throughout the rest of Home Office decision making in relation to other immigration applications. We've seen um, a real increase in the length of time that people are waiting for decisions to be made on their applications. Um, I've got some statistics on that. I think it, initially it was just a matter of days or months, uh, days or weeks. The Home Office say that they aim to get applications decided within a, within a month. But in fact, at December last year, there were over 7,000 cases in which people had been waiting more than 18 months for an initial decision on their applications. That was December last year. That's gone up. The following quarter, by March this year, there were over 12,000 applications that had been waiting for that long. And you can just imagine the extent to which people's lives are on hold while these decisions um, are pending. And whereas initially applications were being granted, we see now over 60% of EUSS, which is the settlement, short form of the settlement scheme, applications being refused. It's increasingly difficult for people to demonstrate why there are reasonable grounds for them having made late applications. The Home Office is making it increasingly difficult for people to even get through the, the, the initial barriers that are put in place to have their um, decisions considered in the first place. Um, and um, of course that leads to instability in all sorts of, lev in all sorts of ways in terms of people's ability to, to get and maintain employment uh, people's ability to rent accommodation because, of course, um, the process for checking someone's immigration status, as we know, has been pushed out onto landlords and employers and so on. Um, so um, one of the things that we've heard about that I just want to, to elaborate on a little bit is the extent to which EU migrants now struggle to access state support. Um, for migrants in the UK, they have to in making a claim for support like universal credit, pass what's called a habitual residence test. And that includes a, a second right to reside test. So simply having immigration status in the UK isn't enough. For some migrants, and this, this includes those with pre-settled status, they have to go and, and cross another hurdle to show that they have an additional right to reside on top of their literal right to reside. Um, and it can be very difficult for people to show that they meet that threshold. For people with pre-settled status, what it essentially means is that they have to show that they um, continue to exercise old treaty, um, EU treaty rights. Um, for most people, that means being able to show that they're workers. And there are big, big challenges for people, particularly in the gig economy and people working um, in lower income jobs where perhaps they don't meet the tax threshold, they might not have easy access to, to tax documents that show that they've been working. There are complicated legal assessments that need to be done about um, showing, uh, to, to determine whether or not somebody's employment is genuine and effective. Um, and one thing um, that I think Charlotte touched on is, is the importance of being able to access legal support for these sorts of issues. And there is a real absence of that, a real lack of good legal advice, both in terms of immigration law and EUSS um, um, expertise in particular, because it's so new, but also welfare law for, for this group of people. And we know now that there are 3,500 applications for universal credit made by EU citizens refused in this country every month. And so the burden for that is being, is being shunted back onto, onto um, uh, local councils who are having to, to deal with people in, at the point of 
real destitution. Um, but there's one, one last thing that I want to, to just touch on, which is um, an example of the way in which the experiences of EU migrants now post-Brexit is indicative of the challenges that are becoming the reality for all migrants is the issue of digital immigration status because digital immigration status has been something that's been rolled out with EU citizens as sort of the guinea pigs. It's been trialed with them and there are significant problems with it. The, the current form of digital status is, is basically not fit for purpose and there's been a real lack of proper consultation within wider civil society on it. People aren't given a physical proof of their immigration status anymore. It's simply um, a, a, a number, a, a code that's generated from a website, website on the fly each time somebody needs to prove their immigration status, which can be often. Um, and maybe we'll have time to talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but I'm conscious that I've used up my allocated um, time. But um, yeah, I think digital status is, is something that um, we need to have um, a much more um, comprehensive discussion about. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. It's very good to get some um, uh, experience of what's happening on the ground. Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'll make, uh, I'll make several observations and I'm, I'm going to try and connect various comments from this panel and the earlier panel. Uh, and, and I'm sort of shoehorning in the earlier panel, but I, it, may, it may be helpful and it may be relevant. So Stiem uh, talked about there being no such thing as government, which isn't, isn't something I've heard before, but it, it makes sense in, in, in the way that he put it. Uh, we, he also talked about social sciences and the use of social sciences in policy making. So I want to start just on that point and say I, I'm here as a partner from Vialto, big global immigration law firm. Um, but I'm, I'm here actually because uh, Jill, I think, wanted a, a, a former civil servant, former Home Office civil servant on the panel. And I was in the Home Office for 10 years, did various jobs um, on family policy, economic policy, criminality policy, and so on. In those, in those 10 years, I, and please excuse me for this, but I, I can't remember social sciences ever being mentioned um, as a source of information. That may be a friend of mine moved from the Home Office to the Foreign Office. And it may be, that may be particular to the Home Office. He talked about how the Home Office is really good at doing things, but doesn't always think. The Foreign Office was really good at thinking about things, but didn't really do much. I don't know if, um, I, I, don't think that, I don't think that that's fair on the Home Office, but there could be, there could be, there could be something there culturally. Uh, the, one, the one person I remember in my time um, uh, at the Home Office who actually looked at the sorts of reports that we've talked about was a man called Mark Owen, who is now in charge of the visa system and was incredibly intellectually curious, and he would be challenging them and asking, what can, what can we do with this? How can we use it? For the rest of us, it was a question of rebutting uh, reports rather than reviewing them. What do we say when they make it to the media? What is the Home Office's position on this? Or rather, why is our position right and whatever is in the report generally, generally wrong? So when we tie this into the, the, the first conversation from the earlier panel, I suppose the point that I, I would make is that they are, it's not an easy road, but the work is important and it's valuable and it makes a difference. And we know that this sort of work makes a difference because frankly, um, because of everything the Three Million has started for a start uh, and achieved for a start. I remember the work that I, um, the time I dedicated to circular migration when, when Phil Woolis was our immigration minister and that came from IPPR and work that IPPR had um, conducted. And it is useful and it is valuable, but if you're producing this work, you need to ask yourselves, who is going to read it and how can I motivate them to read it? And you need to accept that everybody in the morning wakes up wanting to do a good job. You need to ask yourself who it is that you need to interact with, what they consider to be a good job, not what you consider to be a good job for them. Uh, and then you need to help them put your work into that context so that they can actually, they can actually use it. And I, I won't give examples, but I would, I'm sure, I'm sure I have many. Uh, and when you're thinking about that, you're generally thinking at quite a macro level, as Nando was, about what this means for policy for, for the masses. Uh, but you also, and I, I've never, I don't think I've heard frictional injustice as a phrase before, but it's perfect and that describes it. You need to remember that policymakers, when, they, when they're thinking about these things, think at a macro level, the frictional injustices, they just happen. Um, but our, our default, our line was always, 
but that's why we've got judicial review, or that's why we've got um, appeal. Uh, and that's fine, but what I don't think that I appreciated when I was sat in Croydon or sat in Marsham Street was the, the impact that those policies had on individuals' lives and, and, and how hard it is for a normal person to, to go to jail. I mean, think about the money to pay a, a barrister or a lawyer to go to judicial review for a start, let alone the, stre the stress. I used to, I thought I was very clever at the time, and I may think I'm very clever now because I'm telling the story, but I, many of you may know the film A Matter of Life and Death, the um, Pressburger and Powell film, lovely film. And at the end, they talk about the rules being there for the common man um, and not the uncommon man. And we, that, that's sort of how we, inter no one else was quite as pompous or pretentious as I was in, in, in bringing it back to a David Niven film, but that's how we took it. This is judicial review and the rules and frictional injustice for, is for the un uncommon man. But it isn't, like I've learned since I've left, I'm now in a law firm, it's for normal people who just get caught, caught up in, in the churn of it. Um, moving, on, moving on to what this means and what this looks like for the immigration system as a whole after Brexit, I'm not gonna talk about asylum, I'm not gonna talk about Rwanda, that is something that I would have strong personal opinions on, uh, but they're, they're only uh, personal opinions. Um, I. I enjoyed listening to Nando talking about the fragmentation of status in the immigration system. And that took me back to 2007, uh, 2006, 2007, Liam Byrne being the immigration minister and saying, why on earth do we have 80 odd immigration categories? This is ridiculous. How can, how can you implement this? How can people understand it? It, it makes no sense. Um, one, one of the jobs I subsequently took was involved in rationalising that system and moving everything into a, the original points-based system. We've now got a new points-based system which is pretty much the same one but slightly different. Um, but what's gone unnoticed, certainly by me until I heard it, but I think in the industry more generally, and probably by many people in the Home Office, is having pushed everything together into what were presented as five simple tiers, it was more complicated than that, it, it is fragmenting. We have categories coming out all over the shop uh, and they come out in response to whatever issue there happens to be in the media or in the department and it is a response to, to dysfunction. But that dysfunction, I would say, is, is fairly minor and I, I think I would, say, I would say, if I was at the sharp end of this, I might disagree with me, but I would say that over, over the, it, on the whole, the immigration system, leaving aside Rwanda, leaving aside asylum, it, it's fine. There, there are, it's, it's working as it's supposed to be. Uh, and that, and that, that's good, but it's also, it's also bad. So it's good, and if we take um, EUSS as, as an example, you were right, it, it, was the first, it was the first piece of technology, the first piece of policy to be successfully um, delivered by anyone in government. And the Home Office did a really good job on it. The app was really easy to use, the guidance was good. The comms were not uh, everything that civil society wanted, but they were pretty good and, and they, they, were, they were everywhere. Lots and lots of people knew about them. Um, but there were also losers, the people who didn't know, uh, the elderly people, um, infirmed people, uh, children in some cases as well, people who were not digitally able to make an application and scared of um, um, ringing up and asking for a form or however they wanted to apply. We still have, we still have the high uh, rates of refusals, uh, particularly, don't ask me for a stat on this, but particularly for non-European family members of uh, Europeans or, or people with dual nationality. And we still have, I, I completely agree on the physical document point. I think, I think that electronic status makes absolute sense for the Home Office. It's cheaper, it's more secure, it's easier to administer, it's a good common sense modern policy, it, it's really good, except for the frictional injustice for those who, who feel uncomfortable with electronic status, who are able, unable for various reasons to access it. I have um, several people in my family are blind. My, my aunties would have no chance of understanding um, um, as they're living alone, understanding digital status or knowing what to do. And probably they would be okay, but probably it would make them sad, it would create stress. And, and one day, we know with Windrush, people who, who should be okay um, aren't necessarily. The new immigration system, I, I hear Jonathan Portes, who I know is associated with this group, uh, talk about this uh, an awful lot. It actually works and it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's, it's a it's a demand-driven system that is designed to make sure that skilled people, as defined by the Home Office, 
are able to come to the UK and they're coming in and we, and we saw from the charts on the, on the screen, loads of them, <laughs> loads of them are coming in, uh, mainly for the health service and the care sector, but for other sectors as well. It's like, it's a good system in so far as it's achieving the aims that it needs to. Um, but there is friction in there, uh, and this isn't necessarily uh, frictional uh, friction. Uh, this is friction if you are if you're an SME. It's really really complicated to apply. I had a good call with a man last week who's just taken over a small business in um, I think it was somewhere somewhere in the south. He's got no clue what he's doing because he's attempting to keep a Iranian national who's worked there for a couple of years uh, with a visa as dependent of his partner. So we can help him, but of course that's, I mean, it's competitive, but it's expensive uh, to go to with a law firm. Um, so that's expensive. The immigration fees are expensive and they're expensive. So if we were to uh, sponsor an individual for um, a single person for three years, you're looking at six grand in government fees. If they were married with three kids and coming for five years, I totted that up before I sat down as being about £34,000 just in government fees before the rest of the costs associated with the move. It's, um, yeah, I'll finish now. Uh, and it's not great if you're employing low-skilled workers. There are also, and if any of you don't already, please, if, please follow Focus on Labour Exploitation. They do a lot of good work about how the system unintentionally enables exploitation of different, uh, different forms for uh, particularly in the care sector but other sectors as well and then uh, for the seasonal agricultural worker scheme. But just to finish, but it's going okay despite all that because it's not in the news. We know that the Home Sec, we learned this week that Suella Braverman wanted to get rid of uh, graduate visas or, or limit them. She didn't because there wasn't enough pressure from the news over numbers and not enough pressure um, to give her the opportunity that she needed to convince number 10. We, we know that there are issues in there, but it's sort of, it's, it, it's muddling along and employers are by and large getting the, the people that they need. And that will be, if we go back to people just wanting to wake up and do a good job, I mean, that's a good job and that, that's good enough for them. So I covered a lot of ground there. Don't know how much of it or if any of it was useful, but I'll um, pass back. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, thank you to those of you who've already submitted questions. Just a reminder that uh, Slido is the way forward. Um, uh, if, um, of course, for those of you who are technologically literate, if you're not, if you're, not you're thus excluded from the system. Um, uh, so um, I just want to pick up, there's a question which directly relates to your last point, which is, um, of course, the extraordinary cost um, of getting uh, a visa when combined with the um, health, care, health um, service surcharge. Um, what would a Labour government do if it got into power and will it address some of these uh, issues that have been raised? Ian, do you want to start um, with that? Yeah, I can, I can start by saying, that? so on cost for visas is the cost of the visa, the cost of sponsorship, an immigration sur health surcharge and then an immigration skills surcharge and it, it all adds up. The UK used this as a tool to generate revenue for the NHS and the skills system, although we've no idea where in the skills system it goes. And they also use it to disincentivize employees to demotivate them from sponsoring workers. The, the absurdity there is, it, like we saw from the charts, it doesn't work, loads of people still come in, but it is a, it is a revenue generator. We are, uh, we are the most expensive immigration system in the world. The Americans are catching up in various ways in different categories, generally aimed at tech. The Aussies are catching up, uh, and that's because, of course, Aussie policymakers speak partly because they speak to uh, UK policymakers, but that, that's where we stand. Would Labour do anything about that? I, I, I heard Stephen Kinnock at the IPPR session at conference say that he thinks it's too expensive, but we know that we know that there's no sense in having any conversation with Labour about anything unless it's costed. And I frankly, I, I, I frankly can't see how they can cut out a load of money from the immigration system through these charges without knowing where the money will come from elsewhere. There is an argument that it could be uh, recalibrated so that it's less difficult for a family to apply for visas, so that it's less difficult. One of my friends is married with two kids. Uh, you're talking eight and a half grand for him and his family to get indefinite leave to remain. That, I mean, that would be a big chunk of a, a mortgage deposit. The, there are ways to make it fairer, but I can't see it going down. But please disagree. Anyone else want to have an, any other insights about what a Labour government might yeah, do? No, just, just on this, just one short point. I, I guess there may be ways to review 
the, the fees cost. One would be to, to bring, bring in the, the point you made earlier, Jan, about the, the tension and dialogue between the foreign office and the home office in relation to, to migration and management or migration. Because clearly an issue in which you are the country in Europe, an international which has the highest uh, fees for migration, it may be raised when you go to negotiate your trade deals, you, you engage with your partner in Europe, that they expect some kind of reciprocity, etc. So there may be a way of reopening up the, the issue. And the other one would be about the, the huge amount of pain that these fees are producing within the country. So basically that over time are basically going to amplify, that it create an happiness, there may be protests, etc. So there may be a shift in terms of the narrative also from the, from the inside. Yeah, I'll, I'll just um, just a couple of brief points. I, that I've heard in the last few days even talk about the possibility of in, um, introducing the ability for people to pay for their immigration fees in instalments, which is something that, that I hadn't um, heard that much discussion of before. Um, but that, that certainly might help people with the huge fees, particularly when it's a whole family having to pay. Um, and I think, um, of course, I mean, I don't know what, what Labour would do differently. I know that the, the general trend is, is not a very positive one, despite the fact that we know that the overall population's attitudes to migration have actually improved in the last few years. Um, so it would, I, I hope that we might see a, a shift um, in policy that would reflect that. Um, but as you've said, a lot of it comes down to what's in the news. Um, what I would say is just on the, on the digital immigration status point, that um, in conversations that we've had uh, and that others in the sector have had with them, it does seem that there's some acknowledgement on the part of the Home Office now that um, the digital-only immigration status that's been rolled out might need reconsideration and that there are certain circumstances particularly for vulnerable people and particularly at the point of travel across international borders, that a physical document might be necessary. I think the Home Office ref referred to it as a token. Um, so there's some potential movement on that. Thank you. I have various questions about numbers. Um, I'll take uh, John Pete's question first about, given the fact that Brexit was about taking back control of borders and certainly free movement um, has stopped, um, how is it that there isn't the same backlash given that the numbers for coming into the UK last year were 700 odd thousand and it looks like the new data which came out shortly will show possibly even more? Well, I, I guess it's, it's very much the, the point of the story I was, I was trying to say and it's what extent uh, the, the taking back control was articulated. It's not just about a wall, a separation, but it's about changing the population, change, changing the relationship with the migrants and the foreign. And this is actually where also, uh, I mean, we can discuss more about this, it, it's the relation to this shift in the public attitude to migration is interesting. Um, and it can also link up, and this is where the historical work, historical sociology, going back also to understand how previous experience of shifting the status of people in, in this country, which is it's not the first time that happened, uh, are useful. It, it, and the point about docility. No, we like specific kind of migrants. We like the migrant workers which basically work and don't create problems. They don't make claims. And the problem was with the nationals, which were not migrants, but they were citizen, new citizen. What does it, one of the way of arguing this transition is also before with this change of the population it create basically a much more clear social structure of the position of the migrant in society. You are there to serve our needs. That's full stop, I'm happy with it. And that's a echo which go back to a lot of what is called the coloniality of migration and things like that. Okay. But there is a, I, mean, I just, want to just push back on that because of course there are a large number of Ukrainians um, who've been ad admitted, what, 200 odd thousand, uh, the Hong Kong citizens, you know, and they don't fall into the good migrant category for working. Don't they? I mean, uh, well, let's see. The, the Hong Kongers, there are clearly, I mean, you can trace back the generosity to want the Hong Kongers to the relationship with Hong Kong, the historical relation and why we are giving them the status. That would be clear. With the Ukrainians, is it interesting? Because I, I, the way that I look at this is very much in just a position with what we call the criminalization of asylum. The extent to which being generous to a small group has become a way of legitimize how everyone else is bad. Or one, and if you look at the so-called humanitarian visa towards the Ukraine, it's actually less generous than the government like to portray it in many ways. In particular, the key point is 
One is very much used to legitimize a moral high ground argument. Going back to the origin of the refugee regime, you know, we were the good one against the Soviet Union with their, their refugees. And so this is a way you have to understand this more broader sort of picture of where you locate our generosity also as a geopolitical tool. But also the fact that there is a clear problem and issues with the long-term um, future of the Ukrainians, which at the moment they live in a huge uncertainty in terms of to understand what's going to happen next. To, there is a sense that changing the political balance or shifting the government, everyone is going to be sent out without really an appreciation of how as a family and the children that grow up here, they may want to s establish themselves. At the moment, there is no really a clear route to settlement, for example. It's very much linked to the, the unfolding of the war and the conflict. That's true, but on the other hand, government has given quite, local authorities quite a lot of money to help Ukrainians, which ha hasn't been given to help those who've got asylum. Sake. So there is this, I think you're right, this patchwork. The, 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 the patchwork, and, and the, can I just add one thing about this idea of the, the point about the governance element. Uh, a lot of explanation about the asylum backlog tend to point out about this dysfunctionality of the Home Office. I, I think it's an explanation never fully believed in it. And this is where uh, it's important also to think about what specific choices produce in terms of societal level. You know, what does it mean to create all these schemes? What are the effects they produce in terms of the uncertainty, rights, solidarity, and things like that? Which I think that where social science may have a space to, to play. And can, just while we're on the subject of numbers, um, there are various questions about um, students. Is the explanation for um, the significant high numbers of um, uh, migrants that are coming to the UK because of students? Is they, are they being attracted by the graduate visa? Uh, and then what happens if that gets turned off? And relatedly, we're on the subject of students. Um, is maybe this is for um, Charlotte? There's a decline in EU students in the UK a concern. Ian, do you want to do the first part of that question about numbers yeah. and, and students and the graduate visa? Yeah, I, um, numbers will definitely decline if the graduate visa goes or is in any way tightened um, for messaging purposes as much as anything that's definitely a draw. The, the other thing is I think you've got to give credit to the Foreign Office for the marketing that they have done in India, in China and so on. They, that, they've sold the UK and sold the scheme. Uh, and it's an internationally competitive market, so it's, it's a combination of factors. Okay, thank you. And effect on universities of the loss of EU students? Yeah, um, the short answer is yes, it is a concern. Um, I think it affects the educational culture, it affects the environment. Um, having a reduced um, amount of European diversity, albeit, as we've seen, uh, there is still a, s a substantial cohort of international students. Um, but not having that engagement with, uh, with students who are amongst our closest political neighbours, um, I think is, is problematic, it's detrimental. Um, it's also detrimental to the study of EU law and politics. Um, and we're also seeing a decline in uh, applications from members of staff coming from the EU as well, which again reduces the, uh, the expertise that's available. Um, I mean, I, th I, th I think in short, the, the answer is yes. I just noticed another question. If I could, can I answer the other question on Slido um, about what's happening in other member states or in member states of the EU? Um, do UK nationals face these similar problems and are the UK government helping? Well, part of the problem is that, of course, as far as the UK nationals in the EU are concerned, you're dealing with a patchwork of 27 member states, all the, the complexity that I described there, the fr points of friction multiplied, you know, an order of magnitude greater because each one has their own ways of dealing with it, with implementing. Some of them have a constitutive process like the EU settlement scheme. Some of them have a declaratory process, which means that the uh, UK nationals aren't expected to apply for a new um, for a new status, but they will then face other difficulties when they're trying to demonstrate that they are exercising withdrawal agreement Can you rights. Explain what constitutive status means. Of course, sorry. Uh, so constitutive uh, meaning that uh, people had to apply for a new status, and having possession of that status is what gives them the withdrawal agreement rights. If you have a declaratory scheme, then basically, if you meet the criteria 
in the withdrawal agreement, you have those rights. It doesn't matter whether or not you've got the certificate. Constitutive scheme, you have to have the certificate, which is what the case is in the UK. Although, of course, it's not a physical certificate, it's a digital one. Um, and when it comes to actually finding out what's going on and how UK nationals are falling through the gaps, um, the EU Commission is meant to be the enforcer of the withdrawal agreement in the member states. And so has the, the powers, has the interest, has the incentive to try and make sure it's being implemented properly and uniformly. However, when I've been in conversation with people working in the Commission, there is a distinct lack of interest, shall we say, um, the feeling that that's not really their purview because there exists under the withdrawal agreement this joint committee, the specialised committee on citizens' rights, which is supposed to represent the UK and the EU. And so when I've suggested the Commission might want to commission some research into how UK nationals are experiencing the withdrawal agreement, how it's being implemented, the answer is, well, no, the committee deals with that. Now, the problem, if you step back from that, is the committee is a little bit, it's a bit of a black box, it's a bit of a closed committee. So as far as the UK is concerned, there's no way for individuals, for citizens, for most organisations to actually find out what's being discussed, to make their representations. As far as we know, members of the committee are turning up and just saying, yeah, we're doing everything right. And no, the, the, there's very little opportunity for, uh, for dispute or for for the evidence to be presented. Informally, the three million has been being invited to those, uh, to those meetings, but that's a very informal and I would argue unsatisfactory arrangement. So saying that the committee will sort it is problematic when we don't know what the committee's doing, we don't know what they're saying. And as far as I can tell, there isn't any uh, concerted effort to make sure that the withdrawal agreement is being properly implemented in member states. And uh, as far as what the UK government is doing, I'm not aware of that being very much. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? The um, Independent Monitoring Authority, the IMA, which is, was always seen as a sort of commission in the UK, has actually been really flexing some of its muscles. And of course, the, the, the case, the major case on um, whether you're required to upgrade from uh, pre-settled status to settled status. The IMA brought judicial review, challenged it, and, and won. Do you want to just say anything about your experiences of working with the IMA? Um, I, I should say from the outset that, that the Three Million and, and the European Commission actually both intervened in that judicial review. Um, and um, I, I think it, it was the, the way in which the, the IMA um, as you say, showed that it was able to flex its muscles in actually bringing that court case. What we're finding very frustrating at, at the moment is the length of time the government has taken to put in place um, a plan of action for implementing the outcome of that judicial review. Um, is it worth me explaining a little bit about the, what, what the case was? Basically, the, the IMA took the, the government to court um, on a number of bases, basically to argue that the EU settlement scheme was unlawful and not in um, keeping with what was required of it by the withdrawal agreement. Um, one of the things that was looked at was the, the potential problem that people might find themselves in if they didn't apply at the end of their period of pre-settled status for settled status. So the way the settlement scheme was set up, there was a risk that people would fall off a cliff if they didn't make that later application, and they might then find themselves in the UK without any leave to remain, which was not allowed under the withdrawal agreement. And so the, the court found in, um, against the Home Office, uh, against the government, sorry, um, and, and the government didn't appeal, um, but that was in December last year. In January this year, they announced that they, were going to, to, they, they weren't going to pursue it through to a higher appeal. And yet we're still seeing, um, there's still a huge amount of uncertainty about how the, the, um, the judgment is going to be implemented. The government has said one of the things they're going to do, and, they, and it started now, they've started doing this, is extending people's pre-settled status by a period of a further two years to prevent that sort of cliff edge from, um, from presenting real issues. Um, but we've, at the Three Million, heard several instances of people who have faced real difficulties because of that, um, that 
matter of simply kicking, this is the phrase that everybody, everybody in this sector uses in relation to this particular thing, but it's just kicking the can down the road, it's just delaying the problem by, by a further two years. What's going to happen to those people then? And also, um, a, a further problem that arises for people out of that is that um, when they go onto their, their, the computer and try to get proof of their digital immigration status, the expiry date still shows at the moment. And so if somebody's applying for a job or a permanent position, a prospective employer is going to see an expiry date. And I know that the, the Home Office has said that there's, there's messaging on that and that there's um, communication that's been put out there for, employment, uh, for employers and so on. In, in our view, it's, it's not enough. There's a real issue here, and, and there are other issues to do with the, the implementation of that judgment as well that remain unresolved. And of course, while they've got pre-settled status only, they're, they're caught in the issues that Charlotte's been, talk, been talking about, that they have to work harder in order to be able to claim benefits. Um, Heather Ralph has asked a rather interesting question um, about another body, um, and as academics, of course, we love our... Our bodies. This is a migration advisory committee. Um, she puts it more tactfully than I've put it, but are they, are they doing a good job? She says, um, are they doing enough to bring research evidence to migration policy? Any thoughts? Anyone want to volunteer on that? I, I, will, I will say, um, I, I think they are. Well, you, you, you would all know better than I do if they're doing enough to bring your research into it, but I think the MAC. I think they are truly independent. I think the last few reports where they've gone against government policy on, for instance, asylum seekers' right to work is quite, is really good. I think that it's also not easy. It's not easy for an independent body, however independent you are, to publicly state that government has policy wrong. Um, and I, I think they are, the work that they, the work that they produce is always well evidenced. It's always re easy to understand. It's always very logical. And, and I, I believe in their independence. There was a period of time when I felt that they were, they must have felt slightly pointless because the questions they were being asked by government were so, so narrow that they could only ever come out with an answer that supported government policy. I feel like they've moved on a little bit um, from that. And um, yeah, I, I'll speak to Heather about it later to see what I'm missing, um, <laughs> but yeah. Thank you. Anyone else got anything else I'd like to say? Now, Anonymous has, uh, I don't know if it's one Anonymous or various, has submitted a number of questions. But um, the, the question that was one of them that uh, Anonymous raised was, why is it so difficult to deport those um, who um, have got no right to stay? Um, so. It I mean, in terms of, in case of breach of immigration legislation and rules, uh, that we talk about forced removal, and, uh, and it's difficult because in order to do it, you have to have a relationship with the country that has going to receive them. And as a result of leaving the European Union, um, those agreements that were in place as part of being part of the bloc, they're no longer there. And so the country faces itself to have to reestablish this set of, of uh, of, uh, of agreement. And, and one of the interesting cases, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of news, is the Albania one. Not, and this is where we bring in the global, uh, global Britain angle, because it's quite interesting the extent to which the, the, the government has been, uh, you know, uh, very keen to establish a relationship with, with Albania to promote sort of the removal of people, etc. Then Italy comes in and they sign an agreement uh, in, uh, in a few weeks. And that has been seen as a kind of also a way of mapping the different leverage. I mean, Italy acts. As part of the European Union, although the European Union has distanced itself, in a sense, has got different leverage in relation also for historical reasons with Albania. The, the point is very difficult, and you have to put, think you have, there are trade-off links to sign this bilateral agreement you put on the table. You know, the, when we talk about the Rwanda plan, for example, just to give an example, people that work in migration field only focus on uh, you know, the creation of this mechanism for the removal of people to Rwanda to deal with the asylum case. In reality, if you look at the terms of, uh, of the reference of the deal, it included a lot of things from a lot of the development, money coming in, cooperation, collaboration, the being part of the Commonwealth, etc. So there is this sort of sense of what you need capacity to sign this agreement, and that's it's become more difficult than in the past, I would say. Does anyone else want to say anything about deportation? I, I was going to say, so deportation was one of my policies 2006-2007. It's very it, it, it's actually easy to deport a person, or rather remove a person, where they have no right to stay. The difficult thing is 
being certain that they have no right to stay um, for um, Article 8 rights in particular, but also asylum, etc. Uh, and then, as Nando says, making sure that there's somewhere to send them, essentially. But it, that's it. You've got to, if you can prove someone's got no right to stay, put them on a plane, but it's really hard to prove it. And, and quite rightly, for frictional injustice reasons. Well, thank you very much indeed. Our time has come to a close. Does anyone else want to say anything before I wrap up? <coughs> well, in which case, can I thank you all very warmly for your fantastic uh, contributions and thank you for your questions.
to talk to us about the Northern Ireland economy, where he's actually got some data, which is very good for all of us who are constantly frustrated by people saying, you know, we can't break out Northern Ireland, it's too small, it doesn't show up in UK data. So it's really, really interesting question of what consequence of the special regimes for Northern Ireland have are having. And then we're going to turn to Professor David Finnamore from Queen's University Belfast, and David, you all know, is doing a uh, big research on what's called multi-level governance, but also repeatedly does these taking the temperature surveys and will tell us actually what people in Northern Ireland think about what is going on. So those are our two presenters, and they can take a minute or two longer than their uh, very short allocated time because <laughs> you're all back so early. And then we're going to have a but discussion. That gives us more time, Jill. <laughs> Then we're going to have a discussion, and we've got two very excellent discussants. On my immediate left is Professor Mary Murphy from the University of Cork, and on my far left is uh, David Sterling, uh, who is the former head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. But one of the most interesting features of the Brexit process, I think, is various uh, civil servants, once they leave government, finding their voice. And David is a very notable and informed contributor to that debate. So we're absolutely delighted to have everybody. We're going to kick off. And if we manage to gain a few more minutes for lunch, we will do that. But actually, I think on Northern Ireland, we will manage to expand to fill the space available. If you want to ask questions, we are again slidoing. Uh, and I do recommend connecting to the Wi-Fi, because otherwise you just get told you can't get in, uh, which was frustrating me earlier. Uh, I know that lots of people called anonymous are watching. But if you would like to tell us your name, there will be no repercussions unless you're a serving civil servant and want to ask something, in which case, do stick behind the anonymous wall. So without further ado, we're going to kick off with a presentation from Michael. Michael, tell us about the Northern Irish economy. Thank you. Um, so what I want to do is give you a flavour of the project that we've been working on, what the issues are, and some of the results. Um, let me switch to my first slide. Okay. So... Following the referendum, and even since we've had the Windsor framework, this entire period has been characterised by a degree of uncertainty for what the conditions would be like for Northern Ireland um, and for firms in Northern Ireland. Let alone, you know, you can also think about um, for the UK more widely as well. And indeed, in much of the debate about Brexit, post-referendum, before the withdrawal, and even since the withdrawal and so on, there's been a lot of talk... Um, at least amongst economists, but not just, about the impact of uncertainty on economic outcomes, how that might change what firms do, how they do it, and so on. And another issue that has been talked about is the fact that we, the UK, or GB, as opposed to NR, is no longer in the EU single market, and therefore there are now regulatory barriers to trade, whatever these regulatory barriers to trade are, and that this may impact on what firms do. So what this project was a large part of what this project was about, is about, because it's ongoing, was to think about what might be the impact on Northern Irish firms, where they sell to, where they buy from, possibly as a result of that uncertainty, and possibly as a result of regulatory barriers to trade. So, as I say in that bullet point, the aim is to think about firms in Northern Ireland, and we've got detailed firm-level data from a survey that um, the Department of Economy in Northern Ireland undertake. And I should say, in picking up on some of what was discussed in the very first session by Stian and so on about impact and so on, uh, impact is a nebulous term. It's hard to know whether one has impact or not. But one of the pleasures for us, and I think possibly successes of this project, is we've also been working very closely and have very close engagement with the Department of Economy in Northern Ireland, who have been very interested in our work on an ongoing basis, and we interact with them fairly frequently on this. And as I said earlier, we're also specifically interested in the possible role of regulatory barriers to trade. And what we did was to develop an index of regulatory intensity. I'll say a little bit more about that. And then we, at the moment, I'm going to say a little bit about how we apply this index and our work on thinking about the sales and purchases of Northern Irish firms, and also kind of slightly trying to validate this index by thinking more broadly, so nothing to do with Northern Ireland per se, but what's the role of regulatory barriers to trade between the EU and its partner countries. So remember that a key 
principle of a single market is the mutual recognition of goods and services. So once you place a good lawfully on one market, you can sell it in any other EU market. Leaving the EU meant that is no longer the case for GB, but still does apply to NI, because Northern Ireland is still in the single market for goods. And when thinking about regulatory barriers, again, an argument that was made prior to actual withdrawal was, look, the day before we've left the EU, we produced the EU standards. So we're producing these standards. Why would it make any difference the day after we leave the EU? And the reason is that you now have to prove that you produced those standards. So GB firms now have to prove that they conform to those standards. And that's potentially a barrier which does not apply to Northern Ireland. So in particular, since the Northern Ireland Protocol and its renegotiation uh, in the form of the Windsor Framework, one of the issues that really interests, I think, um, certainly the Department of the Economy in Northern Ireland, but more broadly stakeholders, is this notion that dual, relative dual market access for Northern Ireland may be beneficial. In other words, that Northern Irish firms have relatively better access to the EU market than do UK firms. They have relatively better access to the UK market than do EU firms, and this might yield future benefits. Now, unfortunately, that's not something that we're going to be able to look at here, but it, isn't, it underlies the possible importance of those regulatory barriers. I'll ignore that slide. Um, just a few, uh, just one visual image here which gives you for three different periods. So what we're going to look at, what we are looking at, is the impact on firms in Northern Ireland, both since the referendum and prior to withdrawal, and since withdrawal. And then on the very left-hand side, you've got where it, we've got the sort of the chart for pre-Brexit, pre pre-referendum. And what these charts give you is where do Northern Irish firms buy from? What are the share of purchases from different markets? Two things I want to point out from this slide. The first is, look at the domin dominance of domestic, what I would call domestic purchases. In other words, a high proportion of what firms buy in Northern Ireland is from within Northern Ireland, followed by the importance of GB suppliers to Northern Irish firms. The share of the EU in purchases is barely 11-12%. So that's number one. The second thing is, there is some change here, post-Brexit and post-withdrawal, where there seems to be in these charts a big increase in purchases domestically from within Northern Ireland. Now, one of the interesting things that we find is when we test this out st statistically using fancy, fancy techniques and so on, that proves not to be significant, that increase in Northern Irish firms. And that just a sort of a, uh, a, a leads me to a general statement, which is when looking at impact of changes in policy, such as Brexit on outcomes, you have to be very careful just looking at descriptive statistics. You do kind of need more formal tools of analysis as well. So when we look at the impact of Brexit, and here I'm including, although I will separate out between both the post-referendum period and the post-withdrawal period, we largely find not much impact on the sales of Northern Irish firms. There's not much evidence that where they sell to has been impacted much by Brexit, both before and after actual withdrawal, but there is more evidence of an impact on purchases. So there is evidence post-referendum and post-withdrawal that Northern Irish purchases shift away, largely away from buying from the rest of the UK, from GB, the evidence on Ireland is a little bit mixed, so I need to be a little bit careful there. And in turn, what Northern Irish firms seem to be doing more is purchasing more from other EU countries, i.e. other than the Republic of Ireland, and from the rest of the world. That's kind of an aggregate, but obviously what's actually going on is you've got to unpick this at the sectoral level, and we're starting to do this more and more now, so the results are much more nuanced. So, for example, you see that purchases of computer, electronics, electrical equipment, and transport equipment, those are largely the sectors that Northern Irish firms, this is not consumers, this is firms, are buying less from, from GB. 
we also tend to find bigger effects for retail and wholesale as opposed to manufacturing. We can separate out the two because we have the data on this. And once again, we find that post-withdrawal purchases from Britain declined, whereas they increased from uh, the other uh, part uh, destinations, if you like. Back to regulatory intensity. Very nicely, the annex to the Northern Ireland Protocol listed all the regulations that the EU considered were fundamental to membership of the single market. So we've been through every single one of these, used advanced text processing and bits of machine learning to build, and I could talk about this for a long time, but I won't, indices of regulatory intensity. What this chart gives you simply is each of these bars is a sector, and on the very left you've got FBT, which is food, beverages and tobacco in blue, and the minerals and chemicals and so on. And it tells you, in those sectors, how many regulations apply. This means, how many regulations are there which impose an obligation on firms? That firms have to do something in order to sell into the EU market. And the message from this is that it varies a lot across industries, and in some cases there are lots of regulations, and perhaps not surprisingly, these are highest in food, beverages and tobacco, but also in advanced electronics at the very end there. Do we find any evidence that regulatory intensity has impacted on Northern Irish firms' purchases or sales? Actually, very, very little. So the impact, what we'd like, not we'd like, what we want to explore is whether the impact is bigger in more regulated sectors. In other words, was there more worry, more uncertainty about Northern Ireland possibly not being in the single market, therefore facing those barriers, therefore the impact on trade being larger? There is very little evidence on that. What we do find, however, and this goes back a little bit to the Windsor framework, for those of you that are familiar with the Windsor framework, in terms of shipping goods from Britain to Northern Ireland, it distinguished between the red lane and the green lane, and one of the main Distinguishing features of that is that intermediate goods, by and large, have to go through the red lane, therefore face higher bureaucratic obstacles to shipping to Northern Ireland. Remember earlier that in that chart I showed you that a very high share of NI purchases is from GB. So one of the evidences, one of the things that we're finding is firms that buy a lot from GB and export a lot to the EU and Republic of Ireland, their sales to the rest of the EU or to the Republic of Ireland have been negatively impacted more in the more regulatory intensive sectors. So regulations do appear to matter. And this is something we need to explore now in more detail, looking more specifically at the sectors and the types of firms. The other bit of work that we were doing, have been doing, is thinking about what about EU imports in general and regulatory intensity. And the main findings are that if you look at the number of regulations, how many regulations apply at the very detailed level, and we have this at an incredibly detailed level. For those of you that are trade nerds like myself, we have this at the HS six digit level. So what that means is for over 5,000 products, basically. So we have this regulatory intensity for a very, very large number of products. We find that as the number of regulations goes up, both imports from EU and non-EU countries tends to go down, so regulations do appear to matter. We can then unpick our index into different components, in particular thinking about the role of standards and conformity. And there we find that actually changes in an increased regulatory intensity with regard to more standards or more conformity assessment procedures leads to more trade with the EU, in particular for high-income countries. And that illustrates a very, very important point, which one of my colleagues always likes to point out to me, and he's quite right to, which is standards, regulations, are not necessarily a barrier. They might be, because they impose an obligation on firms. Things that firms have to do, therefore, potentially increases their costs. But if you can produce to that standard, and you can prove that you can produce to that standard, then you have access to that market. So it might actually facilitate trade. And actually we're finding that for, we get some positive effects for high income countries in higher tech products. So I will stop there because that kind of 
more or less where we've got to for now. A couple of caveats, and then I really will stop, Jill. A couple of caveats. One is that at the moment, we only have data up until the end of 2021. So we've only got one year's worth of post-withdrawal data, which is a shame. We will get more data December, January, so we'll be able to do another year's worth of analysis. But remember that year, not only was it a Brexit year, but also was a COVID year. And therefore, you know, we have to treat our results with a degree of caution. Where we want to take this work forward now is to think much more about the types of firms that might be affected, for example, by size or by productivity differences, and think much more carefully about which industries may have been affected more. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. I just, I just wanted to ask you a couple of, couple of quick clarifying questions. Um, I mean, it's obviously a very intriguing result about the sort of, you know, EU um, uh, relative increase in shares. Is that, is that a sort of volume effect, or is it, it's not just that the cost of importing things in the EU went up and therefore it looks as though we've got no, more. It's genuinely a volume effect. Okay, so it's really different. So when David Frost said he wanted to tear up the Northern Ireland Protocol <laughs> because of mass diversion of trade, north-south um, rather than east-west, your figures suggest that that was not well founded in the evidence? Uh, yeah, at the moment, that is what our figures would suggest. There hasn't been any mass diversion of yeah. trade. There's been some increase in purchases yeah. from Ireland relative to Britain, but not a lot. And the third one I just wanted to ask as someone who used to do better regulation in government for my sins. Um, are numbers of regulations a reasonable proxy for burden of those regulations? Because obviously you can have a sort of, you know, one regulation which imposes very big burdens on a business and lots of annoying, bitty regulations you have to get round, but actually each one is pretty trivial. So is it a reasonable proxy as far as you can see? It's a great question and you're absolutely right. You know, you could have an industry that faces 50 tiny little regulations yeah. that are not particularly much yeah. of a burden and in this place is one regulation yeah. that really matters. That's kind of why we're doing that second bit of analysis to think about not just the NIGB EU relationship, more broadly EU, non-EU, to try and kind of validate, do the results that we get seem to make sense by industry and by part of the country? But you're right that the, the measure that we're using is imperfect, certainly, but also just to add to that, that's also why we've broken out our measure into whether there are standards that need to be met, whether there's conformity assessment required, and what the testing for conformity assessment involves, compliance, sort of supervision and so on. And we do this by looking at every single regulation and identifying the key words and counting those key words, essentially. So we do try and unpick those issues, but it's a great question. OK, great. Well, that was really, really interesting and some, I think, slightly counterintuitive effects that we will ask David uh, to comment on in a second. But before that, we're going to hear from David Finnamore about uh, how this is playing out in Northern Ireland. So, David Finnamore. Okay, thanks very much, Jill. Um, thanks for the invitation to come along. Um, I'm going to talk about this project which we have at Queen's, um, which we abbreviated to Post-Brexit Governance NI, um, essentially because we had an exceedingly long title to start with. But I will um, read out the title to you, to you because it was Governance for a Place Between Multi-Level Dynamics of Implementing the Protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland. Um, there's a lot in there. Um, I think one of the first challenges we had was that we were soon faced with essentially the non-implementation of the protocol, um, and that did begin to shape some of the work that we were doing and the different salience of different aspects of it. Um, but our starting point always was you've got a really unique set of post-Brexit arrangements for a very unique, very particular part of the UK, um, and there were a, a multi multiple challenges that, this, that these, these arrangements were going to throw up, and that's before the contestation and the over politicization of a lot of what was going on in the withdrawal agreement and the protocol in particular. Um, what, we've, what we did with the project is we've drawn together colleagues from politics, law and um, sociology. Um, you'll be aware of at least one of my colleagues, Katie Hayward, doing a lot of work with UK and Changing Europe in the past. Um, and we wanted to look at multiple aspects of these, these arrangements. So looking at the uniqueness of the trading arrangements, which Michael's outlined there, looking at the particularities of the various governance arrangements and the very unique institutional structures that have been created to manage the implementation of, of the protocol, um, and look at how they might evolve over time, 
and they probably evolved more over time than we anticipated, partly because of the Windsor framework, which brought us into looking at other areas which we weren't necessarily looking at, considering before, issues around the storm and break, um, but also looking at some of the interesting um, governance arrangements around the, the democratic consent, which I'll come to later. Um, we wanted to look at the unique arrangements for regulatory um, um, uh, alignment, um, which are, in EU external relations terms, unprecedented because there's automatic dynamic regulatory alignment for uh, uh, changes and replacements to protocol applicable law. But what we also wanted to do was get a sense as to how the arrangements were being um, experienced um, on the ground in Northern Ireland. And this comes back to a point that was made earlier, I think, by Dan, that a lot of public opinion um, uh, surveys don't necessarily include Northern Ireland and certainly not don't give them as much, Northern Ireland as much attention uh, as it might deserve. And so we commissioned a, a number of polls um, on a regular basis throughout the, the course of the, of the project where we were testing the temperature around different aspects of the protocol, different aspects of Brexit, and now more recently, the Windsor framework. And what I want to focus on today is just sh sharing with you some of those, those results and some of the issues that we've picked up and that actually then, then um, allowed those to sort of inform some of our additional um, research. Okay, so the um, polling we've been doing um, has asked a number of questions over time. Um, and at the, at the core of it has been this question as to whether people in Northern Ireland or voters in Northern Ireland think that on balance, the protocol is a good thing. Okay. Um, and we started doing this essentially as soon as the protocol came fully into force in the spring of 2021. And you see here the results that we've had across the polling conducted all the way up until um, last month. Um, the latest report came out, I think, uh, two weeks ago. Um, and what we see there is the way in which views are divided. Um, and that essentially views haven't really shifted dramatically o over time. That you've got there in the green, um, those who either strongly or agree or agree with that um, statement that the protocol on Windsor Framework is on balance a good thing. Um, up to 56% um, at the moment. It was down at 43%, so there has been a shift, shift there. Um, but then equally, there's quite solid levels of uh, support for the opposite view, that okay, people disagree or strongly disagree with the, with, with the proposition that the protocol of Windsor Framework is on balance a good thing. Um, what we're interested to see is, okay, where do we see the shifts? Okay, two essential shifts here. One in the autumn of 2021, um, and all we can seem to put that down to at the moment is the fact that in Great Britain, you were experiencing shortages of supplies in supermarkets, and we weren't. <laughs> That's the only event at that time which stands out. Okay, it's nothing to do with the politics. Um, the other key moment is where there's a slight uptick between spring 23 and summer 23 and that's the Windsor framework. But it's by no means dramatic. Okay. Um, um, that said, over time, there's, our argument would be there's been broad acceptance of um, a warming to the, the arrangements, but we've still got quite significant levels of support. In the data, what we also do is um, drill down to look at how those views um, divide according to people's constitutional affiliation, whether they identify as nationalist, whether they identify as unionist, strongly, slightly, but also whether they are neithers, those who do not take a position on the constitutional question. And what we see here is essentially a fundamental division within Northern Ireland according to one's constitutional position. If you are a nationalist in green at the top there, you are overwhelmingly likely to support the protocol wins a framework. If, however, you identify as unionist, particularly a strong unionist, you have very, very low levels of support for that um, proposition that the, the protocol Windsor framework is on balance a good thing. And what's interesting is they barely change over time. Okay. Um, if you're identified as slightly unionist, um, then you're more like, slightly more likely than, than strong unionists to disagree Sorry, slightly more likely, less likely to disagree with the proposition that it's on balance a good thing. But there's only about a quarter of people um, who identify as uh, slightly unionist over most of the time um, supporting the, 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 the protocol. However, we do see a slight shift with the Windsor framework. As the Windsor framework has brought about some movement in opinions here, and you see that um, particularly amongst those who identify as, as slight unionists. Okay. 
Um, now, in some respects, we shouldn't be surprised by these results, um, given that the way in which the protocol avoids that hardening, at least the physical hardening, of the border on the island of Ireland. But at the same time, because of the nature of the trade and cooperation agreement really um, places an Irish Sea border in the Irish Sea and therefore can prove to be disruptive for the GBNI movements of, 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 of goods. Okay. Um, what this is also important, um, the findings here, because it really does help us explain why we've got the absence of an executive, um, essentially because of the very strong position there, or strong opposition to the protocol, which comes through on the part of strong, strong unionists, and essentially the support base for um, the DUP. And while that's, there's been a slight improvement um, since the Windsor framework, there's not been that significant movement, which the UK government was certainly hoping to see, such that you'd lead to the DUP returning into the, the executive. Okay. Um, what we've also been tracking, um, and this is, is the views of people regarding democratic consent. Um, for those of you not familiar with the protocol, essentially the arrangements which are in place are due to be put to the members of the Northern Ireland Assembly, irrespective of whether they are sitting or not, in December, November, December next year, um, for, to go through a process of democratic consent. In other words, MLAs, if they vote, will have to give positive endorsement of the core provisions of the protocol for those to continue to apply. If they don't give their endorsement, then the arrangements in the protocol fall at the end of 2026. And essentially, we go back to 2017 and ask ourselves the question, what do we do about the land border on the island of Ireland? So, it's a big issue, big question. Um, what's been interesting over time is that when we've asked people how do they want their MLAs to vote, um, initially, almost equal numbers saying that they wanted them to um, vote in favour of continued application, as those who wanted to vote um, against continued application. We then get, from October 2021, this interesting 10 percentage point gap emerging and remaining essentially consistent over time. Then we get the Windsor framework, and you see attitudes shifting quite significantly there, and this 29 percentage point gap opens up. Um, we then got the polling that we did in June, and we see a narrowing partly a reflection of the way in which society was coming to terms with the detail of the Windsor framework and possibly pushing back on some of the overselling of elements of it um, by the, at the time that it, it was adopted. The most recent polling, however, indicates that that gap of 22 percentage points has remained steady. What we've seen is a slight uptick in those people who aren't necessarily, have, have no preference or no interest in how people are going to vote. Now, on the one hand, this is positive if one wants to see a continuation of the protocol arrangements, because it was likely to see a simple majority in the Assembly. But that simple <coughs> majority means that the Assembly will come back in four years' time afterwards to vote again. The ideal for advocates of, of the protocol would be for a cross-community <coughs> vote. Uh, we have essentially a majority of nationalists and unionists, but the, given the split of the vote at the moment, that's exceptionally unlikely to happen, um, although who knows what will happen before, between now and then. Okay, there's plenty of other things I could say on the basis of the data we've gathered, but I'll finish with this one, um, which I think helps explain one of the big challenges we've got ahead in terms of uh, managing the, the protocol Windsor framework, levels of trust. Okay. Um, when we've run this across nine polls, and these are broadly in line, they haven't changed that much. Okay. It's the figure on the left-hand side which is the worrying one. Okay. Now, when we spoke to UK officials recently on this latest finding, findings, we were able to tell them that the trust in the UK government on this particular question had increased by 75%, but only up to 7%. <laughs> okay. Um, the problem there is within Northern Ireland society, across the political spectrum, levels of distrust in the UK government are exceptionally high. Okay. Um, Irish government and the EU, broadly equal. Um, tend to be trusted by nationalists, distrusted by unionists. So you can see that, that societal split coming through. Political parties tend not to trust each other um, at all. Um, but what's interesting here, and this feeds into one of the institutional developments under the protocol, which we're now following, is the very strong level of um, trust placed in Northern Ireland business representatives. Um, it's 59% in this poll. It's been up to 60%. Okay. What's been interesting in the way in which the UK and the EU have sought about trying to facilitate the implementation is engaging far more with stakeholders in the process. It's 
partly because we don't have the assembly as well in, in place, because they are seen to be trusted in, the, um, in managing the interests of Northern Ireland in this process, um, moving it beyond this, uh, the, the politics of the protocol to actually far more approach to sort of solving the problems um, through um, sort of informed um, evidence rather than, than politics. But anyway, happy to take questions on that. Um, Brilliant. Thank you very much, David. Um, just while you're I can't resist it because I've got David Sterling here. Who trusts the Northern Ireland Civil Service? Do you know? Because they're at 35%, which is not quite up there with the business community, but it's not bad, relatively. Is it? Are they trusted by one community and not the others, uh, or is it cross-community support for the Northern Ireland Civil I Service? I think it's a mi mixture of cross-community trust and distrust. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Well done, David, I suppose. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Okay, we're going to have, uh, have some reactions from things. Uh, please do post questions. Please do upvote questions you like. Um, if there's one that's almost the question you've asked, it's not clearly as good as your question, but uh, it means it gets to the top of the pile rather than have fragmentation of questions, which we want to avoid. David, um, Michael painted a picture from sort of early data on the Northern Ireland economy as somebody uh, who is actually living there uh, do you think people sort of recognise that picture now? Does it feel like Northern Ireland, you know, maybe not too much effect from all these new trading arrangements, not a massive upside, not a massive downside? Uh, no, I, I think that's probably fair. You know, the new winter framework arrangements, many of them kicked in on the 1st yeah. of October, and some people were predicting chaos, and it didn't happen, so I think that's been a positive. But the, the Northern Ireland economy is a bit of an enigma. So on the one hand, uh, we have unemployment at 2.1%. It's never been lower. Yeah. But we have economic inactivity. That's people who are of working age but not in work is the highest level in the UK and has been so for a generation or more. Uh, Northern Ireland over the last 10 or 15 years has had the highest foreign direct investment outside London and the Southeast. Yeah. <clears throat> but at the same time, for a generation or more, we have the lowest productivity in the UK. So it's as if there is one part of the economy is doing very well, which tends to be, and I'm simplifying here, generalizing, um, that bit of the economy that is foreign owned firms, mm. largely North American, doing very well, doing very well because they like the people, the skills that we have there. Uh, but to say we have um, got major problems um, elsewhere in the economy. Now, this is where, for me, the Windsor framework is interesting because <clears throat> the Windsor framework doesn't apply to services. And it's the service sector of our economy that is doing very well. We have got pockets of very successful advanced manufacturing, but it's still a relatively small sector of our economy. But it's advanced manufacturing, uh, manufacturing generally, where I think the opportunity lies. And this is, for me, is where politics and economics collide because um, it's interesting that unionists are against the protocol and nationalists are sort of for it. And yet, I think unionists perhaps need to rethink their approach here because the Windsor Framework provides an opportunity to boost the economy and would give us something which they could argue you wouldn't get if you were in a united Ireland. So, you know, I'll, I'll pause there on that but, thought. But if the boost is to services, something is going on that isn't the Windsor framework, because as you were just saying, and Michael, I don't know whether you... I think, sorry, yeah. sorry uh, uh, services have been doing well for a time, and I don't actually think Brexit and the Windsor framework have made a huge difference to services. I don't know if Michael would agree with that. I would agree with that. I mean, we haven't... We don't have the data to explicitly look at sales and purchase of yeah. services. We do have service firms in our data, but we only know the goods that they buy, not the services that they buy and sell. But what you say resonates with what I've heard and from discussions I've had. And I, don't, I would not expect services to have been impacted in the same way as goods, because precisely it is on goods trade, yeah. in particular between GB and NI, that certain frictions, to use an earlier term, have been introduced. I mean, I think the, the fear for unionists yeah. always was that um, there would be a divergence, that there would be greater reliance on EU and then particularly on Ireland, mm -hmm. and that this would be like a Trojan horse towards the United Ireland. Um, but I think that again is where um, looking at more imaginatively, you know, you look at the opportunity, see it as an opportunity rather than a threat. 
Mary, come and tell us about where you think the politics are. And I'm very interested in this, you know, why, David's question, why are unionists not embracing this as actually saying there's a big prize for being part of the UK, which, you know, we would lose if we you know, joined with uh, the Republic? Yeah, I think what's especially interesting about Michael's research in particular is the way in which it demonstrates that the worst effects of Brexit for Northern Ireland have been avoided. Because if we reflect back to the 2015, 2016 period, and there wasn't much study done on how Brexit would economically impact on Northern Ireland, but some of the limited work that was done was, was predicting doom and gloom, to say the least. And you know, a suggestion that growth levels would fall, that unemployment would climb, that um, cross-border trade would be interrupted, uh, that a hard border would be reinstated. That's, that, that's all fundamentally challenged by, by the research which, which Michael has conducted. And it also fits um, with work done by the ESRI, the Economic and Social Research Institute in the Republic of Ireland, which also in 2015, 2016, was looking at the impact of Brexit on the Republic of Ireland and making very similar dire predictions about how bad things would be. And the truth is, the protocol and the framework for, for all their, 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 their challenges in and of themselves, they have effectively offset the worst effects of Brexit in, in economic terms. And, and that's critically important, but it is something that doesn't seem to be fully grasped or um, appreciated by the unionist community in particular. So when I see David's work then on public opinion, um, you know, it clearly demonstrates polarisation. But you have to ask your the, yourself the question, where are voters getting their cues from? Is it the kind of evidence-based data that we're exposed to here? Or are they taking their cues from political parties who have you know, pure political motivations, which are fundamentally grounded in issues around the, um, the, constitutional, uh, the constitutional situation? So, um, so, 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 so the research is, is actually quite comforting for unionists. We haven't seen that massive increase in north-south trade. We haven't seen any substantial expansion of the all island economy, which again is something unionists would, be, would feel aggrieved about. Um, what we have seen is Northern Ireland in a pretty positive position, notwithstanding some of the difficulties. We did see actually in early 2021, whenever the protocol was um, agreed, in the very early days, there was some unionist reaction which was positive and then some on the more extreme ends of unionism came down very hard on this. Mm -hmm. Opinion polls shifted and unionist attitude to the protocol shifted very quickly in that direction as well. Because Arlene Foster was dabbling a bit, wasn't she, with she the was. sort of, you know, slightly positive, but then we had the vaccine fiasco yeah. and everybody. Can I so, just... Michael. Yeah. Um, I agree with what Mary was saying, that I think the worst effects have been avoided. That doesn't mean that there haven't been any effects. One has to sort of distinguish between sort of changes to sort of trend growth, so growth might be lower than it was, as opposed to thinking, oh my God, the economy is going to collapse. Um, what the Northern Ireland Protocol has done, what the Windsor Framework has eased to some extent, but it has introduced barriers for NI firms buying from GB. It has increased costs for those firms. Inevitably, it has done so. If you increase firms' costs, you impact either on their profits or on their competitiveness. That's inevitable that there will be those effects. And how big those effects will be is what will take years to work out, and even then it's going to be difficult. On the other side, there are these potential benefits, that, as I described earlier, from this dual market access, which is likely to lead, or could well lead, to higher levels of investment into NI, and then higher growth rates. From time. There are counterbalancing forces here, and sadly, well, not sadly, but it's just complicated. And Michael, I mean, if we're looking forward, so if we were asking these questions in, you know, asking whether it's been a net benefit for Northern Ireland, what would we be looking at in three or four years' time when things have settled down? Maybe you know, we've had the first consent vote, which looks as though it's going to go to consent. We're heading up for the second consent vote. Um, you know, what, what would you be looking to see, to see whether the, 
if you like, the hypothesis of dual access has been validated? What would be your...? Well, you'd want to see whether there has been either increased sales by NI firms to these two markets relative to some counterfactual, relative maybe to firms from other countries that don't have that, or relative to GB firms. And you'd also want to look at whether there's been any evidence of increased investment, in particular in those sectors where you think that that dual market access benefits are greater. You would expect there to be greater investment or greater increases in trade where those benefits are larger. So it's identifying that by looking at, for example, the regular intensity or the cost of trade barriers and so on in different ways and thinking about do you get a differential impact? And um, Michael, we've got a question, uh, well, I'll ask any of you, um, from Mark English. This is a top voted question. Both Brexiters frost, Lord Frost, and Remainers have characterised Northern Ireland as being in, capital I-N, the EU, EU single market due to the protocol Windsor framework. To what extent are they right? Should we regard Northern Ireland as in, half in, so the, in? The, the, shall I go first? Yeah. So my, my answer is that Northern Ireland is in the single market for goods, but not for services. Yeah, David, really? I, yeah, is that what people would yeah, say I think in it's, Ireland? it's exceptionally, exceptionally misleading to say that Northern Ireland's in the single market. It's in the single market for goods, electricity uh, as well, but it's yes. not in the free mar single market for um, services, free movement of people, capital. Mm. People often say, well, the CT common travel area addresses the free movement of people question, but it only addresses it insofar as it addresses it for UK mm. and Irish nationals. It doesn't cover EU nationals. David, would you say Northern Ireland's in the single market? No, I, I would agree. With both agree. The okay. And the Can I just add Go. one more point to that? Because I think something yeah. not, not, not always appreciated about the Windsor framework and the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is that firms, including GB firms, selling in Northern Ireland, have to adhere, by and large, in almost all sectors, to EU regulations. It's the EU regulations that apply largely in Northern Ireland. Can I flip the question? We also ask. Is Northern Ireland in the UK internal market? Because we also had lots of commitments about unfettered access that was very important for the unionists. We're told that there might be further bolsterings to reassure Northern Ireland about that access to take the political biscuit of trying to get the DUP back into government. I mean, David, do you think that actually Northern Ireland is genuinely in the UK internal market now? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on your perspective. <laughs> as far as the movement of goods from Northern Ireland to GB are concerned, there is virtually no friction at all. Uh, the, the, the situation is as it was prior to 2021. Um, and I think there was always a concern that there might be some friction there. Um, where I think uh, the realisation was slow was that there might be friction the other way from GB to NI. And that is where we have the problems, which you know, Michael has outlined very well. Um, and these problems are both real, um, but they're also uh, political, if you like, and they're emotional. Um, so when I talked about unionists setting their face against the protocol back in 2021, a lot of this was because of a concern that Northern Ireland was now different and that this was the first step on a slippery slope to United Ireland. Um, now, that is one way of looking at it. There would have been other ways of looking at it, but the reality is that is the path that most unionists chose at that time. I think what we're seeing today is an increasing realisation amongst a lot of unions' opinion that whilst they still don't like the protocol, um, the absence of the institutions is damaging to unionism. You know, I would have always argued that unionists need the Assembly and the Executive to work in Northern Ireland more than nationalists do. And I think what we're seeing in the background now is unionists wrestling with how they get out of the corner that they've painted themselves into and get the institutions back up and running without too much political damage to their particular cause. So, Mary and David, I want to come on to how opinions might change. We've got a question here from Dan Wincott, who says, Thanks, Dan, uh, who says support for the protocol Windsor framework among neither seem to have grown. Can you account for the change? What do they think before? Mix of anti-protocol 
and don't know. Anonymous is talking about the low share of people and neutral on the protocol. It's interesting. It suggests Brexit might have been felt a lot more strongly in Northern Ireland than GB. Um, uh, you know, um, then I'm going to come on about alternatives to the Windsor framework. But um, you know, and one or two sort of interesting questions on the substance. But do we see any signs that is there? A, is this just going to be an identity issue that if I'm a strong unionist, I am going to hate this special arrangement and absolutely no bunch of evidence that anyone can come up, even if Michael says Northern Ireland economy is going absolutely gangbusters because of this special status in five years' time, that will never change it. Or is this you know, much more amenable? Because you did see, I think Rishi Sunak was given his eye teeth for that pole shift if it maybe one of his resets over here led to a sort of 10% increase in support. So, you know, is there any change and what's driving changed views? I think one of the things that is interesting, when you ask the question to people, to what extent do you think, so do you think the, the impact of the um, Windsor framework, the protocol is negative, positive in terms of the economy? Mm. Almost two thirds say it's positive. So that goes beyond are 54 percent who, who think that the protocol is on balance a good thing okay so there's some out there um, i think this then points to the fact that a, a significant proportion of the opposition is principled politics it's not based on an economic uh, a, a consideration of the economic benefits or, or, or otherwise. Um, I think this thing comes back to how we possibly explain the rise in the position of the neutrals and some of the slight unionists who come to the, the question of the protocol as on the basis of, of evidence rather than principle of political position. For many nationalists, the protocol is good because it avoids a hard border on the island of Ireland, and if they take the, the unionist narrative, it's a further step towards the United Ireland. For many unionists, okay, the fact that you've got a, an Irish sea border and that you've got difficulties in the availability of goods, so they believe, from GB to, to NI means they must, by principle, be a bad thing. And then that situation has been exacerbated by, exacerbated by the politicisation of the protocol mm. in domestic politics in, in Northern Ireland. Whereas those who identify as neutrals will often say, OK, well, let's have a look at the ev evidence. And I think this is where you see that shift through 2021 and with the Windsor framework. It's in that sort of, f amongst those who are slight unionists, who've become slightly more positive. Um, most of the neutrals already become more positive they had, had a, over time. Mary? Yeah, no, I think that's fair. There, I mean, there will always be a constituency within unionism in Northern Ireland which is opposed to the protocol and the framework because they, 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 they make a very simple calculation about the impact of the protocol and it's not about its economic and trade effects, it's about its political implications. And it's, it, it, they have been unable to disentangle the protocol and its, its economic dimension from the political consequences that they see flowing from um, Northern Ireland being partially within the single market and, and the UK not. So the whole issue of, of identity and politics and constitutional futures is tied up in, the, in questions around the protocol and, and the framework. And um, uh, there, there is that constituency of small U unionists or slight unionists who are open to persuasion and who are open to um, who are open to the kind of evidence-based research that we're talking about, um, and and they do seem to be edging into that centre ground. And Could David, you said they were twenty-five. Are they twenty-five percent of total unionists, not twenty-five percent of the Northern Ireland electorate of slight unionists? You said twenty-five percent. It, 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 the those who identify as a slight unionists, I think, is about sort of fourteen, fifteen percent in this poll. Oh. Of total, total population. Total population. Okay. Can I just want, want, add one point? Because um, I think Mary made the, the, asked the question earlier: Who do people take their cues from? Was well, we, we at one point we did ask: okay, Where do people get their information on the protocol, and where do they who do they who do they who do they trust to provide information? And what we found was: okay, It's essentially the political leaders of those political parties for whom they would consider voting, and so the leadership has a considerable potential here to influence voters. Um, or their supporters. The question there, though, at the moment is that with 80% plus people who identify as strong unionists opposing the protocol, disliking it intensely, what scope is there for Geoffrey Donaldson as the leader, if he goes back into the Assembly, to take some of those voters back to be at least um, accepting of, if not necessarily supportive of, the protocol arrangements? And your trust in business of, is very interesting, David. I mean, you know, we, see, we saw Northern Ireland business almost expand to fill the vacuum when there was no government, the last time there was no government in Northern Ireland, and do that. But they have very high trust levels. Um, 
I imagine quite a proportion sort of business leadership are unionist or identified as unionist. Um, yeah, do they manage, because they're quite pro protocol Windsor framework, uh, they, it, you know, basically, do they manage to gain some support from people who are protocol skeptics? Mm -hmm. I think their messaging all, all throughout this period has been about creating stability and certainty. Yeah. And I think this is one of the reasons why, whereas the Windsor framework may have um, dissatisfied a good number of units because it does not remove the Irish Sea border in its entirety, for business, it brought certainty. You'd remove this sort of period of 18 months of sort of non-implementation, partial implementation, the possibility of, of um, infringement proceedings on, on the EU. And you're moving into a period where there's an agreed way forward and there is a commitment there to a problem-solving approach to issues by the UK and, and the EU government. I think one of the reasons why business has been really prominent and successful is that a lot of the issues which we've had to deal with in terms of the practical implementation of the protocol have not been part of the standard discourse of Northern Ireland politics. And that space was created, opened up, not only because of the absence of the, of the Assembly and the Executive, but also because of the nature of the problems. These are not problems about moving to goods which have historically concerned politicians. And I think, and then business were obviously looking for the stability and certainty. They did mobilize quite effectively. And I think their contributions were facilitated by both the UK and the EU wanting to find ways forward and focusing on a problem solving approach rather than something which was essentially driven by politics and ideology. I've got a this has been one yeah. of the really positive yeah. developments of recent years mm -hmm. was the way in which the business community in Northern Ireland, which didn't always speak with one voice, has done so. And probably because if you go back five or six years, they would have seen this as maybe an existential threat. But they have been a very positive force. Um, and they have been very <coughs> pragmatic in the way in which they have worked behind the scenes uh, with UK government, the EU, the Irish government. Uh, and, and I think there's, there's something there that could be built on more widely. And David, we've got a question here about farmers. Um, Anonymous has asked, is the EU discrediting the eyes of Irish farmers given new policies and directives which are being opposed on them? And John Peets asked a question about whether actually, yeah, we talked about the fact that the UK was obviously totally aligned on day one after Brexit, um, but has talked about the risk of future divergence and whether some sort of SPS agreement, which would probably remove food uh, from your uh, highly regulated problem area in your intensity, whether that would be a way forward. I don't know whether anyone knows whether that's something the unionists would like. David, I mean, where's the Irish farmers now? Because we heard a lot about the need to maintain north-south flows um, as a sort of single biosecurity area and integrated milk market yeah. and things like that. Th this, this is a fascinating aspect of the whole Brexit uh, debate. The agri-food sector in Ireland, north and south, is probably the most integrated part of the economic ecosystem. And you can track the movement of pigs, sheep, cattle, milk, and it crosses the border multiple times in many occasions. Uh, and again, um, the uh, agricultural sector probably had more to lose potentially from leaving Europe because of the huge economic support that, um, that, that farmers got. But yet the evidence, such as it is, suggests that the farming community by and large voted to leave the EU. Um, and, and I think there was a, a, an emotional rather than an economic motivation or stimulus to that, but certainly I've heard quite a lot of, oh, we didn't think this was going to happen to us since then. Um, but uh, again, uh, I think the Windsor framework does offer opportunities for the agri-food sector, quite significant ones. Michael might want to challenge me on that. No, 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 no I agree with you entirely. I just want to make a, a, a few points in, in, in response to your, to your question, Joe. On agriculture specifically, I agree with everything that you said. There is one way in which it might impact, the current arrangements may impact negatively on Northern Irish agriculture. It's precisely about this highly integrated supply chains. And this goes back to that delightful phrase, which we all knew nothing about six years ago, but we now know lots about, which is rules of origin. So when a, an NI milk manufacturer or farmer or whatever sells milk to an Irish producer who then wants to sell those milk products as part of the EU's FDA arrangements out, 
you know, beyond the EU, they may struggle with rules of origin requirements. And I know that the dairy industry and I think meat processing industry are quite concerned in Northern Ireland precisely about that issue. The other part of the question that you asked, you was about sort of, or the question that was asked was about future regulatory divergence. Clearly, the more GB diverge, or UK diverges from EU from a regulatory point of view, therefore GB from NI, the greater those potential barriers for GB firms selling in a NI might be. And that will just depend on the extent of regulatory divergence. But there's one other issue which may, I don't know, might prove significant. David, you talked about that we've got effective dynamic regulatory alignment. And you're absolutely right, we do, with regard to amendments to existing regulations. What we don't have is with regard to new regulations. EU introduces a new regulation, such as carbon border adjustment mechanism, taxes on high carbon intensive imports. It's really not clear how this will apply to Northern Ireland. Really is not clear, because new regulations do not automatically form part of the Windsor framework. And this is a potential area of future tension, how, how shall I put it, between UK and EU. Um, David, I'm just intrigued on farmers. I'm very intrigued by farmers. Uh, I think there's one point at which Edwin Poot sort of wrote and said, actually, we quite like some of the rules of being in the cap. Could we not have a bit of that rather than have to do our own thing? Well, some, not quite that, but, um, you know, actually, do unionist farmers, the Ulster Farmers Union and stuff like that, do they actually see s some benefits of being much closer to the EU regime than the sort of experimentation that the National Farmers Union might say the other governments of the UK are inflicting on their farmers? Uh, I think given the high proportion of exports, uh, you know, agri-food exports, uh, much, m you know, most of which go, well, a lot would go to GB, a lot would go to Ireland, a lot would go to the rest of the world. Um, I've always been fairly sure that Irish, Northern Irish farmers would want to maintain alignment on SPS standards, et cetera, uh, with the EU, because to do otherwise would severely limit their ability to sell into a very large market. Um, and uh, I, I just, it'll be interesting to see how politics play out over the next year or so, because <coughs> you could ease a lot of the political tensions in Northern Ireland if we see that the UK suddenly decides it is not going to divide, sorry, diverge to any great extent from the EU's regulations, which I think would just reflect reality because I am pretty sure, never mind Northern Ireland, in Great Britain, most firms will still want to maintain alignment, regulatory alignment with EU standards simply because it's such a big market. So just on that particular point, we did ask this question in a number of polls as the extent to which people would want to see an SBS or veterinary agreement, and that was endorsed. I think the agri-food community in Northern Ireland is 100% behind as SPS veterinary agreement is as advanced as possible. One of the things we've noticed over the, over the polling is, okay, there's been a learning about why we actually have the frictions around the movement of GBNI movements of goods, and there's been a, an acceptance, I think, over time that it's not simply a consequence of the protocol. It's the interaction between the protocol and the trade and cooperation agreement. And that once the UK, particularly around the Windsor framework, ruled out any sub further substantial re attempts to renegotiate mm -hmm. the protocol, there's a realization that if you want to get any further easements on GBNI movements, the solution was a closer UK EU relationship under the trade and cooperation agreement. And that's something which got nearly 70% endorsement in the poll polling that we, we, we've done. Um, just on the, on the, the regulatory piece that um, Michael just mentioned, on those new regulations coming through, the wind, one of the consequences of the Windsor framework is that not only do you need to get an agreement between the UK and the EU in the joint committee to bring that piece of new legislation into the protocol, um, the UK position is essentially going to be defined by whether there's cross-community consent yes. in, in Northern Ireland. Because assuming we get the Assembly back, they will effectively have to agree to the UK adding anything which affects any new pieces of EU legislation to, to the protocol. Um, and it's going to be interesting how that plays out, because from a polit principal political perspective, I can see many unions objecting to the idea of further EU legislation. But from the pragmatic um, uh, say business perspective, they may actually want to, want to see that coming in, particularly if it's mirrored by something not dissimilar in the UK context. That's something that's made easier by the fact that the Assembly is not sitting at the moment. Mary, I just wanted to, to come to you on, uh, on a couple of things. One, one of the consequences of this sort of nightmare around Brexit has been 
you know, yet another collapse of the Northern Ireland executive. How's that changing public opinion in the North? And maybe also in the Republic of Ireland about, you know, does it say that's a failed state? Do we really want to hamper our fantastic performance by linking? And I just wonder if you might speculate a bit, colleagues from the Irish Embassy here, who say the one election nobody talks about is the upcoming Irish elections and the possibility that Sinn Féin become, uh, come into government in the first time in the Republic and how that would change the dynamic north of the border. And does that change anything or does it change absolutely nothing? I realise this is I, not very evidence-based, it's very <coughs> speculation-based. It is speculation-based, but I would, um, I would be 100% in agreement that the next Irish election will be consequential for the United Kingdom um, and potentially for, 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 for Northern Ireland most, yeah. most specifically. Um, and what's interesting as well is, is, is the election is scheduled for uh, February 2025. But it is quite possible the election may happen before that. So we could be having an election in Ireland in and around this time next year. We have European Parliament elections coming up in June. Depending how they go, they may be a trigger for calling a general election in Ireland. Um, and in that instance, the, the election will happen sooner, which will be interesting because then it would coincide with the democratic consent vote in the Northern Ireland Assembly. So you would have two very important votes happening at the same time, both playing off each other as well. Um, and, and the truth is the largest political party in the Republic of Ireland is Sinn Féin and in, and in Northern Ireland. Um, again, it's very hard to speculate a year out or, or more than a year out, but it is likely that Sinn Féin will emerge as the largest political party. And then the question becomes, uh, will they be party to the next Irish government? That all depends on the numbers and it depends on whether or not they will have sufficient support for a coalition. And then, of course, the question is, if they do have sufficient support, where does that support come from? Does it come from the left, small political parties on the left, or does it come from one of the um, larger mainstream political parties like Fianna Fáil? Um, so in the event that there is a Sinn Féin-led government in the Republic of Ireland, the issue of Irish unity will be front and centre of that election campaign. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that that means we will be hurtling at speed towards a border poll because that is the responsibility of the Secretary of State. But certainly, I think we will see an increased narrative. We will start to see more concrete plans around um, Irish unity in the medium to longer term. We'll start to see provisions put in place, like, for example, a citizens' assembly. We'll start to see parliamentary inquiries. We might see consultative forums, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, that will be over, I, I would suggest, a protracted period of time. Um, but, but, but the point is that in the event um, of a Sinn Féin-led government, all of these political issues, which are bubbling away underneath issues around the protocol and the Windsor framework, will rise to the top. And that's potentially destabilising in some way, shape or form, um, not just in Northern Ireland, but, but over here as well for the ripple effect it may have uh, for the rest of the UK. Can I just come in? Just yeah. I think one of the immediate consequences of, of, of that factor is um, there's an assumption that, sorry, the Northern Ireland population needs the executive back. Public services are in crisis at the moment. But if we look at the opinion polls, you know, the latest one shows the DUP's share of the vote has just gone up to or share it, it just gone up to 28 percent which is where it was um, two or three years ago Sinn Féin are at 31 percent so you could argue that being out of government isn't electorally hurting either party and, and I, I just have a suspicion that the parties maybe aren't in a rush to get back in to Northern Ireland to government in Northern Ireland for different reasons I did have a like, question David which I uh, not asked you, which is about whether the one thing both parties agree on is milking the UK taxpayer. Well, there, there's, there's you, you, as you will know, I think you were over recently and you were at the Fiscal Council's uh, presentation, but there's a potential £1 billion shortfall in the executives, the Northern Ireland Department's budget this year, and that will not be resolved easily. Um, and in the same way that Keir Starmer is portrayed as walking across an ice rink with a Ming vase, I suspect Sinn Féin might just be wary about 
being caught up having to take some very difficult decisions in Northern Ireland before an election. I don't know, Mary, if you would agree with that. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's fair enough. David? Yeah, would any of these events be a game shifter in terms of attitude, in terms of running up to that consent vote? Would you just start to see the what we call the sterling vision of the Windsor framework of uh, you know, an essential argument for staying inside the UK if, uh, if Sinn Féin came into power in the Republic? Or I would you actually be batting down the hatches even more time? I, it's so difficult to predict yes. here because there are so many variables at, at, at play. Um, but I think what's really important when one tries to understand politics in Northern Ireland and in this particular case, what's happening with the political Windsor framework, you cannot ignore what's happening south of the border. That's arguably often more important than what's happening across the water. Okay. Can, now, I, can I just yeah. add one point as well? I mean, that portrait of Sinn Féin potentially leading the next government, there's also a possibility that we may have the same government <laughs> following the next election if the numbers align. Okay, it's all in the numbers. I think John Curtis has walked out, but he would agree if it was all in the numbers. Uh, there's a gentleman here who has bust my rule that I only take questions from Slido, and there are millions of questions on Slido, but he has been so persistent, I'm going to crack. <laughs> um, so, awards for persistence, but could you be quite brief? Yeah, yeah, thank you. You've got a microphone coming. Yeah, um, I've just come back from Ireland, uh, Republic of Ireland, and I've been talking there to people about imports and exports, and there's been uh, quite an impact, they think, because the stats aren't available really yet, but they think that the fuel costs has had a big impact on imports and exports and things like that. Now, in your stats and when you analyse it, Michael, uh, how well do you think you can pull out from that the, the reason of change as to fuel costs and regulatory or other sentiments like the, the movement towards anti-EU within the Republic of Ireland? Michael. Thank you very much. Michael. So the, the first thing to say is that at the moment our data is only up until the end of 2020, so we don't have that, f that, that change in fuel costs or energy costs. And we will need to think, take that into account as we work with more up-to-date data. There are ways of doing that and of handling that and of trying to disentangle it. So I feel reasonably confident that we can do a, a good job at trying to handle those sorts of effects. A question you know, back to farmers, this is from Neil. Are Northern Ireland farmers concerned about recent trade deals? I think the Prime Minister is signing a deal with South Korea, maybe not an agricultural superpower, but British farmers have been very concerned about the trade deals with Australia and Northern Ireland. Does that sort of, you know, and how, does those, how do those deals apply in Northern Ireland, David? Can you just talk us through? I mean, is Northern Ireland, are Northern Ireland farmers uh, going to be open in the same way as farmers in the rest of Great Britain will be in when the quotas come off in 15 years' time or 13 years' time as it would be now? A quick comment from me. I suspect David and Michael might be able to answer this more authoritatively, but in simple terms, Northern Ireland farmers would consider that they have some of the highest standards uh, in terms of animal health, animal welfare. They would also consider that their product is of the highest quality in global terms. And what they would be concerned about is that some of these trade deals will allow products which are not um, produced to the same high standards and are not of the same quality being allowed into the GB market. And that therefore there's a fairly big threat there. And they've just got some geographic indication together with the Republic about Irish grass-fed something, I think. Uh, some, some sort of joint thing to signal those very, very... High standards. Uh, Sorry, could it, can yeah, just come on. I, I think there's an interesting issue here about the, the way in which a lot of the farming community want to protect the farming in Northern Ireland and therefore might actually be open to some restrictions on what actually comes into Northern Ireland, yeah. even though politically a lot of those f yeah. farmers would object to any restrictions on movement of goods into Northern Ireland. But can I just throw up, throw up another, another issue? We, we've talked about the, the extent to which Northern Ireland is in the single market for goods. Okay. Um, it's also part of the EU customs territory. Okay, but what's Im important it's not part of is the EU's common commercial policy. And there's an issue here for Northern Ireland farmers in terms of their product going across the border for processing into Irish products, not them being able to be sold under EU trade agreements because it's not um, Irish. Okay, and that there's, so in some respects, the, 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 the very good access which Northern Ireland now has to the single market, the customs territory of the EU, is not as complete as some people think. And there's various issues which need, still need to be ironed out 
if Northern Ireland farmers, Northern Ireland and businesses are to have the, the full access to the EU internal market for and, goods that they and want. And would that require a renegotiation or is that something that could just be sorted in the Joint Committee? Mm. I think it actually re would require the EU to go to its partners to get the qualification or, or to, to um, revise the what's what would be qualifying good there and the rules of origin and for, to, for those to accept North product coming in from Northern Ireland. That's probably not on the list of the things that the unionists might want to replace the Windsor framework and the no. protocol unless mm -hmm. the Ulster Farmers Union are doing a really, really good lobbying job there. Michael? Um, Three things. One thing just on that very last point, and David's absolutely right in everything he has said, just one addition to that, which is sort of a generic statement, which is that the, the rules of origin that govern the trade and cooperation agreement, it is possible to change them via the committee. It's one of the things that's actually explicitly stated that you don't need a renegotiation on. But that wouldn't apply to the specific case of selling to another EU FTA partner because that requires agreement to the EU FTA yeah. partner. That's number one. The second thing is there is often concern, and some of the press, I think, have ramped up this concern about some of these deals with agriculture in New Zealand and impact on agriculture and that we're going to start accepting low standard goods and things. Yeah. It's often overstated. Be careful when you hear these yeah. things. We have product standards in this country. And those aren't changing as a result of an agreement with Australia and New Zealand. You can't ship goods into the UK that don't meet our standards, even if we signed a free trade agreement. Now, it might be that there are different process standards. The way you treat animals might be different in different countries. But there's no way that these agreements lower the standards, per se, of the goods coming in, or the animals or the food products coming into the UK. That is often overstated. And the third point related to the uh, situation of Northern Ireland, we talked about the Windsor framework in the context of GBNI trade. Actually, the Windsor framework also applies to rest of the world imports into Northern Ireland. And if the EU tariff is more than three percentage points higher than the UK tariff on the partner country, that is selling to Northern Ireland. So let's say this is Canada selling to Northern Ireland and the UK tariff is three percentage points lower than the EU tariff, then those goods have to go through the red lane. And so every time we sign a free trade agreement, um, that lowers tariffs or gets rid of tariffs, therefore there's going to be more of those tariffs that are going to be below the EU tariff and those, and those companies are shipping that good to Northern Ireland, either directly or via GB, you have to go through the red lane. So to some extent, um, NI is protected from those tariff reductions, but whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is a different question. It depends, it depends on whether you're a consumer or a producer, I think, as with much of this. Uh, exactly. But the red lane will only get bigger, it sounds like, on that sort of basis. Um, uh, just one, one question, um, Michael, that I should have asked you earlier. Uh, Anonymous has said the Windsor framework represents less legal certainty for business than the protocol. Do you agree with that? He was asking you about what the trade impact is, but there's no point asking that if you don't agree with the premise. So, No, I don't think I do agree with that. I think the uncertainty relates to changes in UK regulations and EU, EU regulations coming in, which are not part of, as we've just already discussed, but that... Is no different between Northern Ireland Protocol and Windsor Framework with regard to that. So, no, I don't agree with that statement, actually. Okay, so I'm going to um, want to draw this to a close, but I just wanted to sort of end with, you know, we're all sitting over here in London. We dip into Northern Ireland probably more often than we used to as a consequence, as a positive consequence of Brexit. We all think about Northern Ireland, but what are the things that we ought to be watching out for as serious sort of Northern Ireland watchers that might sort of you know change some of the dynamics david's reporting change the trading picture that michael's research i'm going to come to you two last david is there anything that we ought to be watching out for in northern ireland over the next 18 months or well, so northern ireland being the small place that it is in the airport this morning i happened to bump into sir jeffrey donaldson <laughs> um, who was, uh, and I had 10 minutes with him, I'm not going to divulge or break any confidences, but he was being very upbeat yeah. and he was saying that the next two weeks could be quite crucial and we may well see some movement then. So 
I hope, uh, hope he's right. I can also say you should all come to Northern Ireland, see it at first hand, bring your families and stay for a few days as well. <laughs> I used to promote tourism. <laughs> And it's very good signs when you land in Belfast Airport of Game of Thrones, golf at Port Rush, and what a Giants Causeway and whatever else making you want to stay and have great restaurants as well, many of which I went to with Sue Gray, some of which I had to wait for Sue Gray in because she didn't turn up because she was uh, permanent secretary of the Department of Finance in Northern Ireland. So uh, potentially we have a Labour government that might have quite a deep understanding of Northern Ireland. Mary, what should we be watching out for? Um, well, I've probably sufficiently made the point about elections, yes. um, but I, I would just reiterate the point, the European elections in the Republic of Ireland and the next general election in the Republic of Ireland will be, um, will be important in terms of what they indicate for the future of Northern Ireland itself. And I would also, I suppose, um, you know, I would, I would also make the point that for, for the UK, um, and maybe for the civil service and for the political class in the UK, Things are changing on the island of Ireland, you know, and there will, in the event of, of, of elections changing political arithmetic, um, new relationships will have to be cultivated between the Republic of Ireland and, uh, and, and Northern Ireland, but also the Republic of Ireland and any new Dublin government. And I think that's something that, um, that the UK should be attuned to. It, it, there will be a different tenor to the relationship. They may be challenging. No doubt the press will have a lot to say about that in the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I think it is something that, um, that uh, this side of the Irish Sea should, should be attentive to. And David, I've got a question of uh, someone's thrown in a potential game changer, which is the UK departing, threatening to depart from the European Convention on Human Rights. Does that change the picture? Yes. <laughs> I can't see the UK government doing it precisely because of its international obligations as they relate to Northern Ireland. Um, I think that's, that's an, okay. Uh, okay. So if not that, then what should we be watching out for? Okay. I think we have got to watch out for this democratic consent yeah. vote next year because it it it, it, ha it will repoliticise the protocol, yeah. um, whether we like it or not. And we're due for every four years yeah. having a repoliticisation. Do we have, do we have a date, David? We Is there a date? Is it going to co coincide with the US election or? Okay. The the the, the last date election? they will have to do it. I think the date will probably be the 16th of December. Okay. okay, because it, it, it's in law, in a statutory instrument, and I think, go back to a point I made earlier, there will be a vote irrespective of whether the Assembly is back or not. If, they, if there is no Assembly, the Secretary of State is legally obliged to call the Assembly together for the sole purpose of voting on democratic consent. Okay. Um, a couple of things I'll also throw up is, okay, this last year we've not actually seen many attempts to add EU regulation to the protocol. There have been a couple that have gone through, yeah. but there's actually been a, almost a lull when we know there's certain pieces of legislation which should, there's an argument saying they should apply to anybody having being part of the single market. Um, those might come through, um, in, and that what the reaction is going to be there, particularly in the light of the issue which we've not discussed, is the Stormont break. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a big challenge there for the UK government in managing expectations about what can and cannot be done by MLAs mm -hmm. under the Stormont break. And this goes back to, in some respect, an overselling of the Windsor framework back in February. Yeah. Um, and the fact that, as we saw in the opinion polling, yeah. there's not been a huge uplift in terms of support for the, for the protocol, partly because people realise it doesn't necessarily do what it said on the tin at the time. Um, and I think there's going to be an issue, issue there. And moreover, I think one thing to remember, we've talked about the, the green lanes, red lanes, and the, and the easements on the movement of goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. The functioning of those will be contingent on the UK government meeting its obligations around data sharing and enhanced monitoring and market surveillance. And the EU is watching exceptionally closely, because I think if there's any reversal of the dynamic we've seen over the last eight, 18 months towards full <coughs> compliance, I think they will act. And Michael, final word. So on the politics, I'm not going to, I mean, we have okay, very, very on the economics, my answer is not much. And the reason for that is, I think somebody said earlier that, you know, people were predicting sort of all, all, all the problems following the Windsor framework and everything, and it's been quiet. Great. That means that it's working, that there aren't big problems, and that's going to ease the politics. So the less we hear about problems, the better. So not much. OK, excellent. Well, that's a good place to end. We'll all watch out for nothing happening, on the economy at least, but the politics look as though they're going to be really, really, really interesting. So could I just get you to thank my fantastic panel? <laughs> And to 
to thank all the people who asked so many brilliant questions on Slido and the one gentleman in the room. Um, and there is lunch now, so please go outside. There's lunch. You need your blue sticker. And we are back at two um, when we're going to be looking at what we're calling street-level Brexit, which <laughs> sounds...
but uh, delighted you're all back uh, for 10 past two, slightly, slightly early, which is a bit of a motif of this conference. <laughs> so before lunch, we were looking at migrants, we were looking at um, Northern Ireland, but for many people, actually, Brexit was really about their sort of day-to-day -day experience of life, uh, and quite a few of the Brexit coalition were voting on issues really quite a long way away from the EU, uh, whatever, whether it's a vote against austerity, a vote against feeling left behind, a vote for a redirection of funding into the NHS. So that's what we're going to be looking at in this session, which we've entitled uh, Street Level Brexit. So I'm joined by a fantastic panel. So our presenters, you'll have got the sort of style now, we've got presenters. We're going to have Professor Tammy Harvey, Harvey from uh, University of London, who's going to do a presentation of Project She and Matt, Matthew Wood have been doing. Uh, Matthew is going to hold back and just be there for the Q&A, I think, but if you feel the need to seize the microphone, do that. We have Professor Adrian Favell from the University of Leeds. Now, Adrian's not doing a formal presentation, but he's, he's going, going to tell us a bit about his research, research on levelling up. And, and then I'm delighted to welcome, as my discussant, Anoush Jakalian from the New Statesman. So, um, we're going to get going in a second. Remember, post questions on Slido, if you possibly, possibly, possibly can. Lots of questions on Slido last time. Uh, please upvote questions that you think are really interesting, so I know what the audience wants. Um, and as you saw last time, if you really, really must, I might crack and ask one or two people in the audience, but <laughs> it is Slido first, so because otherwise nobody will use Slido. And we need to have that, and hopefully lots and lots of people are watching at home, including all those anonymous people who are still being very, very shy. So without further ado, I'm going to pass on to Tammy to tell us about her project about the health and Brexit. Thank you very much. Thanks for the, the, the warm welcome. And I may I say I'm very much enjoying today's uh, conference. I have brought a prop for my talk. Oh, look, it's the book of our project. Um, so um, this project, or this, sorry, this talk focuses on just one important aspect of our research project on health governance after Brexit. Um, it, it focuses just on our engagement with left behind or so-called left behind communities. Um, apologies if the pace is a bit slower than earlier. I, I, I can't keep up with the pace that we've had so far. Now, as a whole, the project also included significant engagement with policy so-called experts, or they are actual experts. And in terms of the project as a whole, the interaction between these two different strands are a very important aspect of our overall findings. So today I'm focusing on our engagement with the left behind communities, but actually the way that that work interacted with our policy work is a really important message from the project as a whole. The project finished, I can't remember where it finished, I'm still doing work in the area, but the funding finished in 2021. Um, few images of Brexit are as enduring as the one on this slide. Our research took us to the north of England and Northern Ireland to talk with people on the street about their thoughts on this image of the Brexit bus. And we also collected Vox Pops through the process of making a film. I should say, not as good a film as Adrian's project's film, which I saw last week, which is epic, and if you get a chance to see it, you must see it. We opened up conversations by asking people what the bus image brought to mind, a deliberately very open and vague question. And depending on their answer, we used a loose framework to gently guide the conversation so as to try to uncover what the person we were talking with was hoping for or expecting from a legitimate <laughs> Brexit and who they thought should be accountable for delivering that Brexit. 
So here are our so-called left-behind communities. We collected this street conversation data in four so-called left-behind places, plus we did a small pilot in Sheffield, so five places in all. Our left-behind places were <coughs> Rochdale and Rotherham in the north of England, and Newry and Derry in Northern Ireland. And I should acknowledge here that we've had a huge amount of help from lots of people um, in this project, including some people who are here who've presented, um, who've helped us a lot with the Northern Ireland situation. The, the two other project members who are not here today are both based in Northern Ireland. <coughs> Given their high levels of multiple <coughs> deprivation, each site has populations highly likely to be heavily reliant on the NHS <coughs> and indeed on the local hospital with an accident and emergency department. This is what it looked like when we were in the field. So we gathered data in shopping centres, unstructured public spaces where we could have conversations with people in a place where they could be kept warm and dry. The Sheffield pilot we did outside, and we learned from that 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 wasn't the way to do it. We needed to be inside so that people would be warm and dry. Each data gathering week was a week when Brexit was likely to be in the news, such as one of the many possible Brexit days. Do you remember those? Um, and the date of the European parliamentary elections. As I mentioned, we also collected footage of Vox Pops in making a film about our project, and you can watch the film for one pound on Amazon. Feel free to do that. Uh, here's some information about the places and dates of filming. So to some extent, some of the limitations of our street conversation data were partly mitigated by the film data. Now, we obviously don't want to overclaim from the, the data that we gathered. It was gathered in specific places and at specific times. But here's what we did and what we found. Our data analysis focused on the language that people used when they were talking about hoped for or feared post-Brexit futures. We were especially interested in the stories or the metaphors that people used when they talked about the abstract concept of accountability for post-Brexit futures, especially for the NHS and health. As a team of four very different people, we worked together to code the data into thematic narratives, meanings and significance, as well as evoking an important sense of place and time. So the place and the time is a really intrinsic part of our research method and um, its analysis and its outputs. As I, um, as I said, we, we acknowledge um, the limitations of our approach, including that we, of course, brought our own interpretations to the data. And we've tried to compensate for that limitation by being as open and honest as we can about our own positions and views, and indeed about our own Brexit stories. And when you read the lovely book, you will read some of the stories of what happened to us during Brexit time as uh, individual <coughs> human beings as well as social science researchers. The four of us, as I've just said, experienced Brexit in very different ways. And we feel that being able to embody those very different ways in our analysis and findings is a major strength that comes from our project. In the other bit of our project, the policy bit and legal bit, we analysed, and some of us are still working on this, the effects of Brexit for the NHS and health using legal and policy analysis. So just to be really clear, Taking that legal and policy analysis, all forms of Brexit are taken in the round bad for health and the NHS. There's, there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, that's, that's the outcome of our investigation, if you like. So all forms of Brexit in the round are bad for health and the NHS. There might be some aspects that are marginally improve things, but in general, it's not good news for the NHS. So we contrasted those effects with the aspirations, the hopes, and the dreams 
of the ordinary people that we talk to, and I say in inverted commas, ordinary people, for a legitimate post-Brexit future for the NHS, and who these people we talked with thought should be accountable for that. That's what we did. What did we find? Well, a fair number of people either had no idea how anyone could or would be held to account, or felt that no one would be held to account. <coughs> Some conversations suggested violence. Accountability? A Kalashnikov, said one guy in Derry. Johnson should be nailed to the bus, said someone in Sheffield. But when people talked of accountability, many talked of political accountability. They talked about elections, they talked about fitness for office. Some people considered discursive accountability, for example, through transparency. Johnson should be made to tell the truth and show his papers. Some people wanted interpersonal accountability. Johnson and Farage should shadow a doctor and a nurse for a whole week so they can see where this money is needed. Many conversations, more than I was expecting, evoked legal accountability. A few people just couldn't believe that no one had been prosecuted for the message on the Brexit bus. More people felt that there should be a legal process involving courts, perhaps the Electoral Commission. Transparency through law was a strong theme. Some people thought civil liability would be appropriate, for example, being done for false advertising or having a salary deduction. But criminal liability was more common. People expected Johnson, or more non-specifically politicians, should be jailed for fraud, for telling so many lies. So to conclude, while no possible source for legal accountability for the message on the bus was successful, and we've got some legal analysis in the book that explains why. The promise on the bus, the promise of increased funding and improvements to the NHS, cannot be kept simply as a natural consequence from flowing from, the e flowing from leaving the EU. It could be kept in other ways, but not as a natural consequence that flows from leaving the EU. Many of the people we talked with felt that Johnson or other political leaders should be held to account for that, including through law and legal process. And the current law is wholly deficient in that regard. There's just one more important thing that we think our project has to contribute. And this is about the importance of respectful or even humble communication. Of course, our project was far from perfect, although I personally think it was the best one. But we did try very hard to avoid this binary narrative of experts and ordinary people, with experts knowing the truth, knowing what is best for the NHS, and especially this narrative of Remainer experts being right. What we tried to do was listen to the stories and reflect on what they meant from where people were coming from, including ourselves. And I'm just going to finish by reading you a tiny bit of one of the stories in the book. This is Mark, part of Mark Fleer's story. Mark isn't able to be with us today, because I think this really communicates this point that, uh, that we want to make about humble and respectful conversations, and I think this is possibly the most important thing in terms of going forward with the UK's relationship with the EU and indeed the rest of the world. So Mark says this, I had a chat with my mother recently, winter 2022, about how things are with the NHS in our respective places of residence within the UK, Northern Ireland and England. The prompt from our, for our chat was how much the NHS in both places is struggling and how that is impacting on access to care. We both agreed that Brexit hasn't helped matters. For instance, there doesn't appear to be enough staff to treat everyone who's waiting for care. We both had concerns about my ability to access essential medicines due to the operation of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. While the latter may have been resolved for now at least, the former remains a pressing problem. We both see reports of queues outside hospitals. We have relatives waiting to access care, seemingly because of the strain on the NHS this winter. But the politicians don't appear to be sorting out the problem now or in the long term. On top of that, we also agreed that by beginning to recount our stories was helpful 
as we sought to understand each other's positions on Brexit, which were and, and remain mixed for both of us. My mother commented that stories, saying what's going on in our lives and how Brexit seems to relate, allows us to make a connection between our lives and leaving the EU, something that not even the politicians seem to know much about or don't even seem to be able to explain very clearly. Storytelling gives us a chance to understand the consequences of Brexit and to have some empathy for one another. We laughed at that. Mark finishes, we agreed that just having conversations like this seemed impossible a few years ago and that exchanging stories from a position of time and distance from Brexit Day and from different locations in the UK gave us both an opportunity to stand back, develop empathy and reflexivity. We were both emphatic that this is vital for getting through all manner of shared problems and that there are so many of them to resolve, large and small, public and private. Mum said, now wouldn't that be a good thing? Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks very much, Tammy. Matt, you're down to answer questions. So before I turn to Adrian, I've got a question from Neil, which is a question I wanted to ask as well. Uh, could you elaborate on why you conclude that Brexit has been bad for the NHS? So Tammy suggested that, you know, on all counts, Brexit had been bad for the NHS. Uh, what was that? And I'm quite interested in whether your people had the same account as you as to why Brexit had been you know, bad or what they expected to see if that promise had been delivered. Because a lot of money has gone into the NHS. Mm -hmm. A lot of money has gone into the NHS over the past five years, so I'm quite interested in where people see the causality there and stuff. So, <clears throat> a, lot of the, um, a lot of the analysis that Tammy and Mark uh, have done around the legal implications and then some of the uh, work that we've done um, collaboratively with, with practitioners has, has shown and has modeled the different scenarios uh, and, and has shown that pretty much all the scenarios um, uh, are and have been bad um, uh, uh, for health. Um, but a caveat I would add to that, number one is COVID-19 and the way in which COVID-19, well, for a start, COVID-19 massively disrupted the end of our project. Um, and it also clearly muddied the waters hugely um, uh, as the, res the response to COVID obviously involved significant, uh, substantial investment. Um, so I, I think from the analysis that uh, Tammy and Mark and our, 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 our practitioner colleagues have done, have shown uh, those scenarios and, and, and how bad they uh, have been. Um, but we, I think we need to add COVID probably as a caveat in terms of So, of so what are the routes? There's staffing, there's squeeze mm -hmm. on public finances from reduced economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that it or is there more? Medicine supply, devices supply, um, biomedical research. Uh, but some of those wouldn't show up that quickly for your mm -hmm. average punter, would they? The, Th these don't appear in our street conversation. Yeah. Most of them don't appear in our street conversation. Staffing does. Mm. Oh, right. Okay. Well, and yeah. So sorry if I could. Yeah. So, around the um, uh, the street level interviews we did, um, I think what we found there was very much a moving target. So we did the interviews in 2019. So this was uh, during all of the um, the parliament mm. parliamentary tumult. Uh, around the actual implementation of Brexit. If you go back and so to the slide which has the dates for the interviews, please. Yeah. Thanks. They're all, they're all around those big 2019 events, weren't they? Mm. Mm. Yes, so I think... That's not it. That's the anyway. one. That yeah, but, uh, no, that's that the filming data dates. Yeah. There's a slide before that, I think. There we go. Thank you. So you can see here that we, we did... Um, all of our field work yeah. during that implementation process. And so in a way, um, what we were doing there was capturing, um, I suppose, people's expectations for what, um, what Brexit would lead to in a way. So th th I, 
that was that was what we found in, in, in that situation. Okay, no, that's very interesting. And I'm just sort of intrigued. Did people unprompted talk about accountability? Um, I mean, what did they talk about when they were talking? Because, mm. yeah, that's a bit sort of, you know, political science essay-ish to talk about accountability. <laughs> what were they, what did accountability mean to them? Um, what did they say? To elaborate a bit on the method. Talk about, yeah. So, um, what we did was to um, show people a picture of the, the battle bus yeah. and um, ask them what came to mind. Yeah. And then we asked them, we, 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 we prompted them or we nudged them towards an idea of accountability. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it would be unlikely, I think, that people would, um, uh, would use the word accountability completely unprompted, but people did talk about um, uh, consequences, yeah. what they thought consequences ought to be. Mm -hmm. And of course, anyone who studies accountability as a social scientist knows that the consequences are a key part of accountability. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's what I would say to that. OK. Um, thank you very much. That was really interesting. We came to Anoush in a second, but Adrian has also got a governance after Brexit. Uh, research project, yeah. look at, which I think is looking at levelling up at another aspect of people's aspirations for what uh, Brexit yeah. might mean. Adrian, tell us a bit about your research. Yeah, well, thank, thanks, Jill. I mean, there's already a lot of substance on the table with Tammy and Matt's mm -hmm. project. I'm here as a commentator, but also representing the Northern Exposure project that was based at the University of Leeds um, with a large team. I'm, I'm now, I currently work now at the University College Cork in the Republic of Ireland, if you're looking for me. Um, and, um, you know, I think uh, our project, like uh, Tammy and Matt's, was part of the government's, uh, governments after Brexit lar large scale research programme, the first wave. And I think it's worth trying to emphasise, you know, our, our, our kind of goal of, of trying to engage in research that's expansive and substantive mm -hmm. on Brexit rather than just following the politics uh, in some ways. Um, you know, structural, historical, narrative, discursive approaches, methodologies, um, various disciplines. You know, and I think there is a sense, I would say, you know, my own view, um, that the political sociology of Brexit has been rather thin in this sense. I mean, based on public opinion and electoral survey methods, you know, these were projects, I think, that were trying to get at the social and historical forces shaping Brexit. So, you know, that's, that's the way to look at them as complements, as, as alternatives perhaps to the mainstream Brexit literature, which I think everyone's familiar with. Um, that literature comes up very well. I mean, it's very well summarised and challenged, I think, in the APSR article that, that uh, Matt and Tam and Tammy and team have published, um, summarising the, you know, rather schematic and polarised reductions that captured um, the academic debates after Brexit, but also the Twitter sphere. And I think there's an important relationship between those two things. You know, whether they were emphasising socio-spatial polarisations or values-based, um, you know, culture wars and cultural backlash type um, polarisations. And we all, know the, we all know the language of these debates, winners and losers, urban versus periphery, north versus south, somewheres versus nowheres, and leavers versus remainers. Um, and, you know, the, the, the concepts left behind, red wall levelling up, and the very dubious white working class English that supposedly drove Brexit. And I think Tammy's and, and Matt's work, uh, and I hope our work is, uh, you know, has, has tried to unpack this stuff. I think their work is very effective in unpacking some of this in a particular context. So, I mean, I would add to this that I, you know, I, it's my, my argument that also there's an unholy relationship of this, of the, of the mainstream academic analysis to uh, reproducing and reinforcing the same analysis that was being produced by political strategists, such as Dominic Cummings, um, in many ways. And although, of course, the anal analysis has followed the politics, it has also reinforced the politics, uh, repeated it. And, um, and to some extent, I think the problem of, of then, um, you know, then being confirmed you know, general elections become a kind of scientific confirmation of a particular analysis of British society um, via this, this, this method, which 
of course, works for the 2019 election, but not the 2017 election, I would argue. But, um, you know, that's something I think we, we'd want to challenge. Um, you know, our methods, um, as we've heard, I mean, our methods have in common, I think, with, with Tammy and Matt, uh, socio-analysis, social history, trying to get at change and crisis. Um, the methods in Northern Exposure, I, and I'll say, I haven't really said what the project is. Northern Exposure is... Um, uh, subtitled Race, Nation and Disaffection in Ordinary Towns and Cities um, After Brexit. It's about the North. It's about four locations in the North, um, Preston, Halifax, Wakefield and Middlesbrough. Um, there's a website, Northern Exposure. You can see um, Anand uh, and Amenon and Anoush debating the, the policy uh, angles uh, with our various participants um, on that website. You can also see the film trailer uh, for... Uh, 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 you know, we, we perhaps rather unexpectedly were able to make a really a, a proper feature-length documentary film. It's a very moving uh, and challenging film by Lucy Kay, an independent filmmaker called From Where We Stand. Um, that was premiered at the Leeds International Film Festival last <coughs> week. Um, we engaged in a lot of co-production with stakeholders, uh, addressing the impact question, um, uh, you know, trying to work with... Um, I mean, particularly certain councils like Wakefield Council, um, you know, they're, they're supposed to contribute in kind to these projects, right? But it's actually the other way around. We're providing research that they can't do anymore because of austerity. Um, and we had this wonderful relationship where they're giving us data and information and opening doors, and we're actually providing research that feeds into local level discussions at least. I mean, it's a very difficult question for me, you know, how you do impact in, in, in this current political environment. Um, but, you know, we had a lot of sympathy for the local authorities, I think, and, their, and what they were trying to do. Um, and the main part of the research is oral history. Um, we, we have uh, around 160 interviews with elderly residents of these four locations in the north. Um, it's a very diverse group of, of, of interviewees. Uh, we, we, of course, look at white British, um, very marginal white British po populations. The um, lower middle class suburban white van new build middle classes, who I think are substantially behind Brexit in many ways in the north. Um, but a lot of, it, a, a very centrally, a, a set of interviews with Asian British <coughs> across the north, black British, um, some East European residents, and uh, really capturing the, the true diversity of the north, uh, a kind of super diversity, I would say, in some <coughs> places, which is interesting. Um, and um, I, I, the one, perhaps the one contrast with our project and, and Tammy and Matt's is that we, we're quite strongly against the Vox Pop method or we at least do a kind of work that, that, that tries to do something that's the opposite of that in some ways, mm -hmm. to try and talk to people about their personal lives, um, narrating their own lives, a bit indirectly really what we're trying to do with them um, in order to tell us a narrative against the backdrop of social and economic change in these locations that takes you through to Brexit and, in fact, COVID, because I think our project is as much yeah. about COVID England as it is Brexit England, and the film, certainly, the film is almost not about Brexit. It's just about uh, a set of characters in the north and, and the, the, the places that they live in. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, our findings are not a tidy set, a tidy set of packaged... Um, uh, bullet point result, uh, you know, things that will fit into 29 characters. I mean, they're, they're really, um, you know, complicated results, I think, that probably need a social history rather than anything else to pull out the, the, the meanings. But, um, you know, we would certainly argue the working class is not white. Um, it's actually Asian British, very substantially in the north. It's full of migrants, EU nationals, uh, and the young precariat who might be sort of, sort of seen of as you know, in other class positions. It's not the flat cap gold Thorpian work class, working class that has been identified with the decline of labor in the North. Um, I think that the stories of people in relation to labor party histories are really interesting. And, and um, again, not, not as reductive as, as, as a lot of the um, analysis is suggesting. Um, the, uh, you know, I think the underclass don't vote. I mean, they're really marginal people in these constituencies that we're talking with. You know, we're either not aware of Brexit or barely aware of it, not voting. Um, you know, I think the vote is substantially elsewhere, um, if we're thinking in class terms. Um, and who, who calls themselves working class in the north? Of course, everybody's working class in the north. Uh, even if you've got three cars in the drive and a big mortgage, it's, it's um, you know, 
those things are, I think, are significant. Um, and uh, we, you know, we, we found very li little lever remainer bifurcation across these, these populations, but that also means that, you know, that there's a lot of black and Asian British voting to leave as well as um, remain. So, you know, that goes pushes against one of the, one of the sort of more progressive um, arguments that, that has become quite common. And it won't surprise you, you know, our ultimate narrative here is one of us about the effects of austerity. Um, all of this started under New Labour. I think the story really is about how New Labour has lost the narrative over multi-ethnic Britain, over the post-empire in the early 2000s when it turned towards neo-nationalism, um, Islamophobia, and, you know, what became the hostile environment. And I think, you know, we should, shouldn't kid ourselves that it's all down to the Tories, um, uh, ultimately. So, um, yeah, that, that helps, helps give you a flavour of our research. So, Anoush, if we look at this then in a sort of, you know, political context, um, you know, we're now three years into the new arrangements, uh, seven years since the, since the referendum. What sort of insights do you think that, you know, both Adrian's project and Tammy and Matthew's project give us about, you know, what people's if you like, what people's aspirations were insofar as, you know, they were interested enough or aware enough to, to vote, what their expectations were and where they might be, might be now. Well, I think it's interesting because when Brexit was happening and through all of those blockbuster Brexit dates in the calendar that you were interviewing people on and everything, it was, it was at the top of people's minds. I do a lot of reporting around the country, not just box popping, but sort of speaking to people who work in various services in different parts of the UK. Um, and it would, you know, be at the top of people's minds. Either people were saying, oh, these politi politicians are making a real mess of this, and there's the accountability point that you drew on, which is, you know, people won't use the word accountability, but they will say, you know, if, if I was running my business like that, I would have been sacked, you know, so that's, that's kind of the language that you'd hear it in. Um, and during that time, there was very much, you know, everyone was reading what they wanted into people's aspirations for Brexit. It was either about immigration, it was either about austerity, about health, about sort of anything you wanted it to be, about public space. Um, and since then, what's, what's been really interesting is that when I go and do these yeah. similar pieces, no one mentions Brexit at all. Canvassers who go out for the main political parties say they don't really hear much about it, even those, you know, even those Lib Dems in the sort of blue wall will admit it's not like the biggest issue on people's minds anymore. But these subjects that we were sort of reading into the Brexit vote are almost even more to the fore. So the state of public services, the fact that people feel like their public spaces and the public realm is being degraded. Um, immigration to an extent, although even in the places where you might expect more of it to come up, it's not, it's not necessarily the top thing that people are talking about, perhaps because the cost of living is so much more to the forefront of people's minds. Um, but it's almost more important now than ever, I think, to look into you know, how people are being betrayed over all of these things they were promised, not just in the Brexit vote about taking back control of their lives, whether that meant of their borders or their neighbourhoods, but also in the levelling up element of the 2019 general election, which I don't think you can really untangle from Brexit, because this was what was promised to the people in the so-called red wall and the left behind, all of these buzz phrases that are slightly reductive, but, you know, people were promised things. Um, they were promised that their high streets would look nicer, and they don't. And, you know, it's these simple things that cannot really be blamed on COVID um, that haven't manifested themselves in, in people's lives. And I think that sense of betrayal is, is really dangerous. So you get not only a disillusionment with how Brexit has gone, but you get a disillusionment with using the health service. So there's less faith in the NHS than any time in its history now, according to polling. And we've actually done some polling at the New Statesman of councillors around the country. And I'll just quickly read it to you, if that's OK. Yeah, no, sure. Um, so we asked um, if the high streets in their, local in their local authority have got better or worse since 2010. Um, and 57.2% said worse, 20% said much worse, 16 neither better nor worse, 5.9% better, 0.5% much better. And what was really interesting is conservative councillors, among conservative councillors, 54.7% said worse. 7.5% said much worse, and that's more than the Labour councillors were telling us, 53.6% of whom told us that they were worse. So there's clearly um, uh, an anger among the grassroots, even in the grassroots of the governing party, about the way that their neighbourhoods have been left to decline. And that was not the take back control message 
that was not what the take back control message was promising. And actually, Labour is using that language now for its devolution proposals. It wants to do a take back control bill, which is absolutely nothing to do with immigration or borders. It's to do with giving power to, well, releasing power to neighbourhoods mm -hmm. and councils. It's really interesting. Now, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in on Slido. Just a reminder to use Slido if you possibly can. Um, and you can connect through the cloud. It's all very easy, even though I, even I managed to do it. Um, question, just a few questions, sort of, you know, methodological questions, sort of, you know, questions about your, uh, your research. Um, Jeanette Edwards has asked whether your research led you to question the concept of left behind. Did people who you spoke to, did they sort of identify themselves as left behind, or was that a label we put on people thinking they all are left behind and because they're sort of like not like us? Yeah, so we, um, I think we started off very much from a critical stance towards the left behind mm. concept, the sort of catch all term. And in the research, we actually, um, we, we, we state this as a methodological problem because there's a certain stigma that's attached to the idea of being from a left behind community or in a left behind community. Uh, so what we did was we, uh, we did these interviews in left behind communities. We didn't use the concept of left behind to try and... Behind. Can I ask you yeah. the NHS? No, no, we didn't, we didn't do it. And I, I, I don't think that's a, a particularly good qualitative yeah. approach. So um, we found some people lamented the fact that there wasn't investment in their area. Um, uh, but I think we, we came out, I think pretty much, um, com confirmed that, you know, once you, that, that I think it's, it, 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 it's good to not, I guess, perpetuate this idea of the left behind in an uncritical way. Adrian, do you want to say? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this is an e emic to etic sort of problem. It's, you know, how do we come up with analytical, that too. Yeah, an analytical language, <laughs> you know, what people say to what, yeah. how we analyze it objectively, um, you know, it's a classic problem, obviously, in social science. Um, and, um, you know, I, th 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 there's, there's, in a sense, there's more respectable ways of talking about deprivation, uh, deprivation indexes and so on, but there's a, you know, actually a very powerful rant about the concept of deprivation in, in our film uh, from one of our particularly um, lively characters who, who, you know, sort of saying, how can you call, how can you call us deprived when we've got this, you know, and there's this vista of, of Halifax and the Dales and so on. Um, yeah, obviously, you know, we, we, we can work with the objective categories here, but I, you know, I think when you're looking at what people are talking about overwhelmingly in the, the work that we were doing, it's, you know, what, what is absolutely striking about this place is whatever the objective realities of places like Middlesbrough, which are frankly mm -hmm. shocking, um, and I saw stuff in this project that I, you know, did not believe I would find, you know, in these remote parts, remote district areas of, 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 um, of Wakefield and well, bits of Preston, Halifax, and, and then Middlesbrough particularly, I think, in some ways. But the absolute pride and hope and mm -hmm. engagement in place is, is the overwhelming story I think um, and um, you know and I think that that, ob that you know that obviously does play into some sense of of, of um, I think mis you know mischaracterization misrepresentation of the north is perhaps as mm. as much what being left behind is I mean uh, and you know we, anybody traveling down from the north you just simply experience it every time you you come to the southeast and see the the levels of privilege uh, infrastructurally and so forth that London and the South East has relative to the North. And that, you know, that obviously is true and, and is there and is objective in some ways, so. I know, shall we sort of over left behind and levelling up as part of the political narrative now, do you think? I mean, you know, Boris Johnson was its great yeah. champion, if you like, and he's moved on. Um, We've got 12 missions for levelling up, but it's not clear that Rishi Sunak puts much oomph behind them. I don't think that any of his five priority, no, what was it? What were they? I say five pledges yeah, to add five, to the five, five priorities. Pledges. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it features in any of those, actually. No. Um, and what's, uh, what's the political reality mm. is that it has fallen down mm. the agenda. So it's known, it's sort of an open secret, really, that Michael Gove has been frustrated with the lack of 
the leveling up program that he's been able to push past the Treasury. There was a bit on towns during the Conservative Party conference, but it wasn't nearly as much as he would have liked to do. He's committed to that, that project. Um, and that means that, therefore, on the Labour side, there has been this corresponding... Um, uh, there's been this corresponding fall down the agenda for them as well. Lisa Nandy, who was probably talking about levelling up before it was a phrase, um, you know, with her pitch to towns, she was moved out of the shadow levelling up post. Um, Angela Rayner was brought in. This is seen by Labour insiders who I've spoken to. I mean, one of them said this shows that levelling up is dead in the water. Not to denigrate Angela Rayner's um, sort of political focus, but she's very much uh, more... Uh, focused on the housing side of her brief. So there does seem to be a, this decline in levelling up in, in the focus of both of the main parties, which is really to the um, absolute despair of the of the people within those two parties, of which there are still many, and outside. So Andy Haldane, the former uh, chief economist of the Bank of England, who's actually advised both the Tories and Labour on their levelling up strategies, um, that this, you know, they've lost the momentum. There was supposed to be this arms race of levelling up proposals between Gove and Nandy, you know, they, they both said that, that they, they wanted it to turn into that kind of situation. And now it's, 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 it's sort of withered away. And that's partly because of the reality of the public finances. But it's also because perhaps it's sort of, you know, journalists like me talk about it less. It's yeah. less of a sexy part of the agenda because the 2019 election now is a, is a long way back in our uh, political memory and we're looking ahead to the next general election more and this these promises that Boris Johnson made to the public f feel like there's been, it feels like a lot has happened in the meantime there's been the pandemic and there's been other betrayals party gate you're seeing what's playing out in the COVID inquiry now um, and perhaps politicians feel that they can get away with breaking those promises but I would say that that's probably the most dangerous thing that they could do I mean the way that you disillusion people the most is promising that their local area will improve and their lives will improve and then they manifestly not. And as we've seen from our polling, it seems to be getting worse. Um, Tammy, this is probably a very unfair question, given the focus of your research, but it is the top voted one. So I'm going to ask it, but say we didn't look at this. Um, Anonymous has said, um, might come up in the second, next session as well. Most of the people who voted for Brexit were affluent people in the south of the UK. Um, I think we've called them comfy leavers at UK and changing Europe. Why is the myth, myth of left behind voters perpetuated? Um, but I just wondered whether the sort of, you know, you did anything to give a sense of actually, you know, whether your NHS message and the concerns about the NHS, you had a picture of Sarah Wollaston, I think, in your slides, who said she was pro-Brexit until because she thought it would mean more money for the NHS, MP for Totnes, mm -hmm. uh, then realised it probably wouldn't and switched. Uh, did you get any sense that, you know, there's a similar sense among better off uh, leave voters than whatever, or is it, uh, you know, do you, are you aware of anyone else who's looked at looked at that i don't know which of those questions to answer so i'll just talk for a bit yeah. um <laughs> so uh, sarah wilson's on the slide because she's one of our project partners yeah. um so when she took over as chair of the health and social care committee she realized that the committee knew absolutely nothing about the relationship between the eu and the uk's mm -hmm. membership of the eu and health and the nhs because people at that time were assuming it's difficult to imagine this but people at that time were assuming that the EU membership was all about trade. It wasn't really about things that really matter to ordinary people like the NHS. So um, me and some other people had a really interesting time helping the members of the Health and Social Care Committee understand all the ways in which EU membership was actually integrated with the NHS in different ways. And this is how we came to the analysis of all forms of Brexit are bad for health. A no-deal Brexit would have been awful for the NHS, so thank goodness we avoided a no-deal Brexit. Um, what was the other bit you were asking about? Oh, the, oh, the initial whether, question. Whether, whether, you know, you obviously spoke to people in deprived areas. I just wondered whether this was a particular focus of people in deprived areas, that they had expectations of what Brexit would deliver for the NHS. There was different motivation among, you know, better off people, or whether actually if you'd gone and vox popped, you know, people in Godalming and wherever, you would get very similar answers so, about this is, we voted for this, we expected this, and we haven't seen it. Yeah, so, there's some of that in the film so, data. So I don't think we can really, I, no, well, we no, can't, we can't make any yeah. claims on the basis yeah. of our data because no, no. we were focused on left behind yeah. communities. Yeah. I, the, the, I, I am aware that there is some stuff out there on uh, comfortable 
levers. I've written down Tim Bale's name here. Yeah. Um, I think possibly he was doing some work related to that, but I'm not sure. Um, but there are there are some studies that there are some there is some data out there. Um, I don't know whether whether that um, would tell a different story in relation to comfortable. But I would but I would also say that our our, our work was really for a, let, let let's say a, a hard to survey or hard to reach. Hard to reach demographic. Um, um, and Matt, we've got some questions on computation as well, um, asking about whether if you look beneath the sort of you know people looked at, uh, is there any breakdown of your findings by categories, e.g., age, gender, uh, and of course you know leave remain, because presumably some of those people might have voted remain. Um, you know another question about generational differences. I think Adrian, you mentioned you so you spoke to elderly vote. I'm not quite sure who was elderly there, she says, looks nervously, but, you know, um, but quite where, you know, was there any differentiation within that, or is it a sort of, you know, that are they so similar? There's a slide on our perceived statistics of participants, if you could get to it, please. It's after the slides that I gave, you, and then you can talk. There you go. Uh, so, I mean, in terms of leave remain, yeah. we didn't... We, we consciously yeah. tried not to ask people okay. about that because it, yeah. it, it would be itself quite a provocative yeah. question to ask. Um, so we couldn't really say much about that. Um, in terms of demographics, what we, what we tried to do, if Tammy can find the correct I can get there. I thought slide. we might get some of these, so I put <laughs> some slides go. that I didn't speak um, to. There we go. So, I mean, we, we, we recorded some descriptive... Yeah. Um, some descriptive numbers, um, but what I would what I would say is that what we recorded showed us that um, uh, based on our perceptions that we were talking to people who um, who, who had significant challenges in their lives who mm. could be viewed as um, a, as part of the uh, deprived so called left behind categories. Yeah. Um, we couldn't really say much more <coughs> other than that, really. Adrian. Yeah, so the oral, oral histories were with um, people above 50. Um, obviously, we we're trying to get them to talk mm. back to, um, you know, ideally to the <coughs> Thatcherite period and after um, that sort of narrative. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I really think across, across the interviews as a whole, um, very little clear patterns emerge in terms of um, who voted leave and remain or didn't vote or wasn't, um, you know, informed, etc. The, the um, you know, I think the, the the clear distinction that really comes up to us in the in the research is that you know narratives of Asian British in the north, um, very powerful narratives um, going back in some cases to the fifties with people's parents. Um, Quite aspirational um, in 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 a certain sort of way, um, but very much you know embedded in diasporic and transnational forms of living. Um, you know, so this isn't a sort of um, future, uh, you know, Britain type of narrative. It's a sorry, British future mm. type of narrative. It's a it's a transnational, multi-ethnic, diasporic mm. narrative, um, and you know, ver and very clearly. Uh, uh, conscious of transformations of the towns as well that have, have taken place through these populations. So, you know, there's a quite successful middle-class Asian population in Middlesbrough, for example, that has moved into the, you know, what would have been the in, inner, inner middle-class areas of the city, um, running the businesses. Um, they're the most dynamic thing in the city, really, in, some, in many ways. And, um, you know, that's, that, that's part of the story. I think a lot of you know, we, we, we were interested in racism. We were interested in those, you know, those issues. I mean, why, why certain sorts of um, extreme right, white political movements were right, were, have, have kind of popped up in Preston and Wakefield and Halifax, um, particularly um, in different ways. Um, and, uh, and, you know, certain, uh, the local dynamics leading to certain sorts of segregation dynamics, which I think of, uh, you know, if it... If if anything's fueling 
you know, a kind of polarization in a city, in a town like Halifax. It's, it's a particular sort of se social segregation of two groups that are socioeconomically very similar, but in various ways have been separated and live in different parts of the town and have, have these mutually negative views of each other. And, you know, I, you know, I, I have a fairly simple media-driven analysis of what happened in Brexit. I don't believe in it was a democratic vote. I believe it was a constructed vote by the media that Nigel Farage you know, substantially won, you know, and um, it, the British politics had shifted so far towards the kind of Farage agenda that, um, you know, was able to carry a particular sort of vote under peculiar circumstances. Um, that, to me, is not such a mystery. OK, well, we've got... Um uh, quite a lot of the questions coming in, I have to say, are questions that are really for the next session about um, public opinion rather than for, mm -hmm. for this session. So I'm going to take a couple of questions in the audience. But first, um, Tammy, just a, uh, or Matt, just a question here uh, from Dan about the bus. Uh, were any terms prominent in the language of your respondents themselves used when shown the picture of the bus? If so, what were they? Bullshit. <laughs> All right, OK. Well, you might have to do like I, the COVID I, I mean, inquiry and bleep you out for, you know, and put the X rating well, warning on you. Well, Don't would, go any further. Okay. I'll let Matt answer that question. What, what I would say to that is that, that that particular term was not used very often, but it did come out quite clearly um, for, for um, those of our respondents who started their response by almost immediately pointing out or, or stating that the, uh, the bus... Uh, was a, a quote lie, or that they distrusted it. So um, we we did note that as to an extent um, something that, that that those of our respondents who did, which was a uh, which was a large yeah. number of our respondents, that that they would sometimes say uh, BS or lies or something along those lines. So they rummed the bus straight away, did they? Sort of before the vote, they said that's them. not going to happen. That's a lie. You know, and then they said they're not taking I, I think a significant, yeah, so a significant... Or was it afterwards, it's not happened, it's not happening, we were misled? So, um, uh, so, so what our interviewees generally did, and again, we're generalising around yeah. this data, is that initially they would point out um, that they distrusted the statement on the bus. They then link that to a broad distrust of politicians in general, then what they did, which I thought was really interesting, was that they centered the conversation around themselves and their own experiences, and they developed some ideas for investment in the NHS that were different to that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, 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 that was, that was it, if I were to characterize our data, yeah. that, was what, that was the way that the interviews went. And did you get Can sense I just add to yeah. that before yeah, you ask sure. another follow-up question? One of the things that also characterised our data was that at one and the same time, people instinctively distrusted the message on the bus and wanted it to be true. So people wanted there be, to be some kind of mystical process. Obviously, they didn't use the word mystical, that's mine. By, by which leaving the EU would lead to this. And so there are, some, there are some instances in our data where people say things like, well, you know, I've seen all these foreigners queuing up the hill, up the hill meaning to the hospital. If, we, if they're not there anymore, we'll be able to see a doctor right. sooner. So they know, at, at one and the same time, the people we were talking to seemed to us, and you know, we have to be careful because this is all interpretative data, right? Um, the, to be knowing that the bus is lying, but wanting it to somehow be true. Okay. Well, very interesting, very interesting. Some it's all of, reflected yeah. on in the book, which I commend to you all. <laughs> Harvey's bus, we're now going to call this phenomenon timing. Uh, yes, let's go. Uh, Ollie's got a microphone, so I'm going to crack his right. couple I'll questions. I'll be as quick as possible. Yeah. I know a lot of people want to ask questions. So a two-pronged question. One, there are other factors. I want whether you factor them in, because before COVID, before Brexit, anything, the NHS was always short of money, always waiting lists, and that got worse, obviously, with COVID. And along with that, since COVID, we've had the war in Ukraine, the war in the Middle East, all its money is taking money away into defence and other things. So that's the first part of my question. I'm sorry, the other part is bias. 
because uh, you're all academics. I noticed from your credentials, except the New Statesman representative, which is also left wing, are all pro Remain. And I would have thought the first thing you would do would be aware of your own bias and actually have a researchers that were pro Leave as well, so 50 50, so that actually you did a a process that would allow for a more objective view, because I suspect you had no intention, even if it was true, that Brexit would be uh, in favour, a good thing for the NHS. If it was, you wouldn't say so. Thank you. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, okay, do you want to answer start? that? Where yeah, you, I'll you start by responding to that. First of all, first of all, um, one member of our team, still, I still don't know how that member of the team voted. Um, second of all, a lot of people who we collaborated with in the project um, were not probably not themselves leave voters. I mean, it, after a while, it became irrelevant, right? This is Adrian's point. Um, it became irrelevant with people. Um, but had many members of their blood family who were leave voters. I mean, if you're in the north of England, you know lots of leave voters. They're, they're your friends, they're your colleagues, they, you know, they, they're there. Um, and, you know, <laughs> Uh, it would be really great if Brexit had been good for the NHS. I'd have been super happy to find that. I'd really love to, f to find that. And in fact, I had an instance recently, we wanted to do a book launch um, in Northern Ireland, and we asked the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, could we launch the book with them? And they said, oh, well, what does the book find? And we said, well, one of the things it finds is that, unfortunately, Brexit is bad for the NHS. And they said, I'm sorry, you can't launch your book because we have to be neutral on on this thing so you know the, it's very inconvenient that brexit is bad I, it's, it's, i'd love right to though, have found Tammy, it isn't it the, right though that I'm as the gentleman saying, said that you know if you actually look at the whole range of things the nhs was troubled before the brexit vote that's one reason why that resonated because people perceived a whole bunch of problems in the nhs had we had a different migration policy some of your voters hopes that actually there will be fewer foreigners coming I mean, his government you know as we heard this morning has sort of chosen a very high immigration strategy but it didn't have to they could have uh, could have shut the doors if they'd chosen to go that direction and that actually the really the real reason the nhs has actually had very big you know injections of cash since whatever i mean if you wanted to do the sums i think you could easily make an argument they actually have had quite a lot more than 350 million quid a week. And actually their real problems are hangover of COVID, massive productivity fall, so we're actually getting very little back for that money, a long-term capital underinvestment, various things. So, you know, and in some ways, the NHS has arguably been more insulated from Brexit, from some of these other effects than, than anything else. Yeah. So, I mean, the there's a, there's a project that some of us are in, involved in that's being funded by the Health Foundation, where we're working with the Nuffield Trust, where we're trying to map the effects of Brexit and the UK's changing trade relations on the NHS. And of course, it's super difficult to disentangle the, the effects of other things. But we are trying, and the Nuffield Trust are, are really good at this kind of, as it were, dispassionate policy um, research. So there are some indicators that just do seem to be Brexit driven. So one is staffing. The, there are now fewer EU nationals, but way but more, more staff. The, uh, yes, and, and, and more way staff. more nas nationals from other parts of the world. So, you know, I mean, I don't know what, what you want to do with that. Some of the people we talked to didn't want that. They, there were people who had an aspiration for their children to work in the NHS, for example. That was one of the things, children and grandchildren. So it was kind of British jobs for people in the NHS was a, a kind of hoped for future, which is a thing in the, in the, in the policy debate. Anoush, where do you think this adds up in sort of you know, people's narrative about the NHS? How much does, you know, we expect that to be a big issue? I mean, everybody's concerned about the state of the NHS. Are people saying it was Brexit or are people just attributing it to a whole bunch of no, I mean, I, I've worked, I've done a lot of pieces on the state of the health service recently for obvious reasons because of yeah. the crisis that it's in. And it doesn't come up really as, as, as the main reason either that the public perceive it to be failing or people working within the NHS. So I know there are these workforce problems. They existed before Brexit. Um, so I think we do need to be careful about tying things um, to Brexit in particular. But I do think there's a general sense that 
nothing seems to be working properly, including, if you ask people, about Brexit. So what's quite interesting, and this is just a little bit of a tangent, is that um, <laughs> Brexit in the public consciousness is now sometimes used as a sort of, oh, you, you messed that up, didn't you? Like, hey, um, you shot yourself in the foot. So apparently kids say, some, say sometimes when they're playing football, that was a Brexit tackle, if you know. Mm. If, if, you, if you go in too hard and you end up, you know, conceding a penalty or you, you fall over your own feet. Mm. Um, that's something that we got one of my younger colleagues to check by asking around schools and stuff, and it is actually apparently <laughs> a phrase that people use. So, um, you know, there is a general sense that things are being run badly, whether that's Brexit or whether that is the NHS. So there is a link there, but I think it's the general lack of trust and feeling of frustration about why can't we get the things to work that we want in our day-to-day -day lives and why can't, when we vote for something, why can't it why can't it sort of appear in our lives in the way that we were hoping? Um, and on the question about um, sort of, you know, being a Remain journalist or, yeah, um, I, that's not how I'd identify myself, but I know the, um, the reputation of the New Statesman is a left-wing magazine and there is something uncomfortable about London-based, I was born in London, um, journalists going out around the country and saying, you, why did you decide to do this? You know, it is, it is uncomfortable, I agree with you. And that's been the bulk of my work for a while um, and hopefully I've got better at it and become more sensitive um, to those, you know, to, to those sensitivities. But um, yeah, there absolutely should be a better representation of journalism, journalists uh, in the sort of London media, I think. Adrian, are we uh, academics yeah. in, search of, uh, in search of reasons to say Brexit of has flopped? The other thing I should have said is that half our data is from Northern Ireland, where the NHS is, is in a different position, both in terms of product supply, as we heard in the last yeah. panel, and in terms of staffing, because so many people walk, work across the border. But the NHS in Northern Ireland is in much yes. bigger crisis than yes. it is, yeah. uh, even though we don't ignore it. Just, um, I think almost everybody in Northern Ireland seems to be on a waiting list. I mean, it's an absolute dire state, as David Sterling was saying in the earlier, earlier panel. Adrian, you know, well, yeah. Do these projects ref reflect a sort of anti-Brexit bias in academia, and how do you... My, my reflexive that? statement would be, I'm an e I'm EU citizen who lost their citizenship, um, and uh, from an EU point of view, it's perhaps a good thing, you know, that Britain had to leave. I mean, certainly it's good for Ireland, I think, and, um, you know, that, that would be my perspective. I do still care about the future of multi-ethnic Britain. Um, you know, what went wrong since the report of the future of multi-ethnic Britain in 2001, I think is a history worth telling. Um, and, you know, how Britain has been gripped by a kind of neo, you know, neo-nationalist colonial um, narrative, effectively, that um, has, is, you know, is, is falsifying, I think, the diversity of the country um, and, um, you know, as we heard this morning, you know, having consequences, I think, on immigration policy, you know, immigration of the worst kind in terms of policy, immigration policies of the worst, selective, divisive, you know, unfair uh, and reproducing global inequalities uh, and, you know, a, a British-centric point of view. All of this stuff, I think, has just gone horribly wrong, I think. But. Okay, well, let's go and take a, another question here yeah. and then we'll go um, around. Yeah. I come from Hessen in Germany, which is one of the richest states in Germany. It's got the financial centre. It has not got any closed down steelworks, coal mines or anything like that. In October, nearly one in five of the, of the voters in Germany voted for the alternative for Deutschland. That is the right thing. That was really quite remarkable. There is nothing left behind in Hessen not the way you see it. It's very unleft behind. So there is something about betrayals, and that is a useful word. There is something which is going on not in um, Britain in the last 10 years, not under particular governments in this country or somewhere else. It has been going on somewhere else. So this concept of betrayal and the responses to that is something which I think we need to take far more seriously than worrying about buses okay. trundling around London. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anoush, you know, I mean, how far do we pin sort of some of these dissatisfaction on Brexit because we had Brexit. That's obviously a very, very big thing, but actually that's just our thing to pin a more general sense of disillusion with politics, which is going on across the, you know, lots and lots of 
you know, quite well off European countries, because I know I was just in Germany and people are, you know, AFD, 25%, yeah. I think, in some of the polls now, um, whatever. Yeah, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because I think Brexit was kind of seen as our version of the populist spasm that's been happening yeah. in other countries around Europe. And you, and you could say yeah. that that is true because of the timing. You know, we've seen uh, the rise of those parties yeah. in various countries and, and sort of unexpected yeah. uh, election results and, and this kind of... Uh, uprising against the establishment or, or however you want to characterize it and maybe Brexit was just mm. part of that but I think it's very difficult to um, and maybe this is just because of British exceptionalism or the fact that I ha I'm Britain editor of the New Statesman have to look at it through this lens but it's difficult to untangle Brexit from the circumstances that we've had in Britain you know rubbish productivity public services that have had a lot of um, under investment you know the cuts since 2010 difficulty in workforces in, in the public sector. Um, and, uh, you know, our, we do have this multicultural society that works a lot better than some of the countries that perhaps have had some of these moments. Um, but, uh, you know, we are an island and there is this sense that our borders aren't under control because of the images that you see of people turning up on, on beaches, which, of course, is, is sort of the residual sort of Brexit issue now in our politics. Um, and so we do have some unique yeah. circumstances, I think, that um, sort of led to the Brexit vote. I don't necessarily yeah. agree with yeah. Adrian's characterisation of, of why, why we got the result <laughs> that we did in the EU referendum. Um, and I think, yes, some of those are unique to Britain and some of those, yeah. you know, form part of a pattern that we've seen in Europe and beyond. And let's go to Mike, Michael, I think, wanted to ask a question. Hope you still do, Michael. Yeah, it's, a, it's a comment as much as a question. I'm kind of responding to the gentleman's question there about sort of uh, Brexit-biased research. I think it's a really interesting and actually very important question. Um, and I want to say sort of a few things about that. The first is you know, Brexit and the impacts of Brexit are very, very difficult to disentangle. So it is complicated, yeah. so it's a valid question to ask. One of the advantages, I would argue, of academic research yeah. is that if we want to publish, we have to send our articles to academic journals where they get extensively uh, scrutinised and refereed and checked for all sorts of things, including bias, and these are typically international journals. So there's a very rigorous process, which many government publications and works don't go through that process. The second thing I would say is in my own research is very much about the economic effects of Brexit and there's lots of economists have worked on Brexit. It's very hard to find an economist that will argue that Brexit has been economically good, leave outside the politics, but the economics. I have tried to reach out to some of those economists who argue the converse and I don't even get a reply. Okay? So they don't even want to have a conversation. The final thing I would say is, you're right to worry about bias, but equally I would worry, and I'm certainly not accusing you of this, but I'm certainly accusing some of our politicians of this, of ignoring the evidence by simply saying, oh, it's just you left-leaning lot. Thank you, Michael. And there is a debate that uh, UK and Changing Europe hosted that you can watch on YouTube between some pro Leave economists, I think Julian Jessup and Graham Gudgeon, uh, debating with um, Jonathan Portes and John Springford, I think, from the Centre for European Reform, which goes into exactly exactly that. And actually probably comes up with a bit more consensus than you might expect. And I think, you know, there's a really interesting thing about, you know, Brexit as a choice, not necessarily an economic choice, which I think, you know, Nigel Farage, when he's taking leave from the jungle, would always say Brexit is worth it even if it makes you poorer because... Mm -hmm. You know, I was with a bunch of Canadians last week and I said, you might criticise us for Brexit, but none of you would vote to join the US, even though it might increase your <laughs> GDP by 4%, so don't slam us for Brexit, guys. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. I think there was someone else who wanted to ask a question. Yes, a gentleman here. Women are allowed to ask questions too, she said, rapidly. <laughs> so you. women are probably all very compliant and doing it on Slido because they're not sort of technophobes <laughs> like all the blokes in the audience. Yes. So. Thank you. Um, I was struck by the German gentleman's uh, mention of the AFD in Germany mm. and their success recently, and um, uh, Tamara's mention of uh, the evidence of somebody saying the reason we can't get into the, into the hospital mm. is because the mm. immigrants are marching mm. up the hill and they're taking all the places. And I wonder whether this left-behind narrative is actually a settled academic consensus now, because in America, mm for the 2016 election, it was settled and then it became unsettled when um, surveys dug down into the attitudes of the voters of the people who voted for Trump and for Hillary. 
and discovered, essentially, it was only secondarily about um, economic questions, and it was much, much more about racism and misogyny mm -hmm. in that case. And racism, it's sort of not really mentioned much in Brexit, but I think it's in there somewhere, and I think maybe we should be more open about talking about it. Adrian, this is one of the things you've been looking at, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, I, that, that was a point I was, mm. I've been trying to mm. make uh, in, a, in a series of, of points. So, um, um, you know, I do, I do think that uh, there is a direct relationship between Brexit and this particular kind of um, historical narrative that one can trace from um, the early New Labour years, really, and, and what happened in New Labour. Um, as it got cold feet, really, about the anti-racist uh, and what was, you know, an emerging decolonial agenda at that point. Um, that agenda is back now, but it's now back in, in, in a different sort of scenario where it's, you know, competing with, you know, a different sort of dominant mainstream. Um, so, yeah, I would invite, you know, invite people to look at, at, at look at the look at the, that particular <coughs> angle. I think of 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 the story. Tell me, Matt, anything to say on... I mean, we, we heard a fair amount of racism, but we also heard a lot of not racism. So it's quite difficult to generalise from our data on this point. I think what we did try to do, and this comes back to the point about there's, there's, there's bias and there's accusations of bias, and then there's taking narratives that are fairly widespread and trying to take them seriously and trying to put them to the test. And that's what I felt we were trying to do with our research. The narrative being left behind communities voted for Brexit because they wanted investment in the NHS. Mm -hmm. We wanted to put that to the test. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the criticisms that you could, that we had lots of criticisms aimed at our work during the review process, mm -hmm. as Tammy knows, and I know, after spending so long doing the review, the revising. Um, one criticism could be that you know we're showing people a picture of this bus. We're actually spreading the picture of the bus and <laughs> and, and reinforcing it. Are we somehow reinforcing the narrative doing that? You know that that's what elite queuing research yeah. shows, right? Yeah. And people tend to take on board elite queues. So is that what we're doing? I kind of thought afterwards, oh maybe that. I oh, don't know. <laughs> um, so I think it's very easy to reinforce. Um, the, these narratives, but I think what academic research does and what we're trying to do is to, to kind of put them, put them to the test. Yeah. Um, so did we, you get, we had one yeah. person who, who's, who said, um, when the conversation went in this direction, oh, no, no, I can't, I can't possibly say to you what, what I really think. You, you'll get me arrested. You know, she, and she genuinely, and so Matt had to reinforce that, you know, we, we're not taking any identity, we don't know who you are, and we are humble academics, we have no power to get you arrested for any, you know, you know views that, that you, you might have. So there, what, that, that idea was definitely there in some of our conversations. Just, just a question from Mike Cashman, did you get any sense of um, what I think we at UKIS are calling regret among your voters who thought that this would be good for the NHS and now realised it wouldn't, or do they just, you know, I is think, it just sort of blame for Boris Johnson? I think an important, important part of the data is that because we collected it in 2019, yeah. Brexit hadn't actually officially happened at that point. Mm. Yeah, so, in a way, so, so, so it was within the action. Yeah. <laughs> we had a couple, we, we, I, from memory, we didn't have very many people who who expressed explicit regret, mainly because they yeah. probably yeah. because they didn't quite know what the outcome All was. Right. Could so I respond yeah. quickly on Anish. that? I'm, I'm far less polite than Matt and Tammy, and I do ask people when I'm talking to them yeah. um, whether they voted Leave or Remain. And it's amazing now how many people will say they don't want to tell me, um, mm -hmm. and I, I interpret that as as they mean that they voted to leave and they they feel slightly abashed about it, not to. You know, not to speak for them, but it, it's often sort of that's often the um, the subtext of what they're saying, and I think that's quite interesting on the on the regret side of things. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to ask one last question, and then let everybody who didn't get Ollie to get them a coffee from outside to <laughs> be allowed to go for coffee. I find it very weird not to have coffee with lunch. Um, so we have a question, uh, which you might all say is a totally unfair question. Uh, Brexit is not going to. Brexit does not seem to be on the agenda for the election, reversal of Brexit, rejoining, not there. Nonetheless, uh, we've got a question saying, 
does your research any suggest any sort of advice to policymakers as they approach an election year? Is there anything that they ought to bear in mind from your research to inform them that uh, that actually will be useful to thinking about how they position themselves or how they deal with some of these concerns or whatever? Adrian, anything from your research that policymakers, you know, and in the spirit of non-partisanship um, of any and all parties might want to bear in mind based on your material? You're allowed to say no. Sure. I mean, I, you know, I'd probably, I'd probably answer this by reinforcing, um, I think, a message uh, Dan, Dan Wincott would also um, endorse that the you know, this, this is, there, there is a fundamental question about um, the political system in Britain, uh, excessive centralization, excessive focus on the, the politico media academic yeah. games of the southeast of England, uh, lack, you know, a real, real lack of um, federalist type structures in the UK. And, and you know, the, the, the hard edge of, of our research was was dealing with the absolutely difficult conditions under which local authorities yeah. in the north were working, um, and and just how 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 that showed up so much during COVID. I mean, just they, they were absolutely necessary to the the responses yeah. against COVID. And did, and did people feel more sort of political efficacy if they had a you know a big figure mayor or if they knew their local council? You know, I mean, is one of your prescriptions actually devolve more? Yeah, because that is one of the things that's on the I'm agenda. Sure it's being, yeah, de the devolution really is necessarily happening in the in the you know the right the right ways. I mean, I think okay. it's been used as a political football. Okay. Um, okay. It's very know, it's a very centralist yeah. version of devolution. I have to say. Yeah. Tell me, Matt. Any, any? Matt first, then me. Okay, no. so. <laughs> um, I guess ambition for the NHS so w w was one of the key themes we identified. Ambition in the sense that people actually took their everyday experience and almost supersized it to yeah. say, I think there should be more doctors and nurses, there should be more investment in, in, in health services. Um, yeah. Not because they were confident in politicians and politics, though. Well they really fund the long-term workforce plan, yeah, NHS yeah. is going to absorb mm -hmm. most of GDP, as far as you can see. Tammy. Yes. Uh, okay, some advice. Uh, Northern Ireland is different. Yeah. Do not forget that Northern Ireland is different. That's one thing, definitely, that our research shows. Um, honest pu public conversations about the pros and cons of different relationships with the EU are not happening, and they could happen. Okay. Um, yeah, so that, that's about the regulatory alignment type things. It's about migra human migration that we need for certain things, that, that kind of thing. Um, two more. Uh, it's about relative experiences rather than absolute ones. So people's memories of what it was like in the good old days matter. People's relative thoughts about what it's like in the south of England compared to the north of England, those things matter. And then the last one is data is really important, but stories matter too. Anoush, final, final word, any sort of take outs from this? From whatever you're going to promise to people, try, try and do it. <laughs> because there's been a lot of broken promises and it's really bad for our politics. Okay, well, that's a great point to end. So can I thank you all for uh, listening to our panel. Thanks to the panel very much for their contributions, for the interesting research. Thanks to everybody online for their questions. Thanks to people in the room. Uh, for asking questions. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Anna.
John Curtis from the University of Strathclyde and Sophie Stowers from, from UK and a Changing Europe. Uh, we're going to start with a couple of presentations from Sarah and then Meg and then take it from there. As ever, if you can use the Slido and if you can vote for the questions that you want me to pose to the panellists, that will make my life a lot easier. I mean, I'll probably mess up, but we can try. Sarah. Thank you, Alan. I don't, I'm not sure I quite address the what do people want if it's what they wanted out of the referendum. Rather, um, what I look at in this project, which was generously funded by the ESRC and UK in a Changing Europe, which has been running now since um, the end of, since the, well, since the outcome of the vote, is really what has happened to British politics in the last seven years. Um, and what we were particularly interested in, James Tilley, uh, my co-author, who's professor at the University of Oxford and I, is the way in which Brexit divided society. Not just in terms of, you know, people voted different ways, but how that has reverberated in British society in the past seven years. And in a sense asking, is that now over? Have we all forgotten about Brexit? Obviously not those of us in this room, but people uh, on the street and so on. And for those of you who were there in the last panel, you would have seen a very fascinating qualitative research. And this, is, this research here is more based on, on our rep national representative surveys um, so, in a sense, we could say, why do we have a panel on, on Brexit, Brexit seven, seven years, years later? later? It's not very salient anymore, as you will see in the population. This is uh, from Ipsos Mori, uh, going back to 2006, looking at how uh, salient Brexit was to the public. Was it uh, one of the most important issues? One of the interesting things is that people didn't care much about the EU until they were told to have a vote on it. This was not a kind of bottom-up groundswell. Then they started caring a great deal and continued to do so in the years after. And it has now, with the pandemic and the cost of living crisis, gone back to a kind of uh, very low level equilibrium. But what we are finding in our research is that even though people are not, it's not top of their minds, there's still been some things that have remained uh, with Brexit. Uh, and part of that is the way in which people started identifying uh, because of how they voted and because of how they saw uh, the outfall and the aftermath of Brexit. And you'll be familiar with these terms of Remainers and Leavers or Remainers and Brexiteers. And I was just looking through some newspaper headlines for the last few months. And you can see it's still there. So Brexit is not salient, but people are still, you know, David Cameron comes back. What do we think about David Cameron? Well, uh, he's a Remainer. Uh, that's how he was portrayed, especially in the more uh, Eurosceptic press. Um, similarly, uh, uh, Brexiteers outrage uh, at the last night of the proms, leavers and remainers. So, so it's very much still there. And that's part of what we look at in our research, are these, the emergence of this new kind of political identity around how you voted in the referendum and what that means to people. And we argue that this, is, this was, uh, and just for many people still is, a kind of social and political identity. In other words, it's not just an attitude, oh, you know, I... I um, uh, I voted this way and, you know, I might disagree with someone who voted differently. It's also how people describe themselves and importantly how they see people on the other side. We find that people still have quite, people who identify as either Remainers or Leavers have quite strong opinions on the other side. So there's what uh, uh, political scientists, for example, in the US call effective polarization. So it's not just about disagreeing on the policies, it's about having an emotional attachment to your in-group and feeling hostility towards the out-group. So those people who disagree with me, they're just uh, uh, bad people. I, I won't, I will, I'll show you some of the words that people use to describe uh, the other side. And so what we've done is we've tracked um, in various different ways, I'll just show you a snapshot here, uh, the last, um, since the aftermath of the referendum, whether or not people think of themselves as leavers or remainers or neither. And here you can see the top blue line there are those two grouped together. And you can see it's still about three quarters of people even today. And I must say I'd expected this to sort of fall off rather quicker than it has, uh, given that as we've seen it's not so salient. But, but uh, most people still will identify as either. The, the drop in levers has been um, a little bit quicker. What's also interesting is we always compare with partisan identities the same kind of question on whether you feel as a Labour supporter or a Conservative. And there are more people willing to identify as a Lever or a Remainer 
than there are Labour or Conservative. And also, they say that these identities are more strongly held, um, or which is very interesting. Now, what we also did is we gave people a chance uh, um, to describe the other side. So if you think of people who identify as leavers, remainers, what kind of people are they? How would you describe them open-ended? Now, uh, I didn't pick out the worst bits. Uh, uh, this is uh, the, the, the most dominant category. So this is open-ended uh, uh, answers that we then uh, uh, categorized uh, in the most uh, dominant. And you can see there, remainers view of leavers, the most common is they're easily influenced, gullible and uneducated, xenophobic and racist, short-sighted, sheep fools, so on. And you'll see that leavers think about the same things of remainers, misguided fools, entitled idiots, short-sighted sheep, bad losers, a bit scared of change, undemocratic. And then you can see there's some more kind of demographic characteristics that are a bit more, less common. Remainers think leavers are more right-wing, older, and which is, I guess, Broadly correct, certainly older, uh, and leavers think remainers are more left wing, more middle class, which I guess also broadly uh, is sort of, but that's not the dominant. The dominant is this kind of, I think, quite hostile language, you will agree, when they're not encouraged to say nasty things, they could have said a lot of things, you know. Uh, and, and I think that partly reflects this kind of outgroup hostility that the, not just the referendum, but really the aftermath of the referendum gave rise to. And we have a lot of, of research uh, showing that. Now, just a kind of final word, and now that you know, people still identify as this, but does that matter given that it's not salient? We're coming into an election season. People care about other things. They care about the economy. They care about healthcare. They don't care about the EU. The referendum is done. So how does it matter? And I think there's a couple of ways in which this might still matter. One thing is here is a question on who do you think is to blame for the economy? For people who say that economic conditions are poor, which are the majority of people, not surprisingly, you can see Remainers are much more likely, in fact, on a scale from one to 10, they overwhelmingly think Brexit is to blame uh, and much less likely for Libra. So I translate like that. Um, so just on finally here, I think what our research over these past sort of seven years in the aftermath of Brexit have shown is that Brexit, not only attitudes, but identities have been surprisingly sticky compared to what we normally see in policy agreement. And part of that is really that people started to identify with these groups. There has been some realignment, which meant that leave and remain identities are now closer to partisan uh, uh, identities. Um, but, and also what we've seen is that neither of the major parties, particularly Labour, are very keen to talk about Brexit, so that also lowers the temperature. Yet, um, what we're seeing though is that these Brexit identities still exist for most people, and especially for kind of people who are politically interested, and that means that they can be mobilised in various ways if that is in the interest of politicians. So one, just one example of how they may be mobilized is, for example, let's say if the Conservatives were to run a campaign on leaving the European Convention on Human Rights, that would be a way of getting some of the same underlying uh, feelings and identities potentially mobilized. As it stands, it's not uh, the major political issues, but the sort of reverberations of what happened to Brexit uh, is still there in society. So I'll end it there, thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm here to just give some results from uh, our project at University College London, uh, which is the Democracy in the UK After Brexit project. I have to say I'm not here to talk about Brexit and attitudes to Brexit. This was a project about literally governance after Brexit. Brexit changed our governance arrangements and the Brexit process also made issues of governance very, very controversial. So what did the public think about the way they wanted to be governed after Brexit? We did three things. Oh, I didn't realize it had these clicks. Um, we ran two large-scale surveys um, and a citizens' assembly, which we called the Citizens' Assembly on Democracy in the UK. This allows us to combine kind of knee-jerk responses in surveys with more considered, deliberated uh, thoughts in a citizens' assembly. The assembly was, as it says there, uh, a representative group of 67 people, representative across demographics, also across uh, political affiliations, including the Brexit divide, and it met for six weekends uh, in late 2021. 
Notably, the surveys, look at the dates there, our most recent survey is nearly a year and a half old now, and it was done after Johnson had been brought down, uh, but he hadn't yet been replaced. Um, I'm just going to try and whiz through some real top-level findings from each of these. Each of these are already on our website, and our final report is due to be published on Thursday, combining the whole lot. So what overall do we find? Just in a single slide, um, four things really here in terms of the results. Um, high levels of dissatisfaction with the way that democracy is working in the UK, and a demand for higher ethical standards in politics, more checks and balances within our political system so that power isn't concentrated in the hands of the government, and a dissatisfaction with the extent to which public, the public's voices are heard. But um, not that much desire to actually get involved, as, as I'll show you. Um, it was interesting that despite the different uh, collection methods for our data, um, the two methods came up with some very similar results. And because of being on the panel here with Sara, I thought I'd put in some splits on uh, Leave Remain, which are quite interesting. This is a very uh, familiar question on satisfaction with democracy in the UK. You haven't actually got the overall there, but if you look at male and female at the top, they're very similar. Um, so people tend to be more dissatisfied uh, in the pink than satisfied uh, in the orange, and very few say that they are very satisfied. Um, if you look at differences on this slide, you see, and this is well known, more satisfaction among the older generations than the younger. But perhaps this is of more interest in this context. Um, if you look at the uh, Brexit divide, you see that it's actually the people who voted for Leave in 2016 who are more satisfied at the moment with the state of our democracy than the people who voted Remain. And you see quite a lot of similarity between the Leave Remain and the uh, conservative and opposition voting people uh, on party allegiance in 2019. Here's what the Citizens' Assembly said about the state of democracy. Uh, at the final weekend, we offered them a list of positive and negative words so that they could choose to um, pin to how they felt about democracy, and they could also choose their own words. And what you see there is there are some words, hopeful, optimistic, that do come up that are relatively positive, but it is overwhelmingly a negative view that people on the Citizens' Assembly had of democracy. Um, in terms of trust, these are also fairly familiar type of questions. We asked about the Prime Minister, Parliament, the Civil Service, and the court system. This was Boris Johnson both times. Um, and what you see is that trust in the Prime Minister, very low, distrust, very high, uh, Parliament rather similar, the Civil Service doing a bit better, and the court system doing best of all. So that's, that's, that's an interesting thing, I think. If you look at the um, leave-remain divide, though, you see there is a lot of division between uh, these two groups. Um, so 29% of uh, former leave voters trusted the Prime Minister compared to 11% of Remain supporters. And leave supporters have much less trust in the civil service and the courts than do former Remain voters. Perhaps not that surprising. Um, one question that we asked that got a very strong response was this, about uh, whether it's important to democracy for politicians to follow the rules or to get things done. In the Johnson context, you see overwhelming support for following the rules, and there's no room there, really, for a Brexit divide. Uh, that was pretty much a unanimous view across that divide. This one, though, you do see a bit more of a divide. Um, there was a, a frightening poll in 2018 done by the Hansard Society asking people whether they wanted a strong leader who was willing to break the rules, and over 50% of people said they did. Uh, then maybe they got one. And having had one, this is, these are our polling results that people actually decided this was a very bad idea. So uh, the number there is for not at all acceptable, and you see that 47% of people on a 10-point scale think it's not acceptable to have a leader uh, who, who uh, doesn't have to bother with parliament and elections. There is a bit of a divide here. Uh, leavers, it was 43%. Remainers, it was 66%. Um, but overall, not much demand for a strong leader. Um, quickly on the other things. Honesty and integrity, we gave people pairwise comparisons on what they wanted in politicians, and overwhelmingly, they wanted people who were, who were honest and who would own up when they made mistakes. Uh, maybe not the prime minister. Um, in terms of ethical standards, we asked them whether we, they thought politicians, business people, or ju and judges had higher or lower ethical standards than ordinary people. You see that politicians and business people do very badly. 
judges actually do rather well. Um, and on this, surprisingly, there was very little leave remain divide. Um, here, uh, people wanted a much stronger process for um, enforcing integrity on politicians, and again, no leave remain divide. Um, at the end of the Citizens' Assembly, they voted on a series of resolutions, and one which comes across very strongly is the desire for stronger regulation of ethical standards. Um, turning quickly to checks and balances, um, again, uh, the Citizens' Assembly very much wanted uh, a stronger parliament against government, and we see very similar things on the survey. Um, government should be strengthened on the left, parliament should be strengthened on the right. Many more people wanting parliament than government to be strengthened, although there is a leave remain divide. Um, maybe I'll skip over this because I'm going to be short of time. Um, the House of Lords is the thing that's closest, that's one of the things that's close to my heart. Um, even uh, leavers were not at all keen on the Prime Minister having the right to decide who went into the House of Lords. Uh, <laughs> on the courts, this is also interesting given the uh, recent controversies, the Citizens' Assembly was very keen on empowering the courts. You've seen that people trust the courts. Um, in the surveys, um, when we ask whether judges have an important role in keeping politicians within the rules or whether politicians should keep themselves within the rules, much more support for the judges than for the politicians, although again, there is a leave-remain divide, which slightly tilts the other way among leavers. Um, if you ask whether they should have m the judges should have more powers than they currently do, the Citizens' Assembly came up very powerfully in favour of that, and actually so did the survey. Um, there's, a, there's quite a lot of support, although again there's a leave-remain divide, for judges actually having a stronger role than they do now. Um, my final point was uh, participation in politics, uh, where again, as I said, there's a... Um, there's, there's a very strong feeling that the public are not sufficiently heard in politics. Uh, you can see that very clearly there. 1% of people saying that, uh, uh, that the public has too much power. Um, but if you ask people whether they want to get more involved, it's very striking that they don't. And the people who most don't are leavers at 64% and conservatives at 65%. And one final slide, perhaps, oh, I'll skip that. One final slide, in, in, uh, which is interesting uh, in the light of recent debates, uh, is that um, the Citizens' Assembly came out very strongly in defense of people's right to protest, which was that this finding and the finding on the courts we were not necessarily expecting. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Meg. <laughs> right, Sophie, there's loads there. Where do you want to start? <laughs> Well, I thought I would kind of think about what Sarah and Meg said through sort of the lens of some polling that we did with Public First um, earlier this year, which looked at what leavers think of um, Brexit, how it's gone so far, and kind of the phenomenon of regret and what that actually means in practice. And I think the thing that stood out initially most in that poll was the decline in salience that Sarah talked about. I think it's quite interesting to see just how much we've moved to a situ situation where what was kind of the defining issue of the day at the last election, um, not just in terms of you know what dominated debates, but in terms of how voters were fragmented in their voting patterns, has gone to something that is um, of such little importance, according to polling, and what people say will decide their vote at the next election. Um, and that is something that came through quite a lot in our polling with Public First, particularly when you know you ask people in a sort of headline question if there was another referendum how would you vote quite quite a lot is made of kind of the shift towards rejoin slash remain in that question but actually when we sort of got under the skin of that question in focus groups by asking kind of slightly more lengthy questions and surveys we actually found that a lot of people said there was just no appetite for that they weren't really interested that if you're asking them kind of binary decision they will take one but there's not actually um, the appetite amongst even quite a lot of leavers who think it's going badly, who've switched their vote, they're just not quite um, interested in having another referendum. Um, and I think that also comes across in the fact that when we asked about what we kind of called the tangible effects of Brexit, so things like uh, cost, uh, an increase in food prices, uh, staff shortages, and um, travel delays, things like that, um, 
people didn't tie it solely to Brexit, no matter if they voted Leave or Remain in 2016, they would often cite a sort of variety of factors. They would cite Ukraine, the pandemic, the choices of the current government. Um, so people aren't sort of drawing as direct a line to leaving the EU and these more tangible consequences um, as they might have a few years ago. And I think the other thing to just tie a bit to what Meg said was um, the apathy that we saw amongst a lot of people who we talked to and who we surveyed, both leavers and remainers. Um, there was a lot of sort of anger towards politicians um, when we talked to them. And what was quite interesting is that a lot of the leavers in particular were angry, not because they feel lied to or that they weren't told the truth, but because they think that the politicians that were put in charge of delivering Brexit were ineffective. And that is the reason why we're in the situation that we are now. That's why they haven't got the type of Brexit they wanted. Um, and they do think in different political circumstances then they could you know, achieve the outcome that they voted for in 2016. And that also comes across in the fact that when we ask people, you know, do you think this will work out well in the long run? A lot of leavers, including leavers who said Brexit was going badly, including those who said they would remain in a referendum, do you think it will probably all turn out OK in the end? And I think you see that also in the fact that people's evaluations of how we or well Brexit is doing is quite often not much to do with the decision to leave the EU itself. So we see that when the economy is, or when people perceive the economy to be doing better, their evaluations of how Brexit is going are better. So it's quite kind of fluid, those evaluations. So it's quite hard to kind of, you know, get an answer out of them of what political circumstances will make Brexit work, but they don't see it as a foregone conclusion and um, so they were sort of the the way i think our survey linked into what megan sarah said real thanks sophie john okay I mean, last but not least let me make one point in response to each of the two interesting presentations um meg talked interestingly about their uh, results on <laughs> attitudes towards democracy though i think as she acknowledged at one point we're kind of going, well, to what extent are the answers the product of their time? But they're not entirely. Um, one of the things that Will Jennings has picked up, we've also picked up on British social attitudes, is the way in which the relationship between Euroscepticism and those demographic factors that are associated with Euroscepticism, like lower levels of education, that that relationship, the relationship between that and people's attitudes, well, trusting politicians, perceptions of the political system was changed as a result of Brexit. So if you go back up to until the EU referendum, basically uh, Europhiles and graduates tended to be more trusting of politicians and government than were Eurosceptics and those with less than the way of educational qualifications. The delivery of Brexit reversed that relationship. But of course, the fact that it did so also means that we have to be very cautious about how we interpret these questions about trust in government, etc., etc. And Meg knows I will say this because I've said it before in a different context, which is, you know, the honest truth is, although we sometimes try very hard on surveys, you know, leave aside your partisan preference, etc., etc., etc. At the end of the day, people's attitudes towards the way in which democracy runs or questions about that are influenced about what they think is substantive, substantively being delivered or would be delivered if we change things. And to that extent, at least while we as political scientists are very, very interested in what are people's conceptual understanding of and reactions to democracy as a system, I'm not entirely sure that that's the way in which large members of the public see it. So uh, that's not to say we shouldn't be doing what we're doing, because I think you know, there's a lot of the stuff about wanting checks and balances, although I think you know, the other thing to bear in mind is Parliament was really strong in 2019. The public did not like it. So there's a, there's a question of whether or not actually... But it was strong and gridlocked. Uh, yeah, oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. Yes, of course. And uh, maybe that's the problem. But certainly... Trust in politics fell quite markedly in 2019 in the middle of that whole uh, stushi. So, OK. Um, uh, Sarah knows that I agree with most of what she says. But let me, I think it would be useful, and in particular, I think the, the thing that you need to understand about the level of identification 
with Remain and Leave. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's a wonderful story of the limitations of political science. So political science spends 20, 30 years talking about the decline of affective attachment and emotions don't matter in our politics anymore. And then all of a sudden, along comes Brexit and the reported strength of identification and prevalence of identification with um, uh, Remain and Leave takes us back to the 1960s. The level, the portion of people who say they are strong Remainers and strong Leavers is exactly what you find in the British election study of the 1960s, uh, but with reference to Conservative and Labour. So it just goes to show that, you know, you can construct all these wonderful uh, theoretical arguments as to why, you know, emotion is less important in politics. And then all of a sudden, something happens and all that theory begins to look, you know, rather, rather suspect. Point one. Point two, I think there is an important distinction. And it refers, this also refers to Sophie's comments as well. And this is a common mistake in the study of electoral behaviour. I well remember having long arguments with Howard Clark about this. And that is that you need to distinguish between the flux and the structure. If I were trying to explain to people, as I periodically am asked to do, why the Conservatives are 20 points behind in the polls, I can probably explain 18 of those 20 points with reference to anything but Brexit. It would be Boris Johnson and Partygate. It would be Liz Truss and economics. It would be the cost of living crisis. These are all things that have changed the absolute level of support for the parties. Okay. Though there is a little bit of a relationship with Brexit, people who've changed their minds on Brexit are more likely to have defected from the Conservatives, just like that many of them. But in many respects, the structure of party support has not changed as much. Now, it has changed in one respect. The Boris Johnson's success in 2019 rested not on the fact that the majority of people were in favour of Brexit. It was probably already the case by 2019 that that was no longer true, but rested on the fact that 80% of Leave voters voted for the Conservatives, not Leave voters, people who at that point were in favour of Brexit voted for the Conservatives, um, whereas the Remain vote was fragmented. That Leave coalition has been fractured. Not, nece not necessarily because of people's attitudes towards Brexit, although they say it's part of it. It's just that everything else that this Brexit delivering government has done is regarded so uh, negatively that therefore this coalition has collapsed. But, but, if you look at the Remain side, right? So back in 2019, around 80% of people who were in favour of Brexit voted for pro. Uh, Brexit parties and around 80% of people who were opposed to uh, Brexit one voted for parties who were willing to have a second referendum. It's just that the, the second group was more fragmented. Now, on the Leave side, you know, the numbers are down and the Leave coalition is fractured. But on the Remain side, it is still the case that just over 80% of people uh, who currently say that they're in favour of being inside the European Union are saying they will vote for Labour, Liberal Democrat, SNP, Green or Plaid Cymru. The structuring is still there. And what that also means, and this is one of the delicious paradoxes of where we're at, is that despite, despite Sir Keir Starmer's best endeavours, the structuring of the Labour Party vote in particular, with reference to people's attitudes towards Brexit, is almost exactly the same now as it was four years ago. Yes, it is true. The Labour Party, relatively speaking, has gained ground amongst those people who voted Leave in 2016. That is true. However, one has already suggested a chunk of those people who, have mo who voted Leave in 2016, who voted Conservative in 2019, who would now vote Labour, no longer believe in Brexit. They say they would vote to uh, rejoin. What? So, that, so the Leave voters that Labour have got are not typical Leave voters. One. Two, because in line with the movement of the public as a whole, which is now around 57, 58% in favour of rejoining, that 10% swing in favour of being part of the EU, which has occurred amongst the public in general since 2016, is also evident amongst those people who voted for Labour in 2019. So the people who voted for Labour in 2019 are now more anti-Brexit than they were in 2019. And then, of course, the third thing is that the young people who couldn't vote in 2016, yeah. they're overwhelmingly pro-Labour and they're overwhelmingly opposed to Brexit. And indeed, if you actually look at 
uh, you know, the, the arithmetic of why we've got to 57 or 58. Actually, it, is, it has always been that second group, the people who did not vote in 2016, who are absolutely fundamental to understanding why we are uh, uh, where we are. So therefore, as a result, you actually do the arithmetic. Labour Party's vote is about 75% a pro-EU vote. It's down on the 82% of 2019, but it's still very heavily structured. So the point is, I'm not arguing that the Labour Party have gained anything as a result of Brexit or whatever, but the point is, I mean, the, the, the crucial point is that Labour's presumption, Labour's presumption that they could not get into an election-winning position without fundamentally changing the character of their support vis-a-vis -vis Brexit has been demonstrated to be false. Why? One, Boris Johnson, and two, Liz Truss. They are the people who have ensured that Labour have been, or have got themselves in an election-winning position without Labour actually succeeding in fundamentally changing the character of the Brexit vote because they've just been able to take in Remainers and Leavers and all, Uncle Tom Cobley and all, who have uh, flocked away from the Conservatives, not to do with Brexit, but because of the other problems they've had in the last four years. Let me just ask you one question, because I don't want to make, I want to come back to our presenters, but you did all that without mentioning Jeremy Corbyn once. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, uh, uh, Starmer got his, got his party into a position where he was capable of profiting from um, the Conservatives' difficulties. But, you know, if, if you look at the time, I mean, it's been a very, very peculiar parliament, and everybody forgets that until December 2021, the Conservatives were never, ever consistently behind Labour in the polls. Mm. And basically, there are two crucial periods. Conservative support falls by six points in the immediate wake of the revelations over Partygate, and it falls by another six points in the wake of Liz Truss. Add to that a, also a deep economic pessimism that creeps in uh, during 2022. And, right. So sure, L Labour got themselves a position where they could profit from, mm -hmm. and in intriguingly, it is Labour that have profited, and it is not the Liberal Democrat mistake or not going on Brexit. And one of the reasons why Labour have been able to, uh, I mean, another reason why Labour's vote is still so pro-EU is they've taken a whole bunch of Remainers off the Liberal Democrats. Yeah. Right? So, um, <coughs> but, but um, so, you know, uh, the Liberal Democrats have, despite being the traditional party of protest, and despite now have been quite some distance in the coalition, despite the fact that they can do well in parliamentary by-elections, they have not made any significant progress in terms of their national standing in the opinion polls, despite being faced with a Conservative government that, you know, is in deep, deep trouble. Perfect. Thank you. Sara, just to start with, I've got hundreds of questions here. We're not going to get through them all, but I'll do my best. One question for you is whether the identities you spoke about are partly attributable to a world where we have social media, which changes the language, which changes the speed of response to things. I mean, it's an impossible question to answer, but I'm going to ask you it anyway. I mean, does, does social media change the way these, these, these identities develop, how strong they become, how entrenched they become? Um, I was, first of all, so in, 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 in response to what John said, of course, it's not that we haven't had strong political identities in the world without social media. You know, John yeah. exactly yeah. mentioned, you know, strong partisan identity in the 60s. So just as a sort of reference, sometimes we think we're living in unique times mm -hmm. with effectively polarised, and, you know, this country, other countries have been effectively polarised without it. But I do have some, some evidence on it because what we did do is we ran a a representative, national representative survey, and we could link it because we asked people for their social media profiles. So what I have evidence on is not sort of, is are those people, for example, who discuss these things on Twitter, are they different? And you will not be surprised that they are more polarized on the issue. Uh, they are more hostile. Again, that's not, but so in a sense, if that is the world in which you live, the kind of people who express their views openly tend to be more, uh, extreme leavers and remainers tend to be both in their sort of attitudes when we survey them, but also in their behavior. So in that sense, um, what we see is that when we, the people who engage more on social media, i.e. the people who express themselves when you compare to a sort of nationally representative sample are more. So that would suggest that kind of when we inhabit that world, uh, we are exposed certainly to that kind of more extreme views because those are the people who, who go out there and express them. So in that sense, yes. But again, it is not, you know, having strong social and political identities are not unique to our time of social media. Okay. I mean, you two just chip in whenever, okay? Because I'm going to... Well, I mean, the obvious issue is what's cause and what's effect, yeah. right? Okay. 
And, 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 and part of my feeling often about social media is that we now simply have a digital trace of the kind of social intercourse that was going on anyway. I mean, the, the one qualification to that, of course, is that um, the communities in which we engage are no longer geographically bounded. That's, that, that's the change. But, you know, I mean, people now sometimes hold their hands up in horror about the terrible views that are expressed on social media. I mean, they've obviously never been down to the dog and duck. <laughs> you know. What makes you think that people were, were wondrously socially liberal before um, social media came along? But they're probably less directly rude to each other in person, you'd like to think, than they are on Twitter. Oh, sure, but, but, but sure, but there are plenty of opportunities to talk about other people who are not part of the social circle of which, I mean, you know, given, so given, for, so let's imagine me a world without social media, right? Given the very strong demographic division between Remainers and Leavers, and also the strong ideological division, you know, these are people who will tend to talk to each other. Yeah. Right? In terms, of normal, in terms of normal discourse, which is part of the reason why, you know, all the remain, remain uh, loving commentary out in London failed to realise what was going on underneath their feet because they were talking to each other and going, oh, no, no, of course, no, no, you aren't going to win, you know, you needed to get out out there. Because, but the point is, communities were already talking to each other and getting a misperception of what the way in which the world was going. And, and one of the things on the, on the cause and effect, because that's... Yeah. Point is one of the things we did in our project was to randomize people into groups right. um, where either they didn't know that they were only with people like them, which is, as you're pointing out, John, increasingly certain with the remain leave divide, people often meet other people like them, for example, if they're at universities in London, or a mixed group. So we didn't reveal to them, but then we saw at the end, first of all, we looked at the debate, but also whether or not they disliked the other side more. Yeah. And actually when they were, and that also builds some sort of the research shown in the previous session, when they were exposed to people who felt differently than them, they liked the other side more. Sure. Could have gone either way, you know, could also have thought, oh God, what do people have views <laughs> like that? And on the contrary, when they were just with people with the same political identities like them, then they really hated the other side even more afterwards. Because so, so that was a kind of partly showing that these sort of echo chambers, to the extent that our society is divided into them, can have these sort of, they can exacerbate some of these divides. I was just thinking what fun we could have with Jonathan Paul says if Twitter was real life. Think of the fights he'd get into. But, uh, <laughs> so Meg, I mean, th there's a question here about trust in politics. And, I suppose, just to sum it up, I mean, have we ever had trust in politics? Is trust in politics now noticeably lower than it was, say, in 2008, at the time of the financial crisis, or 2009 with MPs' expenses? I mean, we just, have we just not been bumping along the bottom for quite a while now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, this, this, this might lead into me saying two things that I should have said uh, in the presentation if I hadn't been rushing so much. One is, uh, I'm not a public opinion person, really. Uh, and this project was led by my colleague, Professor Alan Rennick, who did the vast, uh, the, the vast majority of the work mm -hmm. on it. I was a co-I on it. And with uh, great thanks to John here, who was on the advisory committee for the project. And I know provided lots of unhelpful advice. <laughs> lots of very useful advice. And he's actually much better qualified than me to answer this question. In our, in our fourth and final report, which we publish uh, on Thursday, um, there is a little bit of analysis of this. I mean, I think the... The stuff about the timing of these questions is in many ways, and John's already alluded to mm. this, really, really crucial to interpreting them and in many ways makes it quite difficult to interpret them. Because on the one hand, you know, you've got uh, Johnson was prime minister and everybody was concerned about honesty and rule breaking at mm. exactly the time when we were asking our, our questions. You know, how would, they, how would they answer those questions now? Has it dropped off their agenda? We don't know without asking them again. And then the, uh, the other thing, you know, you, it's, it's, it's interesting to draw attention to the leave remain divide, but as John has also just indicated, that, is, that maps quite strongly onto the conservative labor divide. And of course the conservatives are in power, so leavers are less keen on checks and balances than remainers are, but if it's a labor government, then will leavers suddenly be very keen on checks and balances? Yeah. And we can't know the answer to that either. In the report we do um, speculate a bit on uh, trust and where it's gone, but I think I, on the detail I would pass to John because he carries much more of this in his head, but the basic answer is no, trust hasn't uh, historically mm. been high. These are not wildly out of step, these results, with, you know, it fluctuates a bit, trust dipped, the time of the expenses crisis recovered a bit, 
So it comes and goes, but John knows this data much yeah, better than uh, I do. Yeah, I mean, I've already referred to some of it, more recent stuff. So, I mean, uh, trust it did take a hit from which it never really recovered uh, during the John Major government. I mean, Sleaze did, and it's not just the Sleaze incident itself, but it's also the fact that ever since, the politicians can't stop themselves from attacking the other side when the other side have got a black sheep who's done something wrong. But of course, that then immediately comes back the moment the black sheep is on the other side of the divide. And politicians have just not been able to stop themselves focusing on, the, on, on, on their personal behaviour, and that doesn't do them any good. So, um, so, so uh, you know, that, that, that's one. But that, um, and, uh, and it did fall away in the wake of the expenses scandal, but it, we recovered from that. Um, and I said 2019 it fell, but we recovered from that uh, thanks to the reaction of Leave voters. Um, but of course, there, there are two other uh, point. well, perhaps one other crucial point to make, which is, well, to what extent do we want people to trust government? So the reason why we want people to trust government, and obviously the pandemic um, emphasised this issue, is that at the end of the day, the state cannot get behavioural compliance. Yeah simply by using the force that it has available to it. And to that extent, at least, therefore, the law only works if people respect it. Right? But on the other hand, it is because the state claims the monopoly on the legitimate use of violence, it is therefore an institution that arguably should never simply be trusted, but always be scrutinised, because, hey, guys, we can all just see in the last few weeks what can happen when arguably the legitimate, or perhaps in some cases the illegitimate use of violence, has taken place under state or quasi-state activity. Um, so, you know, the, I mean, you go all the way back to the civic culture of the 1950s. I mean, Almond and Verb argued, well, you know, on the one hand, you want society to be somewhat critical and check on government, etc., yeah. etc. Et but on the other hand, you know, we don't want them to be so cussed that they won't do anything. And, you know, and to that extent, at least, therefore, I kind of relax a bit about wor worrying about trust in democracy, et cetera, et cetera, because I'm, I'm not sure we should necessarily want a society is that highly, is but, that, that highly trusting anyway. You can rephrase that. I mean, you don't particularly want a situation where majorities of people are thinking politicians are only in it for themselves and well, don't have the... the I mean, is they do, that that well, is what they feel, and they have always felt. I mean, look, you know, British social attitudes has asked people for the last 30 years, do you trust politicians to tell the truth when they're in a tight corner? Answer, no, never have done. Well, I don't, I don't trust my kids to, to be honest. I mean, well, you know. OK, I mean, like but, you know, maybe they feel they're being... Rational. Rational, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Sophie, just, just to depress us a bit further, I think you can tell me if I've got this wrong, but if I remember rightly, in our public first polling, one of the things we found was that actually there's not much between Leavers and Remainers when it comes to their faith in politics anymore, is there? So that gap seems to have been partly reversed. That's is what that what I would expect. Yeah. 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 So everyone's hacked off now. Basically, yeah. And I think the other thing that was quite interesting was, you know, talking about kind of this idea of a lack of trust and faith not being necessarily a recent phenomenon. It might have been exacerbated by Brexit, but it's not something new. The thing that surprised me quite a lot in that poll was the focus on competence mm -hmm. along uh, amongst a lot of people, not just in surveys, but in the focus groups that we did as well. Um, quite a lot of people don't like politicians simply because they don't think they're very good at their jobs. It's not because they don't trust them, they just think they're a bit crap, which I thought was quite um, interesting and is not something that's always drawn out um, by when we talk about trust and faith. Yeah, the last four years have provi arguably provided well, yeah, people exactly. with... <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, and so I think that is, you know, all the sort of shenanigans that have happened over the last four years have really brought that to the fore of a lot of voters' minds. Of, I, a lot of them were kind of saying things like, I don't even think they're clever enough to be corrupt and to be in it for themselves. I think they're just sort of fumbling along. And I think that was quite interesting for me in kind of translating how people feel about Keir Starmer and the Labour Party at the moment, in that it doesn't feel like there's this huge swell in support and enthusiasm for, you know, Keir Starmer that there might have been in 1997. But people do think that he's competent, that if he will try his best to deliver on the things he commits to. And that's something that they just don't necessarily feel about the current government. A lot of the places where Keir Starmer has his largest leads over Rishi Sunak is in what we might call like prime ministerial attributes. They just think he is much better on those kinds of things, you know, competence basically, than uh, the current government is. And I think it's quite interesting to see how 
what happened with Brexit might have translated into that and how much voters prioritise that when we go into the next election. And the other thing, actually, that Sophie pointed out to me a, a few months ago was the crucial difference between Starmer and Corbyn is not necessarily how keen people are on him, but Corbyn, by the end, was getting very, very high numbers on simply is not... Uh, sure. Don't want him in numbers. Yeah, is, no, is no, not no, up no, to the no, job. No, no, remember the Corbyn of 2017 yep. did different. attract a section of the yep. public in a way that neither Sunak nor Starmer nor Davey... Yep. We yeah. currently do. I mean, we, we are in a very peculiar situation now where basically we have visionless politicians at the top of our three parties. None of them can do the vision thing. Mm -hmm. None of them can do that crucial thing of leadership of giving a sense of direction mm -hmm. and getting people to invest in it. And in a sense, it's probably uh, you know, Kistama's luck that he's, that, you know, since Boris at least, he's faced politicians who don't have that ability. Yeah. Sarah, uh, I mean, you, you talked about this sort of identity divide, and it does, it, it's, I don't know whether I've got this wrong, it seems to me that the Conservative Party is spending a lot of its time trying to reawaken that divide, whether it's to talk about small boats, whether it's to talk about the uh, uh, cause of human rights, but is, is that fair, do you think, that you know, they're, they're hitting on these issues that unite that coalition, and B, and that B is an unfair question, why is this proving so unsuccessful, and is there any chance that it might be more successful in the next year? that they have certainly, I mean, part of these five promises, of course, is to stop the boats. And yeah. part of the fact that they put so much sort of political capital into that is that that is it's seen as something that clearly distinguishes them from Labour. Yeah. And it's also seen as something that will appeal. Uh, and, and if you do look at the polling, it appeals to the sort of people who will be leave yeah. Brexit identifiers. Um, what's fascinating now, just in the last couple of days, is that if you look at the kind of Conservative Party press releases, and to, they're sort of clearly making a bit of a shift. I mean, the other reason for doing this is, of course, that the economy is not doing well. Yeah. It is hard when you have been in government for 13 years and say, oh, it's the other guy's fault. You know, you're going to be blamed a little bit for it. Um, so, um, so it's sort of two things. You sort of try and mobilize that alternative coalition and you're also trying to shift attention. So what do people care about when they go in the ballot box? Are they thinking about the cost of living or are they thinking about these other kind of what certain people like to kind of call culture or these more identity politics? And I think the conservatives feel they're better in identity politics. Now, right now, of course, they have a problem in that they have not actually delivered on identity politics either. You could say, well, they haven't really delivered on the economy, but they've not really delivered on identity politics since arguably Brexit, which was, of course, a delivery. So in other words, they have not been able to stop the votes. They have not been able to get the Rwanda policy through. So that's a kind of a bit of a double bind. And you have someone within the party, like Asuela Braverman, sort of saying, you haven't delivered. You are not committed to it. I haven't delivered, even. <laughs> you case. personally yeah. have not <laughs> delivered. No, in her case. <laughs> yeah, so, but so you can see, so actually I feel, so it's interesting just to see now that they're sort of re reaching in their back pocket for more kind of classical Tory economic policy, let's cut the taxes and stuff. So, so you can see why they wanted to do more of this identity politics, but I think there are good reasons for why it's not successful. One is they're seen as split on it, and two, they've just not been able to actually, you know, immigration has gone up, so it's a double-edged sword to remind voters oh, you know, we are tough on immigration, when all the statistics shows, well, immigration, after Brexit, after you had full control, has gone up. It's well, they have the same right. problem on taxation, of course. Uh, yes. Right? That, you know, oh, all yeah. of a sudden, we're going to focus on something else that we've not been able to deliver for the last yeah. four years. Can I say something on this? Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I said that uh, I, we found our court's findings pretty surprising. I mean, obviously, the courts were very politicised during the Brexit years, and, and, um, and John had frightening figures of the number of leavers who condemned the, Remain, the, the Supreme Court and mm. the number of Remainers who supported it, et cetera, et cetera. But it was very striking, particularly on the Citizens' Assembly. I mean, it, just to give a bit more context for the Citizens' Assembly, um, they dedicated one weekend to each of a number of large topics, and you had experts in um, giving them... Well, you had you had some sort of basic factual information about the way the system works to bring mm. them up to speed. And then you had people arguing different positions. So arguing that the courts should be stronger, arguing that the courts should be weaker, etc. And then they deliberated and made decisions. 
And it was very striking, the extent to which they came down supporting the courts, notwithstanding that at the beginning of the process, one of the principles that they had, had, had come up with was that basically unelected people should not be taking <laughs> our decisions. But by the end, after they discussed the politicians and they came to the courts, they thought, yeah, we want more courts. Um, and one of the slides I put up, which I think I may have even skipped over it without reporting it, at all, uh, and if not, then probably too quickly for people to read it, was that um, we asked a question about whether uh, people wanted, on the, on the surveys, we asked a question about whether people wanted the courts to be stronger than they are now in defending human rights, or whether we, they wanted politicians to be stronger than they are now in making decisions about human rights. And yes, there is a leave remain divide on that. I now can't read because was, was it national or European courts? We did, yeah, that's, that's, did that's, that's, foreign courts that's an interesting question. In, in the report, you can see the full detail yeah. that we manipulate the question. We do some sort of experimental methods to some people sh saw that it was European and some people saw that it was national. We mentioned the European Convention and so on to see whether that gets a different reaction. And yes, when you mention the European courts, there's less support, but it's not markedly less. And similarly, I think the... Um, I have the Leave Remain on the slide. Um, I don't have the Conservative Labour on the slide, but I imagine it would be pretty similar. That yes, there is less support for the courts among Leavers than there is among Remainers. But the number supporting a stronger role for politicians in making decisions on human rights looks to me, without being able to read my own mini slides, like around 10% even among Leavers. So yes, there is a divide to try and ac activate but they're likely to alienate as many people in that group as they are to activate them, because even among leavers, there are more people who want stronger courts than who want stronger politicians. Okay. Let me just, uh, there's a couple of questions here. Uh, Tamara, on are we going to do more on Europe? Yes, we are in the run-up to the European Parliament election, so next year. And anonymous, I'm not sure even a chainsaw will help Rishi Sunak now. Uh, just a little Argentina <laughs> reference. But going back to what we were talking about a minute ago, <laughs> You get all sorts of questions on Slido. But uh, immigration is still f less salient than it was pre-referendum, isn't it? Am I right in saying that? So despite the noise about small boats, it's still under where it was? I'm not 100% sure. I think it might be slightly less, but it's not much. But that's quite a recent well, spike. The thing you need to understand about immigration is that people's evaluations of whether immigration has gone up or gone down or indeed whether illegal immigration has gone up and gone down, is largely unrelated to whether or not they're willing to vote Conservative again. Mm. That is not true of their perceptions of the state of the economy. It is not true of their perceptions of the state of the health service. And uh, the truth is, I mean, Sarah has already said some of this, basically what the Tories are doing in focusing on immigration is focusing on an issue which, you know, undoubtedly Conservative stroke leave voters in particular are concerned about, but, but it is not the source of the Conservatives' difficulties yeah. in the polls. Uh, now, you can argue that maybe you can still get around your difficulties by trying to focus the agenda on something else, but I suspect that the Conservatives will, in 12 months' time, have to be able to answer two questions. One is, can I afford to eat, feed my kids? And two, uh, will the NHS be able to treat me quickly if necessary? And that those are the two intractable problems that the, uh, and, and questions that the Conservatives have to be able to answer. Um, because those are the things, together with basically worries about the ethics of the Conservative Party and about its competence, are the things that are dri yeah. dri driving the vote <coughs> down. It, 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 it's not immigrant. I mean, I mean, the other irony is, I mean, the relationship between people's attitudes. To, uh, towards Brexit and immigration, it's gone. Mm. There's, no, there's no difference anymore between Remainers and Leavers in their evaluation of what's happened to immigration. They both accept it's gone up. Um, there isn't any relationship between leave, 2016 Leave voters' perceptions of what's happened to immigration and whether they are now, would now still vote Leave again. So the, uh, um, so the irony is that immigration, that supposed great issue of 2016, is no longer an issue in the Brexit debate, at least it's not influencing public opinion in the Brexit debate, and it's also not actually influencing party politics either. It's fallen off the agenda. Did you want to chip in on him? You don't have to. Yeah, I think it just ties into that. But um, 
Rob Ford did some work earlier this year which sort of goes into the idea of control around migration, the difference between that and n overall numbers, and kind of puffs forward this explanation that what people prioritise is control, it's not raw numbers, and you can yeah. see that by the fact that as numbers have gone up, concern has gone down, and sort of the mismatch between that, and that one of the reasons, you know, a lot of people are getting you know, frustrated by these pictures of small boats crossing the channel is because it goes against that idea of a more controlled system. It's not about sort of the overall numbers. In fact, the Leave campaign never made any commitment to actually bring down overall numbers, I don't think. I think they just suggested a change of migration system. But that is kind of the resonant issue. It's not about net migration, really. Which reminds me to do a very quick plug to you about two things. Firstly, Rob Ford has got a new paper coming out with the Social Market Foundation this is not much of a plug because I can't remember the date. Next week. <laughs> Next week uh, on the educational divide in our politics, which is absolutely fascinating, the new divide between university educated and non-university educated and how that's playing into politics. So do look out for that. And he will be presenting the main findings at our, the 5th of December. Oh, the launch of the Social Market Foundation is on Monday. On the 5th of December, we have a big all-day conference on public opinion where he's going to be talking through, and John's going to be there talking through some of his new research as well. Anyway, back to you two. A question for both of you, I think, which is, has the whole Brexit thing, as I technically call it, uh, increased political participation or interest in politics? I mean, you talk about these strong identities. Has that fed into greater interest in or engagement with politics? I, well, I, I, I think just on, I think what has happened is a, a group of people who have, who felt that often politics perhaps did not serve their interest and they were often not on the winning side and that also goes back to some of your findings about who trusts politics more have felt that they were on the winning side they had a say and they affected quite significant change so in terms of the sort of political efficacy you will have seen you've seen an increase in political efficacy and trust amongst people who were amongst the lowest in that mm -hmm. now what has happened <coughs> the flip side of that is people who are used to <laughs> being the ones uh, who felt they had the more influence uh, have had less trust in the sort of democratic process. It doesn't necessarily mean participation is hard to see. I mean, we didn't see the kind of massive groundswell of uh, uh, sort of young people yeah. uh, turning out in 2019. Now they didn't get their way with Brexit. They were going out and all of a sudden voting. I mean, there's still a massive generational gap. Uh, in turnout. You didn't get that youthquake that everyone talks about. Yeah, so, so that wasn't a thing, wasn't <coughs> it? That was a, so in that sense, not. But in the terms of sort of, the, you know, if you think about positive effects of Brexit, I think one of them was you know, people who might have felt also because of the electoral system in the UK yeah. and lots of things that mean that maybe often you feel like nothing you do in terms of voting makes a difference. I mean, Brexit made a difference then, okay, we might say that many people now feel it hasn't delivered, at least in the short term, but they, their vote made a difference. Now, I mean, John might know especially, uh, exactly what's happened on the, on the youth turnout, but certainly in 2019, it doesn't look like to have caused massive change in that gap. So it's not, young people, they like to talk a lot about politics, but not turn up on the day. I yeah. say that as an old <coughs> person who <laughs> likes to vote. Bloody millennials. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There are obviously, well, it, it would be to oversimplify so it. looking at you. <laughs> it would be to oversimplify it to say that there are two groups, but there are at least two groups, aren't there? There's the young people on the one hand, and then there's the Brexit voters on the other hand, some of whom were very infrequent participants before, but who turned up to vote for Brexit, and mm. I think were mobilised in the 2019 election as well to turn out for Boris Johnson. What they're going to do in the coming election, who knows? I thought it was striking in our findings that, I mean, you do have this slight paradox that um, there's strong feedback that people's voices are not heard, but then if you ask them to, whether they want to get more involved, there's very few people who want to get more involved, and the people who want to get involved the least are the Brexit voters. Mm, um, so that doesn't suggest that there's been any lasting effect, really, um, yeah. but it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's hard to read. John, do you want to say something about turnout? And then, Sophie, I might turn to you because you've just written something on non-voters, just to mention them quickly. No, I'll happily pass to Sophie. Right. Here we go. Um, on, well, I'm sure she's going to thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> on don't knows, um, it was about really, and it was just about sort of um, kind of the impact that 2019 had in that you had a lot of people, you know, voting for a party that they haven't 
uh, necessarily traditionally because of Brexit and actually quite a lot of those people, particularly people who voted Conservative for the first time in 2019 are now saying they are unsure um, how to vote. These are voters who have just typically had quite weak partisan links anyway and have tended to sw uh, vote switch um, over time. Uh, and also weirdly tend to sort of demographically resemble a typical Conservative voter, but just their attitudes um, are not quite in line um, with what they perceive the Conservative parties to be at the moment. And that is kind of the group at the minute that is teetering on the edge of not voting at all, basically just because it seems that neither party has done quite enough to uh, attract their vote. Um, and I think it's about 18% um, in BS, we're don't knows. So it's around that sort of port yeah. uh, okay. portion. So, question from Heather Rolf. Do panellists think Remainers are more committed for the effective reasons that you mentioned, Sarah, or for practical reasons, <laughs> you know, which is to say, look what's happening to the economy, look what's happening for trade. I mean, Remainers seem a lot more engaged now in this debate. Uh, so certainly they are, if more anything, easy. more emotional yep. than a Leavers, but yep. I think it's very hard to distinguish that from the fact that so in terms of, we measure a lot of outgroup prejudice and discrimination, mm -hmm. and both groups are prejudiced towards each other, but to the extent there's a difference, it's remain as being more prejudiced towards leavers than vice versa. Now, I'll bracket that to say partly it's also they're the losers. Mm -hmm. And that's generally what we see, that the people on the losing side, you know, you're more upset, you're more angry. So when we look at, at sort of the affective response, when you're winner, a winner, it's easy to be like, oh yeah, you guys, you're okay. I mean, you're obviously losers, but you're okay. <laughs> Whereas when you're, when you're the loser, you know, you're more angry. So it's not yeah. necessary. So that's what we see also in partisan context. But to the extent it's, you know, it's a bit of a sort of myth amongst Remainers that they're very rational and cool headed. And I don't think there's sort of evidence of that. So in terms of the effective, it's very much both sides and a slight difference there is, it's Remainers being more effective. Actually, one of the really interesting things you said to me just while we were chatting over a cup of tea is that in terms of knowledge about the EU, am I right in saying there was very little? There's, there's no sort of specific EU knowledge you don't see a difference between Remainers and Leavers, which is slightly surprising in that, of course, one of the key uh, socio-demographic predictors of being a Remainer versus a Lever is educational levels. But generally, I say that as you can hear from my accent as a foreigner, Brits don't know a lot about the EU. Mm. And, <laughs> but also the campaign, I mean, if you study referendums, normally what they do is they lead to an increase in knowledge about EU institutions and so on. But this campaign wasn't particularly focused on, let's say it like that, the intricacies of you know decision-making in the council and things that you and I love. And then, um, that's <laughs> yes, exactly. So yeah, so there's not a big knowledge gap uh, between the two groups now. But I think, I think in, our, in our results, and I have referred to this already, that it's 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 in a sense too too e too early to say whether what the results really describe are two tribes or whether they describe winners and losers. So similarly to to Sarah, I mean we have. Ask, asking about um, getting more involved in politics. We've got a whole raft of questions asking people whether they would do certain things in terms of going on demonstrations and signing petitions and et cetera, et cetera. And it's the Remainers who want to do that. But then is that because they're a certain type of person which differentiates them mm. from the Leavers? Mm. Or is it because their lot aren't in power? And when your lot isn't in power, you want to sign petitions and go on demonstrations. It's, it, it, it's, difficult, it's difficult to say. And when do they stop being losers? How long? <laughs> I mean, they certainly so. feel losers. Yeah. And that's important, right? There's, there, there's no guarantee that they would necessarily feel, as some of them clearly do, emotionally devastated by what happened. Uh, and I think certainly, I mean, I would, I would echo what Sarah has said. I mean, you know, there, there was a stereotype out there that Leave voters were all emotion in Russia and Remain voters were the rational folk. No, no, yeah. no, no. You talk to Remainers, they're really upset about Brexit and they really, because they're losing, because they have this sense of commitment to the European Union as an institution, to European as an identity and all the rest of it. All right? It isn't just a, 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 a rational thing. Um, and um, certainly at the moment, uh, as your data Some shows. Some of that has actually increased because one of the things, yeah. again, sort of comparatively is that identification with the EU and with Europe was quite low yeah. in Britain. Uh, compared to, but now we've seen a groundswell of people who feel strongly European in a way they didn't. I mean, maybe some of that passion should have come if you wanted Remain to, and should have come before rather than after. But you've seen a sort of real increase in people who say will say they identify as Europeans who didn't 
before. I mean, one of the questions we've got on Slido is whether we have the numbers from the 2021 census about the numbers who identified as oh, European. No, no, no. no Do no. not trust the census on identity. No. Okay. Okay, it's crap. Right? <laughs> Use British social <laughs> attitudes. Right? I can go into it, but the, 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 the census question is... Uh, uh, Let me rephrase my question. According to the gold standard British social attitude survey... No, I, I've, I, have written, I have written myself a note <laughs> to check what BSA has been saying about European identity in the last couple of years, because yeah. I've not looked at it. But the research I talked about uses BSA, and there's been an... Oh, OK, that's interesting. Right, OK, fine, thank well, you. Could, could I ask a question, maybe, of John? You uh, we're, we're, you <laughs> that's very kind. I mean, we're, we're talking quite a lot here by necessity about the divides, but I think that some of the more interesting things that come out of our survey are the things where there isn't a divide. Mm -hmm. Um, on the checks and balances, you see this thing where you can't quite disentangle whether it's just because those people are out of power, you know, etc. But on some things, they're absolutely united. And on the integrity questions in particular, on, on honesty and integrity. Sure. Now, obviously, you would quote us figures going back decades saying that they, people think that politicians are dishonest and they want more honest but they politicians. Want they want, they, 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 sure, of course. I guess I, I do just I mean, who wonder... Wants, who, who, want, who wants... Who is going to say, I want somebody who's dishonest? Well, one of the, que one of the questions, um, two, well, we have a couple of questions on this, as I'm sure you, you, you know, John, which more or less echo Boris Johnson's rhetoric in terms of following the rules versus getting things done. Yes. You know, he used to appear at Prime Minister's Questions sure. every week yeah, and say yeah, the important yeah. thing is we're getting Brexit done. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. put that in a survey and something like 6% of people wanted that against 76% of people who wanted people who follow the rules. Yeah. And then the, the, the question about which preceded Partygate on the but first but survey about... But, but, when, but, when, but when the Supreme Court told us what the rules were, most of the leavers didn't like what the Supreme Court said, I, right? My, my question, so I suppose... There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a different, so the problem is there's a difference between the abstract... Sure. And the concrete, right? And in a sense, you would probably need to give people a lot of concrete examples on which people were on different sides of the argument before you discover actually how consistently people say, yeah, it's definitely the court. So, because you know, the, the real question is how many people in our society think that the court should be followed even when they fundamentally disagree with what the court It's not necessarily about the courts, is it? It's about following conventions of decent behaviour and so on. That wasn't a question yeah, about yeah, the courts. Sure. Yeah, well, look, you know, and we... so we ask them, what do you value in a politician? And they pick honesty above all else, above delivering things, above being clever, above being charismatic. And the, my question is, and I suppose it's not fair to put it to you unless you know some other polling evidence from the past that asks those kind of questions. You don't have to be fair. Is, <laughs> Do we think there's likely to be a lasting Johnson effect here? I mean, that looked like very much a kickback against Boris Johnson and recognising that actually following the rules, being honest, having integrity matters in politics. And I just wonder whether that's going to well, stick. Following the rule, following, you know, following the rules matters when everybody else was expected to follow the same rules and you didn't. And, and people did so at very, very yeah, great so this is personal COVID. It's not expense. The Court. It's, it's COVID. COVID. It? It's yeah. COVID. I'll come back to you in a minute then, maybe. I keep getting told off for going for audience questions. All right. <laughs> Go on then. Hang on, there should be... Sorry, Ollie. Hang on one sec. <coughs> Look at all the team rolling their eyes at me for doing this. I'll be very quick, yes. Uh, there was two other asterisk points to make. One is the Remainers were in a position where they were the establishment position. Sure. So they were, had a lot of entitlement. It wasn't that they lost. They lost despite the fact that the establishment were all on the side. Yeah. And it was overturning the system. It was turning on its head. And that yeah. was something really, really surprising. Yeah. Um, the other thing was about this rule of law thing. I have a real beer in my bonnet about that. Because oh, a lot of the Remainers supported the rule of law. Boris, you shouldn't prorogue Parliament. But they were incredibly quiet when, in COVID, the government went trojan horses through people's rights. They said, right, we're going to have lockdowns, we're going to take people's rights yeah. away, eventually have martial law, all this kind of stuff, without a vote in Parliament. That or, well, or, or indeed when Speaker Burko engaged in what some people would argue was some um, yeah. problematic interpretations of parliamentary procedure. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. So yeah. the same people that, that squealed about the rule of law over Brexit kept very quiet. The dire silence was deafening when they broke the rule of law over COVID, which was much more serious violation of our rights. 
And I think they're only very selective and, and complained about the rule of law when they didn't like what the government was doing. <laughs> if they like what the government was doing, they didn't say a squeal. So they don't really care about the rule of law. They just care about what they think. I don't is, that, is, there, is there a question mark hovering the in there? The question mark or? is, are the panel, have they got an observation on that? What do they think in reacting to the difference? Well played, making yeah. that into a question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, so not in this project, but in another pro project. I did run service in the US and, and in UK on during the height of COVID on COVID restrictions. And I found it absolutely shocking. Uh, the levels of support for indefinitely outlawing all protests uh, in support of you. Um, and um, and uh, that was I w that was quite highly consensual. Actually, there wasn't a big partisan divide, interestingly, in the UK. There were just very high levels of compliance, which goes back to something that you say, that maybe we don't always want you know, yeah. unconditional support, but it does show that. And I think that's why it's very problematic to ask these very general liberal democracy questions, because people will be like, yeah, I want rule of law, I want this and that. The real test is when it's something yeah. that you disagree yeah. with, and that's the same with protests. You know, people will say they support protests, yeah. but they do not support it um, uh, to the same extent uh, when it's protest against some group they don't yeah, like, you know? Um, and, and on that, actually, it's interesting with the, there's a partisan divide. We're doing some work on this sort of partisan gap in, in tolerance, mm -hmm. which uh, tolerance is all about the right of other people that you disagree with. And there was that labor people are more tolerant of protest, but conservatives are more tolerant of freedom of speech. So yeah. they're both kind of intolerant of yeah. the other, but the partisan gap is huge. In yeah. other words, the general questions will be, oh yeah, we support all of this, but then when you have scenarios, so um, you get, uh, so, so, I, so I think it's a, it's a good example you raised there. I mean, I'm utterly relaxed about my football team scoring goals that later proved to be offside. I don't think there's a problem there at all. <laughs> but you know, when the other side do it, it is an outrage. Now, I want to ask you one question that keeps coming in from various, I mean, it's a nightmare question, but it's, it haunts the Slido, which is, what would happen to Labour if they were more ambitious on the EU? So it might be saying, join the single market. Uh, I suppose the obvious question is, if you're 20-odd points in the, ahead in the polls, why would Tell you change down. anything? But Tell us down. What will happen yeah, there are a lot of Labour. people here saying, given what you've said, particularly about the way Labour are doing better, are, are attracting Remainers from the Lib Dems, why don't you just keep going in that direction? And what would happen if they did? $64,000 question. It's very, 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 I mean, It's difficult to argue that Labour have made a mistake because they're <laughs> doing nicely. It's just, not, it's, not, it's just that it hasn't worked out in the way uh, that they anticipated. I think, to slightly duck the question, I think that the question that will arise is if the next Labour government starts to hit political trouble, which is almost guaranteed because it's going to be an awful uh, job to take over running the country uh, after next year, is whether at that point, in order to keep its people happy, it's going to have to move more on Brexit than it is currently inclined uh, to do so. Um, the party that I think has made a mistake of the ready leaders is the Liberal Democrats. I just do not see what they've gained, and I can see what they've lost uh, 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 out of all of it. Uh, so, in, in, so part of the answer to it at the moment is, is, is Alan, is that they don't need to do it. They don't need to do yeah. anything. So therefore, why would they? Would it necessarily be disastrous? Well. Perhaps not, but I mean, it is worth bearing in mind that although Brexit is now less popular than it was, it is still only 58% of people who are wanting to be inside the European Union. So, you know, if you were really going to uh, take the risk, you would probably want the numbers to be going further in that direction, given where you're at at the moment. OK, just in answer to Anonymous, who thinks that there was a bit of self-selection going on with the Citizens' Assembly, there wasn't. It's a representative sample. When the final report comes out this week, it'll have all the details, but do final look at details. it. The, the details of that are in the, oh, the Assembly report, which is on the yeah, website already. But no, it absolutely wasn't a self-selecting group. It was a carefully chosen representative sample. Can you be very quick? Yeah. Um, you're saying everybody wants to have more honest government and everything like that. Um, Sorry, Ollie. Yeah. Um, you say that more people want an honest government and everything like that. And people say that Boris was dishonest and all this sort of thing. Yet how come when I'm out in the public talking to people, so many think he did the right thing for the country and also would actually vote for him if he stood? 
to get into Parliament. How come that is the case? He has a lot of support still. So well, how do you explain that? Well, I mean, I'd start by saying, look at where he was polling when he was kicked out of office. But anyway, do, does anyone else want to... No, I mean, look, the, the honest truth is, if you look at Boris's numbers now, um, you know, then, I mean, well, point one is Boris was never a particularly popular prime minister because of the leave remain divide. He was popular amongst leavers. He was not popular amongst remainers. So, for example, as compared with Blair or Thatcher, even uh, at, her, at her height, um, Johnson was a relatively unpopular prime minister from the beginning. Right. Um, and, um, you know, the truth is, is that, you know, Remain voters still hate him. But the point is now a significant chunk of Leave voters basically accept the, the um, judgment of the Privileges Committee, which is that he misled the House of Commons. And certainly a lot of people think that, you know, his interpretation of the COVID rules were more liberal than anybody, any other organisation in the country. So, sure, there is a group of people who still believe in Boris. You are right. But they are now a decided minority of our country, including a decided minority of Conservative supporters. I mean, you know, he's just, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't to be unfair to the gentleman, but there's a sense in which a lot of people just feel he's been found out. Or if you want to put it slightly differently, I mean, you're, I mean, you're right. Boris's great strength was indeed he was an outcomes-focused politician. He knew what he wanted to achieve, and he was willing to bend the rules to get there. Now, the truth is that, so far as Brexit was concerned, perfectly sensible strategy, because at least half the country were willing to back him. So far as procuring PPE or buying up a whole load of vaccines that you don't know whether any of them are going to work a concern and really playing ducks and drakes with the rules on public procurement, yes, no serious debate. You couldn't stick this whole argument about Tory VIP lanes because we all wanted PPE and we all wanted vaccines. The moment it unraveled was when Boris tried to save Owen Paterson's parliamentary career in November 19, uh, 2021 uh, because there isn't any constituency out there of voters who think we should make it easy for MPs to have second jobs. And that, of course, then came a matter of weeks before the first rules on first on party gate, and there wasn't any constituency out there of people who felt it was fine for Boris for number 10 Downing Street to interpret the rules in one way and not the other. So in other words, the problem was that his style worked very effectively for two years, but the problem is that he failed to realize that pursuing that style for something in which nobody or virtually nobody believed was a very, very difficult place to be. And it's been in the end what, what undid him. You know, plus the fact that, frankly, his parliamentary colleagues stopped believing him. I mean, that's in the end why Boris went, was the whole story about, uh, about Chapman uh, uh, Pincher and the fact that Boris had not been... You know, I mean, above all, you have to be straight with your MPs about whips and those who are in charge of you in a whipping operation. And if you are not upfront about that and you appoint as a deputy chief whip somebody whom you know about there are question marks about their behaviour... That's really guaranteed to ensure that MPs are no longer going to be willing to want you as their leader. Right, we've have virtu we have run out. Are there any final comments? Well, for you two to start with, because if you have any final comments on what we've heard, what we've been talking about, you don't have to. You are standing between me and the pub at this point. Yeah, so, I don't want to do that. All right. Do you want to stand between me and the pub? No. Good answer. <laughs> Excellent. So thank you very, very much indeed to the panel, to all of you for being here today. Lots of you have asked. We will get the slides from today's presentations on the UK and the Changing Europe website. Look out for other events. We've got two more this week. There's one on the E3, which is totally different, but it's quite interesting. There's one on the Autumn Statement on Friday. And did you Can want I, to? Yeah, let yes. me say one more thing, which is that um, we, have an, we have an event on Monday launching our fourth uh, report. So if anybody wants to hear more about this research and some responses from, we've got... Uh, Damien Green from the Conservatives, we've got Wendy Chamberlain, the Lib Dem Chief Whip, and we've got Nick Thomas Simmons, who's the responsible minister, uh, the Shadow Minister for Labour. Uh, go to the Constitution Unit website and you can register. It's on Zoom at lunchtime on Monday. I don't normally like people doing other events from other organisations, but I like the Constitution <laughs> Unit, so that's fine. Constitution Unit event website, have a look and go along if you can. In the meantime, thank you ever so much for coming along today, and we hope you've enjoyed it. Take care. <laughs>